We would like to remind everyone present that this meeting will be recorded and that the recording will subsequently be, av be available for public listening. Paula, can you take us through the process for today, please? No, said that, Cedric, and apologies, please, and then the process. I confirm this meeting is properly called near your it. I have apologies from Councillor McComb. It's declarations of interest in many procedures. Does any member have declarations of interest? Uh, Councillor Maitland and then Councillor Blake. Can we find it? Our staff will be able to assist you with a spare one at a very modest fee. <laughs> Councillor Blake. I'll need to declare an interest item for a seat from the list of objectors that one does some political work for me. I'm, I'm very sorry, Councillor Blake, I never heard that. Yeah, one of the objectors does some political work for me. Are there any other declarations of interest? Councillor Maitland, now you've got quite a card. Chairman, I have an interest in report number six due to financial interest. Thank you, Councillor Maitland. Okay. David? And, Chair, I'll declare an item of uh, interest for item five as I know uh, two of the objectors. Okay, members. In that case, we go to. Pardon? Business of the day. The Planning Applications Committee will consider each application in turn as detailed on the agenda. The case officer or an area planning manager or other appointed officer will make a short statement addressing the determining issues accompanied by digital images. Any late information, amendments or corrections will be reported at this time. Members may ask questions of officers following the presentation on points of clarification. For those applications which are in accordance with Council policy subject to public speaking, the order of eligible parties being heard shall be as follows third parties objecting to an application, third parties supporting an application, statutory consultees objecting to an application, elected members of Dumfries and Galloway Council who are not members of the Planning Applications Committee, and applicants or their agents. The Chairman will individually invite those who have registered in advance to speak in respect of the application to come forward, sit in the reserved seat and make their presentation, after which they may be questioned by committee members. No questions may be asked of committee members. When each presentation is completed, people should immediately return to their seats. After all the representations have been heard, the meeting is then in formal session and no members of the public may address the committee from the public gallery. The Planning Applications Committee will then proceed to determine the application or if the application is a major development significantly contrary to the development plan or a national development to agree a recommendation to be made to full council who will determine the application. The decision notice will be issued after a period of 48 hours has passed. The Chairman has been provided with a list of eligible representatives who have, had their re who have had their registration to speak confirmed. No other persons will be allowed to speak. Representatives have been placed in alphabetical order. A copy of the public speaking list is available from the committee officer taking notes of our proceedings. Representations on planning applications must be made on the basis of valid planning matters only. Certain matters are not normally material planning considerations and will not be taken into account by the Council when deciding on a planning application. Representers are encouraged to use the time allotted to clarify any points they consider material and to address determining issues. Representers should not raise any new matters without explaining why they were not raised earlier with the case officer. Please do not repeat what is in the report as members will have already read the report. Presentations will be strictly limited to three minutes per person, excepting for national and major developments, which by their nature are more complex, where the time limit will be five minutes. This should allow sufficient time for interested parties to make relevant points. The Chairman of the Committee will ask you to come to a conclusion if you take too long. Thank you, Paula. I now come to item three, minute of meeting of 26 of February 2014. Is that a true record? Agreed. Thank you, members. In that case, we'll come to the first item on the agenda. Item four, erection of three wind turbines, 50 metres high to hub, 74 metres high to blade tip, Formation of hard standing areas and access tracks at Plaskow Farm near Dobite, NGR 287470, 563640, 
5640 The application types full planning permission and the case officer is Dean Clapworthy. Dean, if you'd like to take us through your presentation, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to go through the slides in the first instance, that's uh, the general location in the broader area. The site is more specifically you know, centred in that square there. The site's uh, four kilometres northeast of Dalbiti, uh, 2.6 kilometres south southeast of Kigunyan. That's uh, a zoom in of the site and the layout of the turbines that are proposed. Uh, the track will come in from the, the northeast there off the U80 public road. It terminates just at Plasco Farm there, further down. Go straight up, up the hill slope through the through the uh, block of woodland planting to access the three turbines set out in a generally in a linear row in a north northwest south southeast orientation. They'd be around 180 metres apart or separation between the, t the three, and they'd be sited uh, just below or around the 150 metre contour. That's a typical turbine, uh, 74 metres high to tip. 48 metres uh, rotor diameter. That's a theoretical uh, visibility of the, of the three turbines where you, with the coloured areas indicate the, where you'd see at least one of the turbines in uh, the wider area. Theoretical visibility isn't the reality though because it doesn't take into account uh, obstructions to visibility such as buildings and, and trees and so on. So that's a, a bare earth scenario which isn't the, the reality. That's, these are images out of the submission. Uh, that's looking toward the site from the Dumfries and, Dumfries and area, is it called? Dumfries and District Gliding Club site. The uh, proposed turbines would be about 1.7 kilometers from here, just slightly to the right of center in the foreground. And uh, the image below is the wire line that's produced. Uh, I'd hope that you can make out the three turbines there, uh, just slightly off center to the right. This is another view from the, the submission, which is from Kigunyan. It'd be about 2.7 two, about kilometers from the site here. Again, we've got the wire line at the bottom which shows the, uh, indicates the three, the prominence of the three turbines from that view. This is another view much further out here. We're, uh, we're close to the uh, A75. Well, we're on the A75, close to the first roundabout dropping into Castle Douglas, so about 9.4 kilometers from the site here. The, the higher hill you can see just on the left horizon is Criffle. Uh, and the turbines would be sat at the base of that in this view. Uh, the wire line, you can possibly just make them out there. These are before and after images. As you'll be aware, uh, and as noted in the report, there's, there's a history to the site. There was a former planning application that was refused and then dismissed. We'll come, I'll come back to that later. The top image is a view from the track that leads up to, K to Kira Farm. Uh, the top image shows the former scheme that was refused and the bottom image shows the, the present scheme. Uh, as you can see, the, essentially the one on the turbine on the, the top left is, is removed uh, and it kind of leapfrogs beyond the other two turbines so that that now is then, it's not there and it's the furthest turbine. So the first turbine you see in the the bottom image is it's actually in white rather than shaded. It's just above the farm shed. So it's, it's slightly left, right of the middle turbine on the top image. And that would be the nearest turbine in that view. This is uh, another before and after scenario compared to the former scheme. Uh, this is from the U80 public road uh, close to Plaskow Cottage. Uh, the top image is the former and you can see the prominence of, of two of the turbines. The third turbine is behind the two uh, trees in the foreground there. In the bottom image, it's the current, current proposal. 
can see that the, the turbines sit lower in the landscape. And again, the third turbine is behind uh, the two uh, trees in the foreground on the right. These are just general images without any turbine superimposed on them that I've taken of, around the site. This image, I'm, I'm stood at a higher point from the site. The, no turbines will be in this view, but what I'm getting is looking north towards Plascal Cottage, and then you can see the block plantation uh, on the horizon there on the, the left. That's the plantation that's, that intervenes between the U80 public road and the site. That's panning left from the previous. You can see the block plantation again. It's probable that turbine one will be just in the left of this image. What, what I'm trying to give an impression of is, it, is the flat top of Plasco Ridge as it sits above the, the, the land to the west and north. Panning left again. Uh, the, sec one of the, the second turbine, the middle turbine, would be on the, the near side of the dike that you see coming in from the left. And then panning left again, the, the final turbine, turbine three, would be uh, beyond the dike that you see there. This is the U80 public road uh, uh, approaching the site from the north. The field gate there is where access will be taken up through the, that field. And the Plascal cottage is there in the, in the distance on the left of the road. It's about 160 metres from that field gate. That's looking up through the field, from, by the field gate. The access will take a straight line up to the block plantation and over the ridge. This is on the opposite side of the valley. So we're up on a, on a hill on the opposite side of the valley to the northwest. Looking back towards the site, what it's, the, what it's giving impression of is the higher land, the, the granite coastal uplands form the backdrop to the site. The site is on uh, the, the hills, the lower hills on the opposite side of the valley. That's Maiden Pap, uh, the most prominent hill on the horizon there, just uh, centre left. And then panning left from that same view, we've got Criffle as the core hill, the core group of hills in the coastal granite uplands. And I'm afraid that's not very good. That's from the coastal granite uplands, looking back towards the site. Uh, just to set out the difference between the former proposal and the current, the previous proposal uh, and the reasons for its refusal set out paragraph 1.12 in the report. The principal differences are that the former scheme is 84 metres to tip, current scheme is 74 metres to tip. Uh, the turbines fall squarely within the medium, the medium typology as opposed to the large typology. It was a for, case in the former. Uh, the movement of, of the turbines have been moved in a south south east direction, uh, just to take it back, just to, to try and give greater clarity to that. The Bottom turbine in that image, if you like, on the former scheme, it'd leapfrog the two above it, and it'd be above the uh, the top one in that case. So it's, it's, it's essentially taken the top turbine, leapfrogged over them, and put it in the, the field over the dike in, in this image. And also the three turbines are positioned around five metres lower on the contours of the hill. Uh, the report sets out the full assessment of the proposal in relation to the relevant policies and all of the material considerations and finds that development is acceptable subject to conditions. Just a note on the conditions. Condition 5 that's proposed in the report, we've actually realised it, it's not required. Uh, the submission is very precise in that it, it shows the exact locations of the access track and the turbines, so there'd be no room for manoeuvre within the current application, it, it, it's an application for turbines in that precise location. Uh, so no requirement for condition five in a case where it might, where it will be supported. That's all I've got to say on the matter at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Any members have any questions for Dean? Councillor McKee, then Councillor Wett. Hi, thanks, Chair. It's, is this a uh, me medium to large uh, typology? Now, in previous papers, there's been an overlap. It's, it's up 50 to 80, then above 80 is a uh, kind of high, a high uh, risk type thing. But what's the overlap? 
Because okay. given that we've refused an 84 okay. metre and you're now down to 74, mm. is that not included yeah. in that overlap? Yeah. Uh, in the further scheme, the proposal for turbines of 84 metres and in the Council's interim planning policy on for wind turbines, paragraph 3.6, is a, there's, a, there's a reference to a five metre cutoff between typologies. Medium typology turbines are between 50 and 80 metres and 80 metres and above are large typology. So in the former scheme, because it was within five metres of that cutoff, it was assessed against both the, the guidance for large typology and for medium. Whereas this proposal, it's 74, it's six metres off the cutoff, so there's no requirement to assess it against the advice for large typology. Councillor Wicks. Thank you, Chair. Can I ask the officer to show us again the slide that shows the zone of theoretical visibility? Is it possible to zoom in on that, particularly the southern part? Uh, no. <laughs> I've not got my binoculars with me today. Uh, I'm looking for something which may contravene something which was said in the report. I can't say with any clarity from here. But thank you anyway. Thank you. Maybe come back to that, Councillor Witch. Councillor Maitland. Um, Chairman, could I please ask the officers about report num uh, um, condition number three? Um, how do you, how do, how does the planning authority monitor whether or not an electricity supply is being provided? Yeah, our conditions are supposed to be enforceable. I, I would ask, how would we know that? Robert. I think it would really just be if the turbine was obviously redundant for a period of time, we would then approach the landowner and raise the question. I accept the point, you may have an operational turbine that may not be producing electricity, although that would probably be quite unusual. Uh, you're not necessarily going to know it's not producing electricity, so I think it would only occur in a case whereby a turbine was redundant. It was obviously seen to be redundant, and we would then pursue it on that basis. Councillor Driver. Uh, thanks, Chair. I've got to agree with Councillor Maitland. How, how do you enforce a condition over a period of several weeks where you don't have any wind? Now, I know that would be unusual in Dumfries and Galloway that we didn't have any wind, but obviously if it's too high a wind, the, the, the turbines are shut down, and if it's, there's no wind, they're not working. So how do you enforce a condition in, in, in that particular part of the paper? The second part is, can you go back to the access uh, to the road that's into the site, please, Dean? Well, obviously, the, the size of the turbines, the stems of the turbines actually come in in, in, in low loaders uh, and are quite large. Is there anything in, in the report that suggests that there's going to be a removal of part of that dike as part of the, the application? Because it would be quite a big turning point for those particular areas. I would hope that any agreement like that would reinstate the dike when it's finished, but uh, I'll ask Robert to address that as well, and I'll ask David to, to respond to your first point. Well, we're waiting for Robert to look through the, the, the documentation. I'll ask David to deal with the, 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 the removal section. Thank you, Chair. Yes, Condition 3 is a condition which is both routinely used by ourselves as a planning authority and also the Scottish Government in reporters' decisions. So it is clearly recognised as a competent decision and an appropriate one to attach. The second line is... You know, for a continuous period of 12 months. So I think that's that's the critical bit. It's not just a case that um, it's an intermittent lack of generation. It has to be something that can be shown. And I think, to follow up what Robert was saying, it would be quite possible to ask for demonstration from the, the applicant to show that the... I mean, the, most people will be putting up turbines to generate electricity to obviously make money. So if they can uh, give us copies of receipts for the generation... That would be quite uh, straightforward if they are getting money for the turbines. That would prove that they're still operational after that period. If they're clearly not being used for that purpose, that's where Condition 3 would kick in. Uh, have you found the section, Robert? Okay. Um, thanks, Robert. Chair. Apologies for the delay. The Council Roads Officer report is 
there at 2.4. So that's on page 20 of the papers. As far as conditions go, um, there's condition 10 on page 36. So that postpones development in respect of this plan and application, if you're minded to grant it, unless and until a scheme detailing all necessary improvements to the haulage route has been submitted to and agreed in writing with the planning authority. And that would obviously be in consultation with the roads authority, so the roads engineers. And then it would require agreed improvements to be implemented prior to the commencement of development. My understanding is the access route and the dikes, any dikes that would need to be amended or any changes to road geometry would be within the control of the applicant after it branches off from the public road. Thanks, Robert. And I suppose it would be up to members always if they felt that any element of the application here or another application was important, they could put a condition on it if they're minded to approve. Are there any other questions for the planning officer, Councillor Witts? Thank you. The, re the reports that are cited, the, 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 um, with reference to um, supporting the application on page 22, I note that General Policy 24, Stuart Local Plan, uh, which of course is to do with farm diversification, is not here. Can I ask why it's not here? Should it be here? Robert? It's really subsumed under the wind farm policy. That's the critical key policy in this case. Um, you know, we didn't feel it was really relevant to put in the policy and farm diversification in this case because the IPP is really at the moment and the Imagine LDP policies um, are now more specific on wind energy. Happy, Alistair? Uh, I'll consider that. Thank you. Any other questions for planning officer? In that case, thank you, Dean. Uh, we now have three objectors and then the, the applicant. Each objector will have three minutes to speak. The first objector is Alison Chapman. Would you like to come forward, Alison? Just switch the, the device on in front of you on your seat, and I will give you three minutes in which to conclude your presentation. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. As the coordinator of Glare, Galloway Landscape and Renewable Energy for more than 10 years, I have met many people whose lives have been turned upside down by wind turbines. But I'm particularly proud to be able to come before you today and speak on behalf of Ashley Medics, whose home is the most vulnerable. Despite a devastating illness, he runs a national helpline for people suffering from similar problems. When he came to live here, he chose to live in a relatively isolated position for the tranquility it offered and the benefit to his condition and his well-being. But inside his own house, his home, he is a counsellor offering advice to those suffering like him. Outside, the serenity must be some comfort. It once was offered, but now his home is threatened, and not for the first time. The reporter, who wisely made a site visit, said the proposed turbines would be overwhelming. What has changed? A few meters here or there. I believe that a site visit would confirm the reporter's original verdict. These turbines are out of place and would be so overwhelming that life would be intolerable. I urge you to reject the application for the second time. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Chapman. Do any members of the committee have any questions for Mrs. Chapman? It Sorry. appears not you relieved, Mrs. Chapman. Thank, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Alan Crichton. You have three minutes as well, Alan, when you come in speaking. Thank you very much, Chairman, Councillors. <clears throat> I'm speaking on behalf of many concerned residents of Kaganyan and surrounding parishes. The reporter refused a very similar application on this land in August 2012, 
and I suggest that this application is not significantly different. The turbines are only six metres lower than the local plan guidelines for large turbines in a large landscape, and this is defined by the landscape architect as a medium to small landscape. There have been some small mitigating changes to this application, but not enough to override the raw reporter's original decision. In fact, the landscape architect points out that some changes have made no difference at all. There's also no mention of how monitoring and enforcement, particularly of conditions three and seven, are to be undertaken, and what I've heard this morning doesn't enforce me with any confidence again. I therefore urge the councillors to reject this application. Thank you, Chairman. Th thank you, Mr. Crichton. Do any members have any questions for Mr. Crichton? In that case, thank you, sir. Would you like to resume yeah. your seat? Next speaker is Ashley Medics. And again, you, you have three minutes, sir, and I'll remind you 30 seconds before the conclusion of your presentation when you be asked to sum up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillors, I note that uh, health issues in relation to how planning applications may adversely affect an individual can be relevant to the decisions that you are making here today. Can I remind you all of the email that I sent you last week? Mr. Young is obviously heavily invested in this project and therefore seems to be unwilling to address the way in which the continuing levels of stress that the proposed Plaskow cluster of turbines is having on my health. My cancer, as you will have read, is a cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. It is incurable and potentially life-threatening. As a cutaneous lymphoma, its activity is noticeable on my body. I have to tell you that I can show direct evidence of an increasing amount of skin involvement over the last few months, which, as you can no doubt imagine, is frightening, to say the least. I have tried my very best to mitigate against the way in which we feel that our quality of life will be detrimentally affected by this proposal and therefore reduce my stress levels. However, it seems that I'm losing this particular battle. My wife, Jackie, and all our family members and friends are becoming increasingly concerned for me. Mr. Young has told me that it is not his responsibility as to what I become stressed by, and that these are my choices. He has even gone as far as suggesting that he may be forced to take action against me if I continue to link his name and his plans with my health. I leave it to your good selves to decide whether or not this is a reasonable position for him to adopt. Finally, councillors, Mr. Jackson, who was appointed by the Scottish ministers to carry out the survey into Mr. Young's appeal against this committee's refusal of his original plans for three 84 metre turbines, used the words, these turbines would have overwhelmed Plaskow Cottage. At 74 metres, which is 243 feet in old money, and moved only slightly further back, we feel in the strongest possible terms that they will still overwhelm us, no matter what your planning officers have said in their report. We have seen a photomontage of the new turbines as viewed from our property, and I have to tell you that we shall still see the entire hub assemblies and part of the towers from where we live. The nearest turbine will be a mere 650 metres from our cottage, well within the Scottish Planning Authority's recommended two-kilometre setback from individual properties. Anyone in their right mind must know that this is simply too close. I beg you to refuse these plans. Thank you for my chance to speak to you today. Thank you, Mr. Medics. Does any member of the committee have any questions for Mr. Medics? In that case, sir, if you'd like to resume your seat, thank you very much for your presentation. We now have the applicant, Mr. Rory Young, and again, you will have three minutes to, in which to do your presentation. Good morning. <coughs> My name is Rory Young, and I'm the farmer who's applying for permission to build Blasco Wind Farm. Firstly, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today. I also wel welcome the recommendations for approval from Dumfries and Galloway Plants Planning Department. The proposal for Plasco have been over six years in the making, 
with a previous proposal for a larger scheme having been rejected in 2012. <coughs> the new proposal takes into account the reasons for the previous rejection, and I firmly believe it answers these concerns. I've worked closely with my neighbours, local residents and various consultees to come up with a design that sees the turbine heights reduced considerably, the location of the turbines move further down the hill and also move significantly further from a number of the closest homes. Residential amenity studies have shown that the newly proposed siting of these turbines will not have an adversely negative effect on local homes. This move has been endorsed by your planning officer and your landscape architect. The council landscape architect concluded the revised scheme has responded to the issues raised in the refusing of the previous scheme. This redesign sees no objections from consultees such as SNH, RSPB, Environmental Health, Historic Scotland and the Council's own landscape architect. It has also been welcomed by the majority of our neighbours, with three out of the four closest properties to Plasco having actively written to the Council in support of the revised plan. There have been further endorsement of the project with 71% of 135 letters of representation being in support. Further analysis shows that of the 17 homes within two kilometres of the site, only one has objected and 10 have actively supported the application. I think this shows how far we have come with this new proposal. We are lucky, lucky to have civil, electrical, cement, steel and drainage experts all within Dumfries and Galloway and I am committed to using as many of these local companies as possible to help build a successful project. The electricity from these turbines would allow my existing farm business to produce a carbon neutral commercial free range egg, one of the first of its kind in the UK. This could be a real coup for Dumfries and Galloway and highlight the quality of its produce and sustainability of its businesses. I do believe Plasco is different from the vast majority of onshore wind farm applications for the following reasons. I am a local employer of 13 people and I am committed to supporting local businesses. The Council policy and guidance states that the area is suitable and can accommodate turbines of this medium size. The proposal is not contrary to any policy and is recommended for approval from the planning department. The vast majority of my neighbours support the proposal which I'm sure you will agree is unusual for a wind turbine application. You have 30 seconds left, sir. I've taken significant care and attention to ensure that as many of the potential impacts on the local community have been minimised, something that has been highlighted by the officer's report by significant levels of support. Initiatives like the carbon neutral egg business show clear indications of how the electricity produced would be used locally. Plasco Wind, Farms, Wind Farm offers a local charitable trust the opportunity to be gifted a 10% ownership stake in this project with benefits of regular income stream and the ability to be in control of its own destiny and create a sense of community ownership. Can you draw a conclusion, please? I feel it's very important to highlight to you that I'm not a wind farm developer looking to take advantage of this region's resources and to take profits out of the area, rather a local farmer who's looking to maximise the use of his land whilst at the same time ensuring that my neighbours the local community and the local economy can benefit as much as possible. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mr Young. Does any member have any questions for Mr Young? Councillor Diggle. Mr Young, could you just uh, repeat the statistics you gave for the people in the immediate vicinity and their views, Certainly, please? Yeah. <coughs> there was a total of 135 letters of representation made to the Council of which 70% were in support and 30% were in objection. Uh, within the local vicinity, within two kilometres of the project, there are 17 homes, of which one has objected, 10 have actively supported, and six made no comment. Any other questions for Mr Young? In that case, I thank you very much. If you'd like to resume your, your seat. <coughs> Members, we're now in session, Council. Councillor McCaughtry, do you have a question for the applicant? We're now in session. Councillor McCaughtry. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> probably come as no surprise in the same way as the professional planner uh, stuck to the same recommendation as he made the last time. I am still of the same opinion that I was the last time. Um, although the um, new proposal has the uh, turbines 10 metres uh, smaller than the last time from base to tip, as we saw in the photographs, the, uh, they're, all, they're all actually 15 foot lower on the contour that can be seen uh, in the far distance. And I think the one thing that was shown by the photographs that uh, the planner put up, this is a relatively unspoiled part of uh, the stewartry. There's nearly a wind turbine in sight in, in the near distance, 
What is more worrying is the fact that if this was to go ahead, and I think it's contained page 17, paragraph D, that as far away as uh, Auchin Cairn, these uh, things could be seen. It's all very well saying that some things would be hidden by planting, but uh, trees are not forever. They're harvested uh, commercially. So I think it would have a, a visual impact. I don't intend to, uh, to say much more. I think that the arguments were put forward the last time, and they are contained. And therefore, I would move it be refused on the grounds, one, that these are medium topology turbines located within the Robiti unit of the coastal granite uplands landscape character type in the increasing Galloway Wind Farm Landscape Capacity Study 2011, an area which is an overall high medium sensitivity to this topology. As such, it is considered that proposed turbines would significantly dominate the scale of nearby settlements and intrude in the views of the core uplands as the turbines would form dominant, overbearing and incongruous features by reason of the scale, the positioning relative to nearby dwellings and their location. Secondly, the proposed development would be inconsistent with Structure Plan Policies E3 and S21 and Local Plan General Policies 1 and 7. And three, while the proposal would contribute to the Scottish Government's renewable energy targets, that is insufficient reason to outweigh the unacceptable adverse visual and landscape impacts that would result locally and be felt in particular by the occupiers of Glasgow Cottage, Turkira Cottage and Turkira Bungalow. And four, there are no material considerations which justify approval of the proposal. Five, and I'll refer you to page uh, 19 of 226, paragraph G. Construction of a wind farm in this area would adversely impact upon the setting of Turkira Fort and from Coltrane Tower, both designated monuments. The proposal therefore raises concerns with regard to Structure Plan Policy E12, which states there will be a presumption against development which would destroy or adversely affect the appearance, fabric or setting of scheduled ancient monuments, sites of national importance and other areas of significant archaeological interest. Paragraph 2, there would be a series of localised overlapping adverse effects in the setting of historic assets as well as in the historic character of the landscape. This would have a detrimental impact on the historic character and appearance of the area, which in turn may adversely affect the sense of place and local identity of local residents and the experience of visitors. The proposal also has the potential to be detrimental to tourism, which is important to the local economy due to its visual intrusion in an area with tourism assets and facilities. And finally, the degree of change would arise from the direction of three 74 metre high turbines at this location is assessed as unacceptable for the following reasons. It's contrary to IPP, Scottish Historic Environment Policy, where Scottish Minister's vision and key principles indicate that people of Scotland are entitled to expect the historic environment to be protected, cared for and used substantially so it can be passed on to the benefit of future generations, as contained within paragraph 110. And I would so move, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor McCaughtry. Before I seek a second, uh, I'll see what other members have to say. Councillor Carruthers? Uh, Chief Spawn, the only question that's outlined for, outstanding for myself is what was raised with the two, in regards to the, the two-kilometre zone. I would just like to get clarity on that. I mean, there was mention from the, the last object of Mr Medics, I think it was, in regards to the Scottish Government policies, there should be a two-kilometre zone. Just if we could have clarity on that, please, before I come back with any possible proposals. Can okay, I ask David to respond to that? Unfortunately, I don't have my copy of the SPP with me, but from memory, what it actually says is that when you're producing your development plan in relation to wind energy, areas of search should be more than two kilometres from towns, villages, settlement. It doesn't anywhere, to the best of my knowledge, say that no turbine shall be within two kilometres of any house. Councillor Carruthers? Just to put my thoughts on the table at the moment, just after that clarity, that I mean... I'm more than supportive of the recommendations contained within the, the report at this moment in time, but I'm happy to hear what other members are saying. But I would most likely come back if, uh, with, with that as a recommendation. Thank you for that, Councillor McKee. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, just looking at the Council archaeologist's uh, objection, and it's on about in uh, 2.3c, page 18. It's on about sensitivity rating and respect to settlement and archaeology is high to medium for turbines 50 to 80 metres in height. So I would take it that it's high at 80 and medium at 50. And further on, on the top of the next page, it says turbines towards the lower height band of this typology would be more likely to have a better relationship with settlements in terms of scale. 
and could be associated with industrial facilities, etc. So I feel that although they've reduced the size as recommended by the reporter, I feel that they've not, not went uh, far enough and that uh, it's still extremely prominent and it's out of scale with the immediate area and it wouldn't, uh, it'll not relate to the surrounding landscape part, pattern. So on, no, on, those, um, on that basis I would uh, tend to support what Councillor McCoughton has said. Are you seconding that proposal? I'll second, or? I'll second Councillor okay, thank you. Vice Chair Councillor Dick. Thanks, Chair. Uh, just uh, in relation to, to uh, the Council archaeologists' um, uh, assertions within the report, I read them with some surprise um, and have to say I completely agree with the planning officer's uh, the judgment of, of that and refer to 4.29 where it points out the fact that Historic Scotland and Council archaeologists in the previous application had no objections uh, on the basis of these two historical sites, um, of which I have to confess I hadn't heard of before. Um, and I refer to 4.3 uh, as well, 3.30, um, uh, that it was not raised, uh, a concern was not raised in relation to the previous application by the consultee or appeal reporter, uh, and that it's not considered that, uh, that uh, the objection on this, base, on this application is supportable, justified, or sustainable position to adopt. Other than that, uh, before hearing for further members, my, my, my instinct at, the, at the, this point is that the applicant appears to have gone to some lengths to, to alter the, the, the conditions and uh, um, I certainly would like to hear what other members have to say at the moment but uh, uh, I feel that the planning officer's recommendation may well be justified. Thanks for that Councillor Dick. I think there's an explanation as to why the Council Archaeologist objects this time and it is contained in 2.3, page 18 at 226. Councillor Witts. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm concerned about some of the statements in, on page 21 in, with the rep, regard to the representations. The turbines could be seen from Balkari Bay. I sail in these waters. I'm absolutely certain the turbines cannot be seen from Balkari Bay because the peninsula of Albarness uh, intrudes. Um, it's uh, very important that we have accurate statements here and uh, I'm sure that um, there are certain ones here that I'm not content with. Further on, we continually hear that 18% um, of 18% of tourists would not visit an area if a wind farm was constructed. Um, I would like to see more evidence regarding that. Um, as regards this particular proposal, I, I'm quite I'm content that um, it sits on the western edge of the Criffle Massif. And I am satisfied that uh, because of the height of these hills um, to the east, um, it is not particularly intrusive in terms of the surrounding landscape. Um, that's my contention. Thank you. Thank you for that, Councillor Witts. Councillor Garoy, then Councillor Maitland. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd just like to say that I think the, the last application, I think the turbines were too big. I think it was an overdevelopment of that area. I now reckon that the 10 metres less and a slightly changed position, I think the applicant has responded to the issues that were pre previously raised, and I actually have no problem supporting the, this application. So I don't know whether Councillor Carruthers has actually put forward uh, an amendment. It will be now to go with the recommendation, but I'd be happy to second that. If I'll come back to that shortly, Councillor Garoy, Councillor Maitland, then Councillor Geddes. Um, th thank you very much, Chairman. Um, the, uh, when, when I first saw this um, and looked at it quite carefully, because I'm familiar with that area simply because I drive along that road every, every day, um, I, I was a little concerned. Um, I wasn't party to the last uh, decision uh, making. Um, and I have actually looked very carefully at the topography and at the uh, placing of the dwellings. Um, I also am taking careful notice of the fact that there is a difference in this application um, with respect to the acceptance by the community. Quite considerable difference to this application than there are to others. Uh, and I, I don't think that's actually to be set aside lightly. I think we should take notice of that. Um, nevertheless, um, the, the, the planning policies um, and the uh, assessment within the landscape um, considerations seem to me make it 
um, more than reasonable to accept this um, um, proposal as it stands. But I want to say, um, with respect to the lights, now everybody knows, I think, probably that um, I, I am very concerned about lighting and introducing something, um, lighting, into an area which is not necessary. Why, why, when the gliding um, organisation have not bothered to come back in any shape or form, the people who are going to be most affected by this have not said anything? Why on earth do we have to have um, red lights flashing at night on these, um, on these structures? I fail to understand that. I'm, I'm sure if members are inclined to approve and we haven't got to that stage yet, we can place a condition that infrared lighting should be used, and I think it's council policy to try and persuade uh, developers to use infrared lighting. You want to respond to that, David, before I ask Councillor Geddes to come in? It, well, it isn't actually council policy in that. It's become committee practice to do that, and that's actually referred to in paragraph uh, three point, uh, sorry, 4.31 on page 31. You'll note there that normally we would consider infrared to be appropriate, but in this instance you've got the Dumfrieshire and District Gliding Club airstrip located 1.5 kilometres to the southeast of the site. Uh, for that reason, we felt that there, there might be some issues with this one uh, compared to normal because they will not have night vision goggles that uh, the MOD would. Do you want to come back in that council meeting before us? Well, I, I don't think in? people glide at night. I don't know about anybody else, but it's not, not my understanding that people glide at night. That thought went through my mind, but I don't think we need to go there. Hey, Councillor Geddes? Well, as far as I'm concerned, so the comments that councillors Maitland and Gilroy have made in particular uh, resonate with me, and I have no compunction, or I will have no compunction at the appropriate time if the amendment, in fact, has been, uh, uh, has been duly moved and seconded in, in supporting that. Uh, subject, of course, to the uh, amendment in relation to paragraph 5, our condition, proposed condition 5, sir. Uh, and in addition, uh, I, I would be of the view, standing what's already been said, both by yourself and, and, uh, and, and uh, Councillor Maitland in particular, we should in fact be insisting an infrared form of lighting. It's custom and practice of this committee to do so, uh, and I don't see that we should make any difference in this particular instance. Happy to move an amendment. Uh, we do uh, we approve this this application subject to the conditions set out in the, in the report as per the the author's recommendation. And we're asking for a, a, I think it was a change at five, and Councillor Maitland's also asking for a, a infrared lighting to be added, uh, infrared lighting to be added to that. Happy for that. Uh, depending on uh, Councillor Goy, uh, Gilroy have to make her comments as well. Notwithstanding what the planning officer said regarding the omission of GP24, I feel it would be a useful uh, addendum, um, although I'm not going to die in the ditch over it, but my purpose would be to highlight the fact that the applicant has shown uh, that he wishes to uh, use this if we grant this application for farm di diversification for, um, for uh, employment, which... and. And this region, God knows, needs economic regeneration. And I'm not going to stand in the way of that, notwithstanding the fact that I, would, I listened carefully to uh, objections, but uh, I feel in this case uh, the applicant has gone great, to great lengths to mitigate the previous application. And um, I just wondered why, <coughs> if we put in GP24, um, uh, it, it, it would uh, um, be another... Um, that is strength to it would be another indication of why we granted it. Although I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to uh, uh, go against what the proposal on the second if they're minded to add GP24. But sorry, we have Councillor Geddes, and I'll ask the proposal on the second amendment that wish to change what they have already put forward to the committee. Councillor Geddes. Well, for the record, sir, I, I would not support uh, Councillor Woods' suggestion. I think that, you know, the amendment uh, as put forward by Councillor Crothers and seconded by Councillor Gilroy, uh, you know, more than adequately meets, uh, uh, you know, certainly my, my views. Councillor Crothers and Gilroy, you have a request to amend the, 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 the amendment 
or alternative to the council, which can put up a counter amendment. Uh, how do you feel about council Carruthers? I think, well, at a personal level, I think it's it's okay the way it is. It was explained earlier on that this, uh, the farm diversification could have been part, but the actual the wind farm policy has much greater weight, and that can be used accordingly. So I would agree with that. So not on this occasion uh, for Councillor Witts, but like I say, subject to the change in condition five in the, in the in infra. Councillor Goroy appears to be nodding in agreement. So, Councillor Witts, you have the option to put forward a counter amendment, otherwise, we'll go to the vote. I'm not going to die in the ditch over this, Chairman. Thank you for that, Councillor Witts. I'll ask Clark to read out the proposal and the amendment. Can I just clarify, please, Councillor McCautry? I have noticed seven grounds for your motion. Is that correct? Do you want me to run through them? I'll, I'll give you them at the end of the meeting. It looks well, I'll, I'll, run, I'll run through them briefly for the benefit of members, if that was OK, but please correct me if I picked them up wrong, because you did go quite fast. So you want to refuse because the me these are medium typology turbines located within the LBT unit of the coastal granite uplands, landscape character type in the Dumfries and Galley wind farm landscape capacity study 2011, an area which has an overall high-medium sensitivity to this typology, as such, it is considered that the proposed turbines would significantly dominate the scale of a nearby settlement, intruding the views of the core uplands, and the turbines would form dominant overbearing and congruous features by reason of their scale positioning relative to nearby dwellings and the location. Two, that the proposed development would be inconsistent with structure plan policies E3 and S21, local plan policies 1 and 7. Three, while the proposal would contribute to the Scottish Government's renewable energy targets, that is insufficient reason to outweigh the unacceptable adverse visual and landscape impacts that would result locally and be felt in particular by the occupiers of Plasco Cottage, Torquera Cottage and Torquera Bungalow. Four, construction of a wind farm in this area would adversely impact on the setting of Torquera Fort and Drumcong Tower, both designated monuments. The proposal therefore does not comply with policy E12. Five, there would be a series of localised overlapping adverse impacts on, the se on a setting of historic acts assets as well as on the historic character of the landscape. This would have a detrimental impact on the historic character and appearance of the area and adversely affect the sense of place and local identity of local residents. Six, the degree of change that would arise from the erection of the turbines at this location is assessed as unacceptable as it is contrary to IPP, Scottish Historic Environment Policy and the Scottish Minister's vision and principles that the people of Scotland are entitled to expect the historic environment to be protected, cared for and used sustainably. And seven, there are no material considerations which justify a con approval of the proposals. Is that correct? Councillor McCorkery. <laughs> more, more, more or less. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> I think I can uh, get the, the last word, Chairman, as we move to the motion. Absolutely. Thank you. I just ask members to support the uh, the motion. I mean, the only difference from last time is it's 15 foot lower. If members seem to think that's some major change and some great uh, asset for the local community, particularly in the Kirkgunyan area, we've got to live with it, then I, I really think that uh, we're putting a blight in the landscape in that particular part of this uh, this area. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor McCoffrey and Councillor Crowther has declined, so okay. we can go to the vote, please. It's, it's, uh, yes, the amendment is to approve per the recommendation subject to the deletion of Condition 5 and amendment of Condition 13 requiring infrared lighting only. Chair. Amendment. Uh, Councillor Dick. Amendment. Councillor Carruthers. Amendment. Councillor Diggle. Motion. Councillor Dryborough. Motion. Councillor Geddes. Amendment. Councillor Gilroy. Councillor Crimmel not present. Councillor Hislop. Amendment. Councillor Maitland. Amendment. Councillor McCautry. Motion. Councillor McCutcheon. Amendment. Councillor McKee. Motion. Councillor uh, Thompson. Amendment. Councillor Woods. Two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten. Yeah. That's four votes for the motion, ten for the amendment. The committee has determined to approve the, approve the application per the recommendation subject to changes to conditions. Thank you, members. Uh, if someone would like to invite Councillor Blake to rejoin the meeting, we will go into item number five. If any member of the public wishes to leave at this point, that would be perfectly acceptable. There are others that hope to fill the public gallery.
Thank you for that, members. We now come to item number five. Insulation of wastewater pumping station, formation of lay-by and associated landscaping, including removal of trees, renewal of planning for mission 08-P-4-0286 at land adjoining Cannon Bay Village Hall, Cannon Bay. The recommendation is to approve subject to conditions and the case officer is Lindsay Brown. Lindsay, will you take us through your presentation, please? Good morning. Um, I'll just take you through the photographs. Um, this first photograph has been taken from the B6357, which is the main road through Cannon Bay at its junction with Riverside Park. It's looking in a southwesterly direction back towards the application site, which is located on the grass embankment beyond the railings and before the village hall. The application site is located at or below the level of the adjoining public road. Moving across the road, this photo looks across the application site, which is between this point and the village hall. Moving back west along the B6357 to a point opposite the village hall, this photo looks east towards the application site, which is located beyond the cars and the hedge in the middle ground of the photograph. From within the hall car park adjacent to the building itself, this photo looks in a northeasterly direction across the application site, which comprises the grass embankment to the right of the centre of the photograph, between the hedge um, and the edge of the football pitch, which can just be seen towards the, the right hand side of the photograph. Looking in a northeasterly direction from the edge of the football pitch itself, the application site is located between the timber railing, which can just be seen to the left-hand side of the photograph, and the small tree um, in the distance, which is just in front of the white building to the right of centre. This photograph has been taken from the middle of the football pitch, looking back towards the application site, which lies between the village hall and the small trees um, towards the right-hand side of the photograph. Um, and this final photograph um, has been taken from the edge of the playing field. Um, it looks back across the application site. Um, four small trees to the right-hand side of the photograph are those which it is proposed to fell as part of the development and the tree closest to the right-hand side of the photo marks the edge of the application site, and the timber railing uh, just to the front of the village hall marks the southern extent of the application site. And this slide shows the location um, of the application site in relation to um, Cannon Bay, and the playing fields, the river, and the village hall. Um, this is the proposed site plan for the development, which comprises the three underground chambers, um, a control centre kiosk together with the lay-by, a retaining wall, um, a new handrail and a small extension to the village hall car park. And also the, the reprofiling of the, the grass embankment. This slide is just a blown up view of the previous uh, one so you can get a better view of the proposed development. Uh, this slide shows the proposed elevations of the development. The elevation at the top of the slide shows the view from the public road to the north. Um, as most of the development is below ground level uh, and below the level of the adjoining road, this view would generally be of the, the new railings, the hedge and some new planting. The control kiosk, which would extend above the, the road level by about one metre, would generally be screened by the, the new hedge that's proposed. The middle elevation is the proposed view from the playing fields where the control kiosk, the, the sandstone clad retaining wall and the reprofiled embankment would be seen. And then the bottom elevation shows the view from the northwest um, as you look back towards the, the village hall from the edge of the, the playing fields. This is an extract from the Cannon Bay inset map in the Annandale and Estill local plan. Um, the red line shows the, the application site, the green line um, is that of the area safeguarded for amenity open space and play areas and the yellow line shows the Cannon Bay Conservation Area. And this final slide shows the relationship of the application site within the village 
uh, to the site of the new wastewater treatment works, uh, which is located to the north of the village um, at Naughty Home Farm. Overall, there has been no material change in local or national policy and no material change to the application site, its surroundings or any other material change in circumstances since the original grant of planning permission in December 2008 and no new material planning considerations have been identified. Uh, the proposals therefore remain in accordance with the Council's development plan policies and guidance um, and is therefore recommended for approval subject to conditions. Thank you, Lindsay. First question is from Councillor Dick Vishia. Um, just on the basis of your, your, your summation there, um, uh, Lindsay, can we assume that essentially what we're dealing with here with is a process or a procedural application? The, the previous lap, uh, application consent had lapsed and consequently it's up for renewal. Is that a fair summation? Lindsay? Um, the previous application, uh, the permission was still um, extant at the time that the previous application was submitted. Uh, uh, sorry, that this application was submitted. Um, the works hadn't been commenced during the, the term of the previous permission because there hadn't been the, the demand for the capacity at that time. Um, however, there is, there is now the capacity and therefore, yes, they, they wish to renew uh, that previous permission. Thanks, Lindsay. Councillor McKee. Uh, th <coughs> thanks. I did catch quite what you said, Lindsay, regarding the, the boundary of the development as against the football pitch. And I was quite concerned when I see a, a beech tree being planted. I kind of wondered if it was in the football pitch. Could you just clarify that for us, please? Okay, this slide probably um, shows um, the development best. Um, the photographs which I showed you um, included four small trees that were to be felled, which are along um, the, the top edge of the embankment at present. Um, as part of the development, it's proposed to um, do some replacement planting um, in order to help screen uh, the development. Um, they're proposing to plant um, three or four replacement trees at the base of the embankment and precise locations um, and species of tree would be um, agreed um, as part of one of the conditions, which is condition. Condition two would um, require the submission of the precise locations and details of those replacement trees. So I'll leave it in your capable hands. Thanks, Sorry. Well, leave Just it ignore them, Lindsay. Hands. <laughs> Councillor Carras and Councillor Maitland. Is that myself, Chair, did you say? Did it? Yeah. Okay, now just in regards to... We spoke about there's a, a water treatment works being... I think is it under construction, being constructed. This is a pumping station. Pump effluent from the village out to uh, a water treatment that works out with the village. You see, I remember being at the committee when this was last time, it was Andy and Esther area committee at the time. A lot of objections, a lot of people against it. It's a tough decision to make at the time. And it's come back and it is, it's over five years ago, nearly six years ago now, I think it is, coming up this summer. So taking that into consideration, six years for something they must have had into a works programme at that point. And now it, the, the positive point at that time was the removal of a sewage works from the actual playing field and getting a smaller size pumping station. So how far advanced is the actual works uh, in regards to the, the sewage works itself, the new one? I don't think that's very relevant to uh, what we have to discuss today, but Lindsay might want to just briefly respond to that. Just for me, Chair. Okay. Um, I'm uh, not aware just exactly what stage um, the works are at the, the wastewater pumping station at the moment, I'm afraid. Uh, Councillor Maitland and then Councillor Driver. Uh, it, it's just a question about r r um, sandstone to match nearby buildings, right? Um, and I didn't see the pictures of the nearby buildings and the matching. I, I, I've got it up here now, so I wasn't sure what that, whether that was red brick or sandstone, but it's sandstone, uh, which will weather. Okay, thank you. Are you satisfied, Councillor Maitland? Thank you, yes. Thank you. Councillor Dreibra. Thanks very much, Sharon. Um, 
obviously being can be being in my area, I know quite a bit about this, and I was in the last um, area committee when it came forward then, and, uh, and I objected to that particular thing then. It'll be no surprise that I'll be consistent in my views, whether they're bad or good consistent views is up to the members when it comes to the actual votes. I'm just looking at the, there has been a slight change, I believe, in the actual uh, water treatment facility itself from the previous application, which was five years ago, more than five years ago. And, and, and obviously things have been updated uh, mechanically and all that. However, there was there was some local input from Scottish Water having a, a, a um, an open day, if you like, down at Ganaby Village Hall, and an opportunity for looking at other locations. Now it says in the report uh, and under the SEPA guidelines um, that uh, SEPA do not object to the application that is believed to may fall within the exceptions highlighted in the SPP risk fra uh, framework, which states exceptions may arise if. A location is essential for operational reasons. For example, some utilities infrastructure and an alternative lower risk location is not achievable. Now, it's my understanding that there is a lower risk, albeit it will still be within the medium-high flood risk, if, if you like, in, in, in those particular areas. Has there been any discussions with planning officers on where the, the, the potential of these alternative sites uh, and where were they? Mind you, again, Councillor Driver, that's not relevant today, but I'm sure Lindsay will answer the question. Um, certainly. Um, at the time of the original application back in 2008, um, Scottish Water had undertaken um, a site selection process. They had identified three sites, um, including um, the, the, proposal, the pro proposed site in front of you today. Um, the other two sites, uh, one was adjacent to the existing septic tank, which is um, adjacent to the end of the bridge, um, and one was to the north of the bridge. Um, those sites um, were um, dismissed for a number of reasons, uh, which are identified in um, paragraphs 4.13 and 4.14 of my report. Um, the, the site to the north of Canterbury Bridge is also no longer an option as it forms part of the site which was granted planning permission for 85 dwelling houses in 2009. Um, uh, also, um, Scottish Water haven't been able to identify any other potentially suitable sites and um, there hasn't been any other sites suggested by any members of the community that were, um, that were worth it, Scottish Water assessing and therefore the current site, as far as I'm... Um, in Scottish Water um, and the Planning Authority are concerned um, this site remains the only suitable and, and financially viable option. Councillor Driver, you want a further question? Yeah, just a, just a further question. My, my understanding the previous application was a five-year one. I take it this is a three-year one with the new planning principles that we've got in place. Is that correct? What Do you want to respond to that? Um, Chair, Chair, yes, happy to clarify. Um, in in conceptual terms, the case is quite neatly summarised at 4.3 in terms of what you take into account. It's an application for the renewal of an unimplemented planning permission uh, under changes to legislation in August 2009, which came into effect the duration to commence works, as defined in the Act, uh, reduced from five years to three years. And at the same time, instead of putting a planning condition on uh, requiring commencement of works within five years, we simply put a directive on uh, pointing out that the Act required them to commence works within three years uh, would also require uh, an applicant to deal with any suspensive conditions, any suspensive pre-start conditions as well, uh, before they could commence works and implement a planning permission. In this case, obviously, as Lindsay said, the planning permission 08P4286 uh, was before the 9th of August 2009, so it had a five-year duration but they submitted this application for renewal before that application time period, if you like, expired. And by submitting that application within that time scale, you then keep the planning permission alive, if you like, until such time as it's determined. And obviously today, your decision as members is to decide whether or not to renew it or not. But instead of it being five years, it would be a three-year period. Satisfied, Councillor Driver? Okay. Any other questions for the planning officer? In that case, thank you, Lindsay. We now have one speaker, Ellen Coates, on behalf of the applicant. And Ellen, you'll be allowed three minutes as well when your opportunity arises and you start speaking.
Um, first of all, can I say that I'm speaking on behalf of Ellen, She's sat next to me. Um, good morning. I'm um, Steve Lambert. I'm the Scottish Waters Project Manager um, for the proposed development. Um, I'd like to say, first of all, thank you to the case officer for um, presenting the, uh, um, the, the scheme. Um, I, I, I'm at risk of, um, of repeating um, what is in the, uh, um, in, in the report. I'm, I'll, I'll try not to. I'll try to add to um, what, what's there some further understanding. Um, uh, I think, um, first, first of all, it, 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 um, I, I'd like to sort of reiterate that the scheme is part of a broader, sorry, this development is part of a broader scheme to provide improved sewage treatment works, um, sewage treatment facilities to the village of Canonby. Um, and the new system is needed because the existing facility, um, a septic tank, has, has um, reached its full capacity. Um, in answer to, the, to perhaps to the question that was asked earlier, um, that there, there is no element of the scheme that has started yet. Um, we, we will be awaiting the outcome of, um, of, of all issues relating to planning and land before, before we would make a start. Um, the, the pumping station, which is the subject of this um, renewal, um, will transfer uh, sewage flows to the new treatment works, um, and that already benefits from planning permission. Um, the, uh, uh, an, the opportunity, um, if you like, to, to, for a like-for-like like replacement of the septic tank was not possible because of SEPA's requirements for water quality um, discharges, um, but uh, the, this new system will allow the septic tank to be demolished. Um, to, to be effective, the pumping station has to be located at a low point in the gravity-fed sewerage system. Um, and uh, as was mentioned, we did look um, at several other sites, including the septic tank site. Um, these were ruled out largely due to flooding. Um, but, but, it, but it's also worth noting that, that um, uh, well, as I say, the, 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 the facility has to be at the lowest point. Otherwise, there would have to be a pumping station of some sort. Um, and and, and this, this is the lowest point that we could get to um, that was, um, well, very nearly outside of the flood um, plain, SEPA's flood plain. Um, that's the, 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 further, the nearest we could get to the lowest point in the system. Um, well, we, we have had a public information um, event, as was, as was mentioned, um, and we had the opportunity then to explain the development to, to, um, to the uh, local community. Um, you and have to discuss. seconds left, sir. Have I? Oh, right. Um, okay, well, I think one of the, one of the key things that, um, that will, will be worth stressing is that um, uh, one of their concerns was, was uh, pump failure. Um, and and I'd, I'd like to say that uh, this is a, really a state-of-the-art design that um, has, has been designed to minimize choking and blockage. Um, we'll, we'll be, there'll, be more, there'll be two pumps in the, um, in the station uh, in case one fails. Um, the, pump, the pumps will be linked to Scottish Water's Intelligence Control System, uh, Control Centre, so will be monitored year-round, um, and that system can, um, can, can instruct the pumps to re re um, flush the rising main, to switch pumps if needs be, and can mobilise Scottish Water's um, Can you just come to a conclusion now, please? Okay, and uh, uh, finally I'd like to say that, um, that the risk of, um, of, of flooding is very minimal, in, in fact almost non-existent, because... Um, uh, there, there's an emergency overflow which, dis which would discharge the river. Sorry, Thank you, Mr that. Lambert. Do any members have any questions for either Mr Lambert or, or Ms Coates? Uh, Councillor Driver, then Councillor Crothers. Thank, thanks, yeah. Just Can you just clarify the point you made earlier that there'll be no start to what I, th I think I th what I heard was there's no start to work unless there's any further planning applications coming forward for, for new build. I, and, 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 and secondly, you had your public meeting day uh, in Canterbury Hall, I was there myself. Were there any ideas coming forward from the community that you took on board uh, to try and improve the, the actual area? Um, the, the scheme has been around for a while. Um, as, as you say, five years um, since the last planning application or the last planning approval, um, and longer than that for the, for the design in that, those initial days. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, most of the opportunities to... Um, to, to deal with um, community concerns were taken at that early stage. Uh, so so uh, since, since the um, project has been uh, made live again, um, there have not been um, any significant um, changes made uh, in that respect. Um, sorry, what was the other part of your question? 
Can you just clarify when you're actually going to, if, if you get the application through, when you're going to start the work? Right. Um, the, w there are um, uh, planning issues and, um, and land issues that we um, uh, have, have yet to finalise. Um, so the, the, there will be no start on any part of the scheme on, on, on this development or um, the, the wastewater treatment works to which it is linked um, and, until all of those matters have been resolved. Thanks for that, Councillor Driver. Councillor Carruthers? They were almost like for like questions, but you've no answered fully, I don't think, what uh, Councillor Dry Driver has been asking. And the, the first point was in regards to plan permission. I, I'd understood that plan permission you're talking about was this plan permission here today before you could go and, and actually implement uh, the, the structure of what you're talking about here, the pumping station. And when do you think, I suppose the question for me then is, on top of that, is it this the actual permission or is it permissions out with in, in relation to further development housing or such like what you're talking about, or is it a combination of both? And what is the likelihood of this permission being granted today if it was granted, uh, actually being implemented within the three-year timescale? Um, we fully expect it to be implemented within the three-year timescale. Um, sorry if I've caused any confusion. Um, the, the, the issues that we have are, are related to land. There are no other planning applications um, at the moment um, in relation to it. Uh, having, said, having said that, there are some issues over access to the site, which um, which, which we are um, considering, and um, and th uh, th that that will be during construction, um, and they may require a planning application. So, to be completely open, that's the case. Thanks, Councillor Carlos. Councillor Blake. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, page forty-nine of the report uh, refers to concerns over odour and noise and light pollution. Would you like to make some comment about that? Um, we don't believe that, um, that, that noise will be an issue. Um, the, uh, the chamber um, is, is very deep, seven metres or so deep. Um, the pumps are very modern pumps, um, and in that respect are not very noisy. Um, we, we are, um, in, 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 the, in the original planning um, uh, permission that was granted, one of the conditions was, to do, was related to noise. Um, and required us to achieve um, 30 dBA, uh, we're comfortable that we can achieve that. Um, I, I, I should also say in support that, um, that uh, I, I took um, uh, noise uh, level measurements um, a short while ago and they were significantly um, um, in excess of, um, of, of 30 dBA um, on a relatively quiet evening. Councillor Blake. Mm -hmm. And the concerns about smell, smell and light pollution. Um, yes, apologies, odour. Um, again, I, th I think um, the pumping station should really be considered as an extension of the um, of the existing sewerage system. Um, and uh, we, we we don't have on record any complaints about um, odour from the ex existing sewerage system. Uh, this this is not like a sewage treatment works where you've got um, a um, uh, a, a body of sewage that's, um, that 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 um, sits there and, and is and is treated. Um, it it uh, sewage, sewage comes into the station and is pumped out straight away. It, uh, it is, to all intents and purposes, like the uh, uh, an extension of the sewage system. So therefore, we don't anticipate any um, any smell um, other than that, which you you hardly notice from a um, sewage system anyway. Councillor Blake. Um, and the light and, and, the, and the light, um, they, the, there will um, be occasional um, uh, maintenance visits. We anticipate uh, one or two uh, visits by a van a week um, during the day, during daylight time, um, and um, a, a, uh, a larger vehicle, a tanker, possibly um, maybe once or twice a year. Uh, they would come during um, daylight hours, unless, of course, there was um, a, uh, a significant um, uh, emergency situation. Um, and if it was deemed appropriate, then we would, they, they would have to come at night. But, you know, we believe the risk of that is very slight um, and that would, would happen on a, on a not very uh, uh, regular basis. Um, and uh, most failures can be dealt with um, during the day, uh, daylight hours. Can I just add to that? Um, there's Thanks, no Councilor permanent Blake. lighting proposed. Thanks, Councillor Blake. Uh, any other members' questions for the applicant? 
In that case, if you'd both like to return your seats, please, that would be fine. Members are now in session. Councillor Drybra. See, whether there's absolutely no doubt that this is actually needed. It's actually where is the problem as far as the local community is, is, is concerned. Um, the, the discussions over, over the many years that we've been in Canonby has, has been as to the actual place of the, uh, the application, rather, rather is the requirement for it. Um, the, I certainly believe there are other locations in which this, this could be placed. And as I said before, in, in 2008, I put a, 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 was either a motion or a, an amendment to um, reject the application. And in the interest of consistency, uh, I'm actually going to do the same again. Members will know I've been pulled up before in my consistency with this particular thing. And certainly whether they're bad or good. I mean, Councillor Dick mentioned in the previous application about the inconsistency of the archaeologist. Well, I'm going to be consistent. There's absolutely no surprise there. So the, 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 the motion that I would put forward is this is rejected uh, because it, it, it goes against general policy one in that the development would materially detract from and are being incompatible with the amenity of the local area. If you saw the pictures of that particular area, it's a, it's a beautiful piece of land, well used by the local community. It is prone to flooding, absolutely. Um, the existing equipment is, is at capacity, and if there are any further applications coming forward, then we certainly need something new. But I've heard nothing that, that Disney changed my mind about the, the, the actual site of the application rather than the need for the um, the material there. So I would put that forward as, as a motion. Thank you for that. Then we've got Councillor Geddes and Vice Chair Councillor Dick. Well, I would have to say, sir, as far as I'm concerned, that paragraphs 4.26 and 4.27 of the report under the side heading of conclusion, uh, in my opinion, sum up uh, precisely uh, just exactly what the issues are. Uh, and flowing from that, I have no uh, difficulty with uh, adopting the recommendations which have been put forward in Section 5 of the report. So I would move that, Chair, as an amendment. Thank you, Councillor Geddes. Councillor Dick? Thanks, Chair. <coughs> um, well, I have a lot of sympathy with um, a number of the points that uh, Councillor Driver had made and the, the, uh, listed in the representations. Um, like Councillor Geddes, for me, the, the, the crucial thing in this is 4.26 and 4.27. There are no material change, and I'm well acquainted with what happens when we reject something where there have been exactly that, no material change, and it goes to appeal, uh, and I'm not prepared to see uh, that happen in this case. I feel that the, cl the case is, on a procedural ground, I feel it is clear-cut, and if Council Geddes has uh, proposed that, I would second it. Thank you for that. So we have a, 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 a proposal from Council Driver. I'm still looking... I understand that, Paul, which hasn't been seconded yet. And we have a, 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 an amendment from Councillor Geddes, seconded by Councillor Dick, which now becomes the motion. Do we have a seconder for Councillor Dryborough? Councillor Blake? Yeah, it's not to, to second, it's actually more to do with the proposal. They have no great difficulty with it, other than the applicant himself said that in the last permission that there was a, a noise limit of 30 dBA in, as a condition. Uh, and I would wonder if the proposer and seconder would consider including that again in their proposal. Councillor Geddes? Oh, as far as I'm as, you know, I have no, no problems with that, sir, you know, provided it doesn't prejudice anything in planning grounds. So perhaps with your leave, Chair, perhaps, uh, it would be helpful to me as mover uh, to hear uh, the response from the planning officials. Sure, Robert will assist. Thanks, Chair. I understand it's covered at 4.22 of the report. Um, I would again refer members to 4.3. Planning permission was previously granted for the same development in December 2008 under application 08P4286. So what you're looking at here is if you're minded to go with the recommendation, you are renewing an existing planning permission, which would include the conditions attached. Councillor Geddes? Well, in other words, I'm taking from what Mr Duncan is saying that it would actually be safer you know, to stick with uh, the recommendations as detailed in the, the report. And on that basis, I would be minded with the greatest deference to Councillor Blake, not, in fact, to, to incorporate what he's suggesting into the, uh, the, the motion. And that's not meant to be unhelpful. Thanks for that, Councillor Blake. No, I'm satisfied with the explanation from Mr Duncan. Thanks for that, Councillor Blake. So currently we have a, a motion 
He seconded, and we have an amendment by Councillor Drybra. Councillor Crothers. Thanks, Chair. Just, I think I need to uh, lay out my reasons for actually supporting the recommendations within the, the papers. It's not to second Councillor Drybra, even though I felt a little bit motivated to actually do that in this case. But remember, last time we had a site visit, it was actually what was shown to, and described as at the time. It, it was to remove a sewage works from its present position to a, a far more appropriate position. Uh, the actual works, there'd, there'd be less of an impact, I would have said, visually and materially across with, with the groundwork. So it'd be almost unseen. Uh, and it, it was taken out with the, the flood, area, uh, flood area where the sewage work actually sits in, which is a much far, far more risk to the, the local environment. So it hasn't been demonstrated. I took very much on board the community councils that there is a lot of points. You go back to, back to near the, one of the last uh, points, which was Scottish water could be could, by taking advantage of local knowledge, actually find a more suitable location. That hasn't been demonstrated on the day. I haven't seen that, and I'm not aware of any more suitable uh, locations where it could be. So for, for those reasons, primarily, I will be supporting the recommendations contained within the report and the, the motion that's been put forward. Thank you for that. So, in the absence of a second for Councillor Dreiber, Councillor McCutcheon. Thank you, Chair. I'm quite happy to second Councillor uh, Dreiber uh, for the same reasons. Um. Thank you for that. In that case, we have a motion and amendment. Will you lead us through the terms of these motion amendment, please? The motion proposed by Councillor Geddy, seconded by Councillor Dick, is to approve the recommendation as set out in the report. The amendment proposed by Councillor Dryborough, seconded by Councillor McCutcheon, is to refuse on the grounds that the proposal does not comply with General Policy 1, as the development would material de materially detract from and be incompatible with the amenity of the local area. Chair. Motion. Councillor Dick. Motion. Councillor Blake. Motion. Councillor Crothers. Motion. Councillor Diggle. Motion. Councillor Dryborough. Amendment. Councillor Geddes. Motion. Councillor Gilroy. Motion. Councillor Hislop. Motion. Councillor Maitland. Motion. Councillor McCautry. Not present. Councillor McCutcheon. Amendment. Councillor McKee. Motion. Councillor Thompson. Motion. Councillor Witts. Motion. 12 and 2. Yeah. That's 12 votes for the motion, 2 for the amendment. The motion is carried and the application has been approved as set out in the report. Thank you, members. I think Councillor McCaughter will now be due to return, as will Mr Sutty. <laughs> Does Councillor McCaughtry propose to return? Right. Okay. Thank you, members. We now come to item six. Erection of 207 dwelling houses, construction of roads, drainage, formation of landscaping and open space, approval of matters specified in conditions three through to nine and 11 of planning permission in principle, 08 slash P slash three slash 0175, including layout, design, external appearance, landscaping, noise assessment, affordable housing, boundary detail and road construction at land between Harris Avenue and Catherine Field Industrial Estate, former college site, Heath Hall, Dumfries. The recommendation is to approve some of the conditions and the case officer is Mary Duff. Mary, would you like to take the presentation, please, or David? 
Uh, Vari probably won't because she's actually, she's actually on holiday at the moment and Janice Key, uh, area planning manager, was actually going to be taking this item. For those of you who know, uh, Janice is actually retiring and this was due to be her swan song and she is finishing with the council tomorrow, but she phoned in with shingles this morning. So um, I'm sure on behalf of the committee, you'd want me to pass on their best wishes for her retirement and a speedy recovery. So uh, I'll be taking this item and any other ones that Janice would have dealt with today. Running through the, the slides quickly, this is the application site. As you can see, uh, even from this, there's a mix of uses in the area. On the, the western side, the, the left-hand side, you've got residential properties. The application site is the, the grey in the middle, which was the former Dumfries and Galway College site, and that has subsequently been demolished. To the south and the, the southeast, you have an area of industrial land. This is Catherine Field Industrial Estate. It's a, a general industrial uh, class five in our planning terms uh, area, which has no restrictions in terms of hours of operation. So you can see already there are, there are a number of uses in the area. This slide shows you that in a bit more detail. You've also got the relatively new Heath Hall Primary School sitting down at the, the southern boundary of the site. Now these photos basically run from south to north along the western boundary, along Harris Avenue. So you can see there, there's a, a planted area running along there just now, and the houses along Harris Avenue are on the left hand of the western side. Moving further along, that gives you a view of the, the type of houses which are there. They're predominantly single story in this neck of the woods. And you get to the top of the site, this is the, the northeast most corner here. That's the most northwest corner, that's the, the bottom bit. There's a perimeter road that runs along, not quite adjoining the application site, but it's called the Northern Perimeter Road here, which links through. So the application site, as you can see, is uh, set down a bit further. That carries along here. You've got the vehicle testing centre of Vosa there. Uh, the red line shows where the edge of the application site is. And that's looking back to the, the same thing. This is within the site now, and we're, we're looking down towards uh, the existing industrial estate. You'll see Unit 8 is marked there, Kellwood Engineering, and then you've got Brown Brothers uh, Storage Hangar. Heath Hall, of course, for those who don't know, was a, a former um, World War II airfield. This is looking across from within the site towards Harris Avenue, so looking westwards. Again, that's showing just across the view across the site with the site boundary. And this shows a bit more closely the actual buildings which are part of Catherine Field Industrial Estate. Just an overall plan of the proposals. It's uh, probably an appropriate moment just to give a bit of background. When the, the college was surplus to requirement, with uh, the college having relocated, they submitted an application for, it was at that time, outline planning permission, we would now call it planning permission in principle, uh, for the residential development of the site. And that was granted in 2010. There were concerns at that time about the juxtaposition of residential with the industrial estate. Obviously, there, there is uh, an element of that in the area in general, but this would be bringing the houses closer to the existing uh, industrial use. So there was a requirement about um, trying to provide a separating buffer zone between the two, and there were a number of conditions which were attached to that planning permission principle. That is what this application is about. The principle having been established, as you'll see in paragraph 4.4 of the report, that really cannot be revisited now. So what you're looking at today, the application before you, is really about the details that have been submitted. So these are the layout, design, external appearance, landscaping, and then uh, that's conditions three to six. Condition seven was about a noise assessment. And you've got condition eight about an affordable housing requirement. And, and then there was condition nine to do with fencing between the development and Catherine Field Industrial Estate to prevent pedestrian access. 
and condition 11 was about uh, the road's construction. You've got a section through the, the site here just showing you the, the street elevation at the top to Harris Avenue. And so you can see there's a mix of houses going in this development where you've got everything from um, detached properties, uh, terrace properties, and even a few flatted properties within it. The, the majority are uh, single story or two story, but there is one element of three story flats, uh, which is around a, a central area. Mix of house types in the area to provide a variety of tenures. I'll come back to that. Uh, just running through the conditions that have been submitted, the layout has been designed to form an informal block arrangement which minimises the number of cul-de-sacs in order to achieve permeability and a, a walkable neighbourhood. A central square forms the focal part. It's uh, proposed to retain existing trees within the site, either within gardens or open public, uh, public open space areas. Two are proposed to be removed at the eastern boundary as recommended within a tree survey. Additional tree planting is proposed throughout the scheme. Open space is proposed in pockets throughout the scheme with a larger kick around area um, as required. Surface water drained to a SUDS, uh, Sustainable Urban Drainage Scheme pond in the southern corner of the site with a discharge to the public system. Condition 7 was in respect of noise, and as you'll probably have uh, picked up from the report, that's certainly been the, the key issue uh, as far as representations go, and we have uh, Richard Proctor from Environmental Health here today to answer any questions that may crop up on that regard. A noise assessment was carried out by the applicants, um, but the Environmental Health Officers, when they had a look at it, wished to see some changes to that. Um, in terms of the, the earth band within the scheme, the, the buffer zone to be incorporated within the open space, acoustic glazing to be required within some um, plots. These do allow the windows to be opened. It also allows them to be closed so uh, and provide noise attenuation that way, so the, the occupants have the choice. They, they aren't stuck with fixed windows. Um, critically, some of the, the applicant here has amended the scheme in accordance with the request from environmental health officers, and that has um, allowed for three houses to be removed. So the deletion of three houses from the scheme and also a re um, reorientation of it. In terms of affordable housing, they're proposing 42 units. You'll notice in the report that at the time the original application was considered, the requirement was for 25%, that has subsequently changed in council policy to 20% requirement, and that's what would be provided. Um, the developer has said that they would have a, a shared equity arrangement, which would comprise a 25% interest um, loan from the, the developer. Uh, the fencing going through, that was to require, to prevent uh, the pedestrians going into the industrial estate. There's a two meter high fence uh, which is akin to the, that which encloses the primary school. Uh, a 1.8 metre high timber fence is proposed from near to the rear of the suds, which doesn't uh, adjoin the existing industrial estate. And finally, condition 11 was to do with um, the, the roads construction. That condition actually predated designing streets, which now wouldn't really encourage um, that type of condition but the, the scheme has received no objections from roads officers. So just to, to reiterate, this isn't an application for full planning permission. Uh, it is an application specifically for the approval of matters specified in conditions of an existing planning permission principle. Thank you, David. If members have questions, we can invite Richard Proctor, the Environmental Enforcement Officer, forward as well so that you can deal with both the elements of this application at this stage if members want. Are there any questions for either the planning officer or the environmental enforcement officer? Councillor Zip, Councillor McKee. Uh, a couple of questions. Just under the road construction one, there was mention within the council officer's report that a 20 mile an hour limit would be implemented. Are the roads that are being planned um, designed so that the limit can be enforced, i.e. are they using sort of 
twisty roads rather than straight ones whereby speeds can be over 20 and therefore would have to be um, speed traffic calming measures put in place. Because I think the, the better by design is for having the roads so that they aren't easily, uh, you know, short straight bits rather than long straights. I'm sure the report talks about build out on the road, but David will reply to that. Thank you, Chair. Yes, as you can see from the layout, it has been specifically designed in mind with designing streets to try and prevent long uh, linear roads, which you then need speed humps on straight away. The whole premise of designing streets is trying to make it more of a place and give priority to the, the people in the area and not the, the vehicles. So. We're comfortable with the layout here that uh, you shouldn't be requiring speed humps straight away. Councillor McKee. Sorry, I was under the impression with parking standards, there's no mention in here of the two parking spaces per house. Has that been dropped in this application? I'm sure it will be designed into the application, but David will tell you. Uh, it's maybe difficult to see, but in front of each house you've got a, a sort of um, beige coloured area which is the, the off-street parking for each of the houses. The flats, as I understand, have a communal parking area, but the, the accord with the, the, the council standards on car parking, to the best of my knowledge. Councillor Crothers. Thank you, Chairman. I was interested in what was mentioned in regards to 20% affordable, then 25% shared equity. Could you just explain that? Was that a are we saying there's a 45% across the whole site between the two, or is that a mixture of both? Previously, you said 25% was the allocation that changed, and as far as affordable at 20, which is fair enough, but this 25% shared equity. I just wonder, I think you said there was a contribution from the developer themselves. Just how that work? David? Uh, I'll read the notes that Vary had prepared. As, um, the proposals for affordable housing are for the provision of 42 units, which would be offered through a shared equity arrangement which would comprise of 25% interest. She's got from loan, but I presume that's interest-free loan from the developer. But uh, as we have the developer's agent here today, I'm sure they'd be happy to clarify that. Councillor Hislop. It was just for clarification. I think I've got the understanding. But was the conditions with regard to noise attenuation taken on the representation that was made at 93 decibels? rather than the previous one, because it says that once the, the submission had been made in 4.32, um, that was the level we took. So was that based on the 93 decibel, the recommendations that this would cover the noise? David? That's probably the point to get Richard in, I think. Might need to come to the front, Richard. They might know what. Just in this corner here, please, aye. Just want to stay there for his Richard, that'd be fine. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Right. We used the 93 decibels for the compressor uh, originally in the yard. We also looked at it um, the way we would expect it to be run with some simple sound attenuation um, when doing our calculations. And they were extrapolated back to site boundary and looked at the, from there out towards the houses to try and predict what the worst case scenario we'd expect to see would be. So that's right, Councillor. So does that mean to say the house is at, I think it's 96 to 117 plots, are covered for 93 decibels on site, or because you said there was sound proofing or something put on or what you thought should be put on the compressor. Just what was the sort of level? I'll try and explain this. What, what we did was we looked at the compressor would it be easier if I actually stood there and pointed on the screen to show you? Would that help? I'll try and try to. We looked at the yard 
area, which is typically where the compressor is run from the information we were given. This compressor at 94 decibels uh, is a figure that was given by Mr Maitland. This is measured at 4 metres away. So what we do is you then extrapolate that level to what that would be on the red line, roughly the, the, the boundary. What we considered was what we would expect other businesses to do typically, is use best practical means when operating any equipment on site in an industrial estate. Now this would be to prevent nuisance to other industrial estate users or the, the school or these proposed houses. So we looked at what we would expect to see. A minimum would be a screening type system to reduce the noise to best practical means. That will typically, typically take off about 10 decibels. So this was then extrapolated back to the, the fence, the borderline, and that's the figures that we used. So the compressor was used at 94. There's been a bit of confusion and maybe some of the points about the actual level produced by the compressor. We spoke to the operators of um, this type of operation, specialist grit and polish type specialists regarding the use of the sides open because the sides have built in some acoustic attenuation. They confirmed that they don't overheat as long as they've got suitable ventilation. So we didn't consider the vents open scenario because we couldn't see a situation where the, the compressor would overheat under normal use. Thanks for that, Richard. Uh, Councillor Driver, then Vice Councillor Dick. Thanks, Chair. I'm just looking at um, the bottom of page 67 with the Council Roads Officers with no objections. However, he does have some concern about um, visitor parking. And I notice in, in 4.15 on page 77 that the potential under provision is acknowledged, but this has to be balanced against the aim of providing streets, streets which are not dominated by originally designed car parking spaces. But we also have a, a design here that doesn't, have, that doesn't have rigidly designed streets. So, so the situation is, uh, has there been discussion with a developer on, on how we're going to try and improve that? Maybe an opportunity for the yes, developer when he comes forward. But David, can you offer any information in the meantime? Not really beyond what's in the report, I'm afraid. We'll get to, we'll get to the developer in due course. Hey, Councillor Dick? Yeah, two things. Just uh, I noticed 4.35 um, that it's considered within the application that the proposal provides for sufficient noise, attenuation and mitigation. Um, could I ask you just to, to maybe uh, give us an idea where the earth bund uh, stretches from um, and where the, just give a, a clear idea of where the noise is likely to be coming from on, on, on the map. And the other thing, uh, just before I uh, finish it, is what is the situation with noise at the moment? Um, is there a because this development hasn't started and the, and the industrial estate is largely isolated um, from residential areas, um, is a, a, an operator allowed to make as much noise as he wants? Um, I'd just like clarification on existing um, uh, legislation. Basically, looking at this plan here, the, the bund, as I understand it, would run along that area there with a darker green. Um, that's Kelwood Engineering there, and the compressor, as I understand it, is often operated in the yard, but I'm sure they'll correct me if I'm wrong on that. Is it our side, is it, sorry? But over that side? Uh, I'm sure that will be clarified later on, but the, the, that's the main source of potential noise. Obviously, it is uh, an unrestricted uh, Class 5 general industrial estate so there, there isn't any hours of operation restriction um, from planning terms. In terms of noise, if there is, e even today, when uh, there are no houses immediately adjacent, um, as I understand it, the situation is that if a statutory noise nuisance is being created, then environmental health would have to respond to any complaint that came in, and that's an existing situation. Obviously, the what we don't want to do is have a situation where an existing authorised general industrial use is um, restricted on its current authorised usage. And that's what this has been trying to strike the balance between the, the reasonable expectations of a general industrial use that's already been there for some considerable time and the reasonable expectations of uh, new residents moving into the houses. Thanks for that, Councillor Dick. I've got Councillor Goroy, then Councillor Witts. 
Just a bit of clarity. Um, do you mean to say that you did a noise assessment or a noise impact, which is one of the things we've got to consider here um, today, without actually the main noise happening, which is the compressor? So it, what you've done is a paper exercise? Richard? Uh, no, we don't actually do the noise assessment. It's done by the applicant's uh, independent consultant. We don't do the noise assessment. We look at their noise assessment when it comes in to see if we agree with their information they provided, and then we try and provide information to the planning department on a, on a balanced situation. It's not us that undertakes the actual noise assessment. The figures we've used have come from both the consultant operating for the uh, applicant stories and from information given from uh, Mr Maitland at Kelwood and also from what we've seen when we visited uh, this somebody who operated one of these compressors for, for their, their sort of livelihood. But, but what I'm getting is that nobody has really actually assessed the noise impact of a, of a compressor going, working properly on that industrial site. It's all been done as a paper exercise. Richard? Well, there has been some... Uh, actual monitoring of the compressor, the noise of the compressor to, to establish the the limits that a compressor or the noise that a compressor makes and recently in the extension that's proposed further on down the site the actual compressor was measured as part of, it was on site and measured as part of, of that assessment so the levels have been uh, shown and, and demonstrated they're actually found to be less when they were measured by the cons uh, consultant working for this extension than what we've given in terms of uh, the planning or what we recommend or what we used when we calculated. Thank you, Richard. Councillor Witts. Thanks, Chair. I'm looking at the paragraph at the foot of page 81 on land contamination. I'm trying to get my head around it. Uh, particularly the subsequent paragraphs in which it says that uh, um, further investigation take place uh, with appropriate mitigation. And the final sentence, it cannot be a condition of the approval of matters specified in conditions, but is recommended as stated. It is stated as advice within the decision notice. Uh, first question is, why is it not I mean, a condition? Because land contamination can be a, a serious issue. And secondly, um, what would be the form of the advice within the decision notice. David. The reason why it can't be a condition is that when you have granted planning permission in principle, you cannot then attach <coughs> new onerous conditions. You can have conditions which are relating to extra details on the details you've received, but that would actually be quite an onerous condition to attach. It is relevant, and uh, obviously the, the applicant is aware of it. It would go on in the form of what's called a directive. It's not binding, we can't enforce it, but it goes on at the end of the, the actual planning permission decision document, and the directive here would actually just be basically what has been said by the contaminated land officer. Councillor Witt. So when we granted outline planning permission in the past, uh, was the matter of land contamination raised, or possible land contamination? David. To the best of my recollection, at that time we didn't have a contaminated land officer. It's been a relatively recent development, so it probably wouldn't have been attached to at that time. But it's certainly going forward, it's something that we always now do on Brownfield sites. Councillor Driver. Just, just on the same point, you're ob obviously there's a plan in principle, and if it was to agree there would be a full plan and application coming forward after this. Now, could that be attended as a condition in the full plan and application, if this was to be granted? No. This is, this, the plan and application has been approved. This is us now agreeing the layout only. We can potentially decline this application on the basis that we don't like the layout, but we can't affect the permission that's already been granted, but David might wish, wish to clarify that. No, you have a, a new role as a planning consultant, uh, Chair. That's, that's absolutely spot on. Councillor <laughs> 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 Dick. 
Thanks. I, I just want to be, be clear about this because it's coming down to the, 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 the mitigation uh, attenuation of, of noise. It's, it's essentially coming down to a compressor which operates, according to the papers, about 11 hours per week. It's located at the opposite side of that industrial building, if, I'm, if, I, was, if I understood that correctly. So it's to some extent uh, shielded by the, the industrial building. There'll be a bund placed along the line that you indicated before, and the, the developer has taken three houses out which may have been considered to have been at risk of, of, of the noise. So uh, is that a fair assessment of the, the extent uh, of the noise mitigation that we're looking at? David. Yes, that's pretty much my understanding as well. You'd have the bund, um, obviously there's some form of fence along there as well, and planting. The scheme has been amended not just to delete three houses, but to turn the orientation of a number of houses round so that the front elevation is facing towards the industrial estate, um, giving better protect. And it's these windows on the front that would actually have the, the special um, type of glazing on it, giving uh, more insulation to the rear of the property. Thank you, Ian. Any other members for planning officer, Stephen? Thank you. It's on the noise again. Um, it mentions 93 decibels as the the noise from the compressor, and um, <clears throat> David sort of explained that obviously the sort of established industrial use, if you like, of that site is kind of you know you can't really um, it's not feasible to put sort of conditions on on that sort of thing. But what would be the what would be allowed currently in that industrial site? And is the mitigation sufficient to meet the current 93 decibels? But if there's something more than that, which could be well within the sort of uh, limits of the industrial use next door, then the mitigation wouldn't be sufficient to meet that. Even though it does say in 4.33, um, it wouldn't be reasonable to require additional mitigation based on what may happen in the future, but is there a risk there that the, the mitigation wouldn't be able to cope with the maximum permitted noise for that um, industrial area. Richard? The, there's no set limits in relation to what you can and cannot produce in noise because you've got to look at it compared to surrounding environment. So, I mean, obviously in, in the past there's been a situation here you can create noise and there's been nobody close by that could be affected. So those noise levels haven't been desperately important because it's only been the people in the industrial estate that might be affected. The houses, we, we've looked at the situation. This is what we've tried to create as, as a worst case situation is what we've tried to look at. This is not what we would typically expect to see on a, a normal operating day. I feel if you are getting above 94 decibels, you'd be really starting to look at loud equipment being used outside to increase above 94 decibels. To try and put it into perspective, um, one of the, the British standards talks about standing 20 metres away from a motorway and that quotes 78 decibels as that level. So to get much above it, you would have to bring in some pretty big equipment um, to do it. And obviously, the people that bring in this equipment, they do operate it in a responsible manner. They don't just bring it in and park it next to the fence to create the maximum noise they can. Um, you know, they, they can position these compressors and the likes so that they, they have a, a, a minimal impact or a reduced impact. Um, but still allowing them to operate the, what they want to do. And it's a, it's a balancing act with the operation of the business um, to, to see if they're going to, if they're prepared to, to just keep creating noise to show that they can do it or whether they're, they're going to operate in a, a responsible manner. So just from what you're saying there, 90, above 94, you wouldn't expect that in an industrial estate anywhere? I can't think of an industrial estate I've been to in the recent Galloway that gets near to 94, to be honest. Stephen, okay. Okay. Any other member? In that case, we have a few objectors and an applicant. The first objector is David Farless and we have a Kelwood Engineering. David, you will have a five-minute window and I will remind you with 30 seconds to go that your time's about up. David? Uh-huh. 
apologies there for the confusion. Uh, thank you, Chair, members of the committee and officials for the opportunity, opportunity to speak to you today. The, if I could start off with the permission in principle, and I wish to reiterate, and I think my client will do so as well, there is no objection to the principle of housing on this particular site. This is not the challenge that we have. Uh, when the permission was granted, it was for the use of the site for residential purposes, but critically, in this case, and this is an acknowledgement on the part of the Council at the time, there was concern about the interaction between the existing industrial estate and the prospective layout. Hence, the fact Condition 7 was attached, which was quite an exceptional exercise in its own right. Um, so the contest that we have is that whilst the majority of the, the housing on the site is perfectly acceptable from our point of view. It uh, is the housing in closest proximity to the industrial estate that we have an issue with, and we don't think that the measures proposed <coughs> excuse me, um, are sufficient uh, in these circumstances and therefore don't meet the terms of that condition 7 on the in-principle application. The submitted noise impact assessment does not presently account for existing operations on the site, so we question the validity and acceptability of mitigation measures being proposed. The BS 4142 establishes acceptable limits for housing development. It does not seek to establish limits for the industrial estate or now impose levels the existing operations have to comply with. The industry has unfettered operation in terms of hours of operation, noise, external working areas, etc. This proposal will severely curtail that freedom, will result in statutory nuisance orders being issued on established businesses and greatly affect the potential operation and expansion in the future. Within the report, consultees confirm that despite the measures being put in place, there is still every likelihood there will be occasions where operations in the industrial estate will constitute a noise nuisance. In paragraph 431, there is an acceptance that the mitigation measures do not take account of the compressor unit and accept that, uh, that if it were running, which there are no controls in place to regulate the time or frequency of that activity, there would be a significant increase in noise. So there's an acknowledgement there that if the business undertook its present legitimate operations on site, it would be creating a nuisance. This state of affairs is further considered within paragraph 434, where it is confirmed that once the housing is built, it is the responsibility of the businesses to ensure they do not create a statutory nuisance and have to put measures in place to avert such circumstances, which is not, we submit, what the terms of condition 7 of the in principle permission was seeking to establish. The proposed development does not therefore honour the specific terms of the wording uh, as what is occurring here is moving the burden of responsibility to keep the identified levels, moving that onto the businesses and not on the applicant as was required by the terms of the condition. The scenario played out between what is confirmed in paragraphs 431 and 434 together with environmental health confirmation that if perfectly normal operations occur on site which the noise survey confirms that it has not factored in there will be a significant conflict between the land uses sufficient to constitute a statutory nuisance. The whole scenario where legitimate operations of established businesses or potential uses of other adjoining industrial premises has to be restricted to a light industrial activity so as not to create a conflict with the houses is quite clearly against what was envisaged when that outline permission was granted. The Council's own ambitions for industrial estate when it promoted a non-notifiable amendment to the local development plan and an extra bullet point on your new policy OP1A relating to land use conflict is an indication that concern exists between these uses. The Council's overall objective to stimulate the economy through the provision of the right conditions and facilities for both existing commercial industrial enterprises to grow and flourish as well as to attract new businesses into the region which it wishes for all to regard as being open for business are materially compromised by the proposals to erect dwellings so close to the established industrial estate. You have 30 seconds left, David. I'd just uh, like to put up the fact that the, what level of amenity are we creating here for these houses? We're having to put in special glazing. We're having to put in 
uh, ventilation systems, and there's potential necessity not to open your windows. They can't use the front garden because of potential noise issue. There's restrictions on where they can go in the back garden. So the issue is, what sort of amenity are you going to be creating with regards to the approval of this layout? We're not objecting to houses on the wider site. It's just that ones in closest proximity to the industrial estate we feel constitute and create a material conflict in land uses, which are contrary to your established policies and those that you've sought you to reinforce David, in please. the new local development plan. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Do any members have any questions? Patsy Goroy. Yes, so we've established the, um, the fact that you know, houses uh, are perfectly all right on this area. Where would you suggest that you would need houses not to be positioned, looking at that map at the moment? Which, or do you know the plot numbers? I mean, I've, we've got plot <laughs> numbers in here which have got to have this special, um, whatever they call it, acoustic glazing and things. Mm. Are those the, are those the, the houses that you're concerned with? Or well, we haven't got numbers on those, so I'm just wondering where you're talking about. The, the fact that, you know, okay, these are attenuation measures that can help to mitigate the matter. But another mitigation matter, which is, you know, an easier one to actually operate is space and distance between the developments. And generally within the sort of planning parlance, you don't want housing right next to general industry because you will get a conflict. And there's no problems about that. You know, my concern is that if you're having to implement, um, you know, special remedial things within the properties themselves to try to make them fit, then that to me, it raises an issue about, well, really, is that appropriate in that context? So maybe all of these ones that are getting the special glazing, all these ones that are getting the ventilation system as well, are up there on the basis of maybe they're not the ones to go for. Maybe they could be deleted um, because whilst it's okay within the house and it meets the standards, within the garden area, there is potential area of, area of conflict. And that has to be regarded as part of the property and the element of the house that people are going to enjoy. You just don't want them confined to barracks, as it were, for the whole time. But in removing that element of housing, they in their own right provide some sort of acoustic barrier to the houses behind that. So it's maybe not just a case of taking a red line around all the houses that front onto the boundary of the industrial estate, because in removing them, it opens up the rear of the other houses and then you know, again, the whole assessment as to potential nuisance and impact would have to be taken on board. So it's maybe something that there's a, a wider scale reconsideration for, you know, that sort of uh, southeastern quarter as we're looking at that um, element there in its own right, in uh, the, the diagram there just now. Councillor Goroy, are you happy with that? Any other member, any questions for Mr. Fallis? Councillor Hazard? It's. I think you start off with paragraph 431 that the noise hadn't been taken into account as it states uh, in the first sentence. Under paragraph 432, we are told that since this representation has been submitted, various amendments to the scheme have been put in place. Now, that would suggest to me that the 93 decibel level has been taken into account, and what we're being told within here is that the measures put in place will, whether it's confined to barracks or not, <laughs> uh, cover the, the noise nuisance. How do you see that that won't? Because the mitigation has been put in there. With, with regards to the matters of noise, uh, as you can all gather, it's quite a specialist side of things, and I am not professing to be any sort of noise expert in the first instance. And... Whilst I'd love to answer the question, uh, Mr Hislop, I'm not going to because Mr Lawrence Haslam, who's going to speak after me, who is uh, a specialist in these matters, would be able to, uh, to resolve that matter for you. So I'm, I'm not up to now, I'm just accepting my limitations. Thanks for that, David. Any other member, any questions for Mr Fallis? In that case, sir, if you'd like to take your seat, please, Thank you. the next objector. Next object is Lawrence Haslam on behalf of Emma Maitland. You have the same five minutes, Mr Haslam, and I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go.
Yes, thank you. Um, I'm a partner in the firm of Sandy Brown Associates, um, a firm of acoustic consultants. Um, we were asked by Kelwood Engineering to advise on their behalf, one of their concerns being that the developer should take full account of the potential noise impact that the Kelwood operations could have. It is important that the developers take the ne any necessary noise mitigation measures, not that the industrial uses should be curtailed. Planning Condition 7 requires a noise assessment to be carried out using the methodology of BS4142, which is a method for determining, determining noise from industrial premises outside a sensitive building and the effect on people inside the building. The industrial noise is predicted at the nearest dwelling and the standard requires a weighting factor of 5 decibels to be added if the noise is intermittent or has distinguishable characteristics to give what is called the rating level. The rating level is then compared with the background noise level. If the rating level is 10 dB or more above the background noise, then complaints are likely. A difference of 5 dB is of marginal significance, and I believe that the Environmental Health Officer has indicated that a criterion of marginal significance would be acceptable in this case, and I'll return to that point in a moment. I've raised a number of points of concern on the revised noise impact assessment prepared by RS Acoustic Engineering Limited. Firstly, um, as has been discussed, the data used to assess noise from Kelwood does not represent the worst case. One of the noisiest items that could be used is a mobile compressor that would be located in the external yard whenever shot blasting or painting is carried out. The noise level of this compressor is 72 dBA at 4 meters when idling and 93 dBA at 4 meters when the compressor is operating under load, which can happen for significant periods. The assessment uses the value for idling noise rather than the operating noise of the compressor, which significantly underestimates the real noise in use. Secondly, a background noise of 44 dBA has been used for the assessment. But in fact, there are significant periods when the background noise is lower. For example, on the day of the assessment, between 10.30 and 11.30 a.m., the background noise was 39 dBA. And we've also measured lower background noise levels of 36 dB at 7 p.m. and 38 dB at around 8 a.m. on a Saturday, which are both times when Kelwood cop could operate. Using a more representative figure of 39 for a true background noise and recognizing that the industrial noise and in particular the compressor has distinguishable characteristics means that the target for marginal significance should be for the specific noise not to exceed 39 dBA at the nearest dwellings. This is some 10 dB lower or subjectively half as loud as the target of 49 that was used in the assessment. Uh, in order to predict the noise at the proposed dwellings uh, and taking account of the three and a half metre high barrier, we predict a noise of around 55 dBA at the nearest dwellings when the compressor is operating under load. And following the BS4142 methodology, this would indicate that complaints would be likely. The dwelling houses directly facing the industrial estate are proposed to be fitted with acoustic glazing and mechanical ventilation but it is stated in the committee report that it is not required that windows cannot open. The occupants would have the choice whether to leave the windows open or closed. Because of the nature of a, the, the way the attenuation provides bun, the bun provides attenuation, it would provide less protection to the upper floor windows of the properties. With the windows closed, we predict the sound level inside the first floor of the dwellings will be around 29 dBA with the compressor operating. Whilst this meets normal guidelines, the noise would nevertheless be clearly audible. However, if the windows are opened when the compressor is operating, the noise level inside the dwellings would be of the order of 50 to 55 dBA in the first floor rooms and 40 to 45 dBA in ground floor rooms. This would significantly exceed the acceptable standards. You have 30 seconds left, sir. Yeah, okay. In summary, in using the idling noise of the compressor rather than the operating noise, um, the worst case hasn't been considered, and in not 
using the minimum background noise level or accounting for the distinguishable characteristics, the impact is underestimated. The proposal for acoustic windows and mechanical ventilation recognises the potential noisy environment, but if windows are permitted to be openable, noise complaints are likely when the compressor or other plant is operating. In turn, that may lead to restrictions on the way Kelwood currently operate, and I urge you to take this into consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Do any members have any questions? Councillor Driver, Councillor Thompson. <coughs> Thank, thanks, Chair. I just like to come back to what you mentioned about shot blasting and, 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 and noise. Obviously, there's buffering that needs to be in place for shot blasting and, and, and actual noise as well. I mean, there's a responsibility on employers with the Noise at Work Act uh, and things like that, which of course aren't any planning issues. And you being an acoustic consultant will understand that with health and safety, of course, that we try to reduce as much impact on, on the people around about us. Now, I understand that this is a... a, a uh, position of, of new build and, and, and people are trying to do what they can to do that. But there's, there's obviously issues with regard um, timings of shot blasting and things like that. Um, are, are you suggesting that shot blasting actually takes place at night here? Um, well, as I understand it, there, there's, no, there's no restriction on that, but I think it's unlikely and, and perhaps Mr Maitland can, could, could speak to that. I, I would have thought it would be more of a daytime activity. Councillor Driver, that's fine. Uh, Councillor Stephen Thompson, then Councillor Hazlitt. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it'd be handy, I suppose, if we had a zone of theoretical audibility, um, a bit like the wind farms, but in terms of uh, the, the impact on the, the distance to the nearest house, if you like, given the worst case scenario of noise, and it's sort of been asked before with the last, with the last representative as well, um, but what impact do you see that having in terms of the rate of decay of the sound, as it were, and um, how much space would be needed given all the mitigation measures? Well, the, the difficulty with that is that the, the noise decreases with at a rate of six decibels for every doubling of distance. So I think the separation from, from the compressor to the nearest houses is currently about 50 metres. If you increase that distance to 100 metres, the noise would only reduce by another six decibels. So, so it's quite difficult to get that degree of separation. Councillor Hasler. It was sort of intimated that if there was a different design in the bottom part of the development, it might work um, by removing some of the houses. But it was also intimated earlier that by removing some of them, you actually take away some of the sound dampening. Yes. What would you have to do, actually, to achieve what you want to do? Well, that, that's difficult. The, the, the first line of houses does act as a buffer to, to the remaining houses that, that, that are behind it. So that there's some logic to that, to that layout. Um, the, well, the houses are provided with special glazing, acoustic glazing, and mechanical ventilation. And acceptable noise levels inside the houses would be achieved with, with the windows closed, um, so that could be that could be an option. But it, it it's not a sort of very good level of immunity for the for the occupants not to be able to open their windows unless they want unless they don't mind the noise, of course. Yes, Does that include opening with the back windows? I think the front looks on to the side. So no, the I think the, the, the back windows would be sufficiently shielded by the, 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 there will be another ten dB or so shielding provided by the house itself. Councillor Carruthers. Thanks, Chairman. I think the question I'd like to ask on the back of it, it was running through my mind anyways, but in your professional view, an acoustic barrier to be put between the two developments, what would it take to, to be, what would be suffice? What kind of barrier would it take in your professional view would, would need to be constructed? Forgetting about what's kind of the protected, the glass and so on and so forth, just an actual barrier that could actually would be suffice to, to keep the, the noise well, the, levels down. Yeah, the, the developer is already proposing a three and a half metre high barrier, which is quite a substantial um, construction in its own right. Increasing the barrier height, we, at, at that level, it, it's giving a, a reduction of about 12 decibels or so. Um, increasing the height is, is again a diminishing factor. I mean, you could, you could increase it, but it probably wouldn't give an awful lot more attenuation. 
Um, at best, you might only get another one or two decibels by, by increasing it. Carry on, yes. Sorry for labour on this point, Chairman, but just in regards to, do you think there's anything is achievable, something could be constructed? Because, I mean, look, there's a proposal obviously in front of us there, like saying the three and a half metre barrier, uh, bundle ticket is as well as planting and such like. But have you, have, in your professional view, have you seen other methods that might work in, 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 in another different, well, the, the, better methods, really? I mean, the, the only thing you can do is reduce the noise at source um, or impede its propagation by, by a barrier. Or, 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 by, or increase the distance of, of separation. But those are, you know, those are the options you've got. Thanks, Councillor Carlos. Any other members? In that case, thank you very much for the presentation, sir. If you care to join, take, you take your seat. We now have Jamie Maitland from Kelwood Engineering. Again, Mr. Maitland, you'll get five minutes when we commence speaking, and I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are not objecting to this plan, the pr principle of planning here. Heathall community deserves better than a brownfield site with a mass of college gen gently rotting. All I am asking of you is that you um, ensure the intentions of your predecessors when they gave that outline planning permission um, are, are reflected. Our objections are primarily about noise, but there's also, and I'll deal with it first because it's, it's very simple, is the security fence. Could I possibly have the map which I submitted? Um, the, the the security fence comes all the way along the south until the point you see marked A down the bottom. And then from A to B to C, you have a wooden fencing, which actually acts as a ladder for a determined teenager, rather than security fencing isn't security fencing if there's a gap through it or around it. And I ask you to reflect that. And I'd also ask you to reflect, again asked in the outline planning permission, that there is some form of permanent maintenance on that for the life of the development. However, the real issue for us is the noise. And you know, this is where you will potentially, and I'm asking you not to, um, provide a threat for us to expand and employ people. If you read condition seven very carefully, it is quite clear that it was inserted to protect the businesses. It was intentionally stringent. It doesn't talk about, about exceeding noise levels. It talks about the likelihoods of complaints. And it put all the onus, all the onus, on the developer to establish suitable acoustic attenuation measures. You aren't, you, I'm sure your predecessors understood what they were doing they knew that Condition 7 would involve a significant buffer zone. That was the condition they set. And I'd ask you to reflect that in your decision today. Kelwood has a track record of growth. We employ 60 people, mainly as engineering and electrical tradesmen. These are good jobs. We have people traveling from as far as the further reaches of Annandale, um, obviously, um, Nisdale, and the um, central stewardry. We also have an, an offshoot, and I'll come back to this, employing another 10 semi-skilled people up in Motherwell. That's on top of the 60. As subcontractors, everything we do is dependent on what our customers demand of us. You'll know that Johnson & Clark engineers went bust just before Christmas. We now employ eight of their staff. We operate a significant proportion of their heavier um, machinery, and it's all in Unit 8C. Now, 8C is also on the plan or up there. 8C is the most left-hand building I have marked. Um, now, none of that change in what we're doing. It happened over the course of a month. None of that is reflected in the noise plan. My point isn't that it's going to make the noise plan wrong. My point is that if we can't move rapidly, we cannot hope to expand. 
On that subject, I'd like to read very briefly from Planning Advice Note 1, 2011, Planning and Noise, in which it says quite specifically, and it's not absolutely in line, but it's talking about the same sort of issue, the likely level of noise exposure at the time of application and any increase that may re reasonably be expected in the foreseeable future are likely to be relevant. The noise assessment is what we were at when they just happened to have the machinery there. A, two years before, our volumes were hugely bigger. Um, they will go back up, and I'll come back to that too. But the, to measure us then is putting us in a straitjacket. So, you know, please think about that when we do that. You have 30 seconds left, Mr. Maitland. Right. I'm not saying that if you give this proposal planning permission, we'll close up shop. That won't happen. The problems are at the margin, and I'll give you a quick example. I've just returned from Houston, where there's a major um, customer, currently our biggest customer. They want to consolidate their suppliers. We're one of their biggest suppliers. We have a serious chance. But if I can't have the building here, and this is not a threat, it's a statement of fact, I can go to Motherwell. It's, it's at the margins that this sort of business does damage to us. We are class five. Can you come to a conclusion? Please? And the difference between class five and four is that we are not, we are too noisy to be near business, near residents. This is what you're inflicting on, inflicting on us. And my absolute last thing is to ask the question yet again, isn't it reasonable that an engineering company operating in a class five industrial estate should operate a mobile compressor under power in their own yard. The noise survey informing this report specifically denies Kelwood that right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Maitland. Does anyone have any questions for the Mr. M Councillor McKee, Councillor Gilroy? I thanks, Chair. I was just wondering is it your intention, I would think core hours will be roughly 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Are you looking to work outside these hours? Um, two years ago, we had a semi-permanent backshift. And that would have been operating from the, the two shifts overlap. So it would have been, rather than a... 16 hour day, it would have been, let us say, a 14 hour day beginning at 7.30 in the morning. So, no. Because we have taken over Johnson & Clark's business, we now offer, offer a 24-7 call-out service for other businesses in trouble. And so we are, we will be constantly, that Unit 8C, which is where that business, that part of the business is focused, will not for extended hours um, might require extended machining in that if somebody's shaft fails, it will take quite a lot of, of time to um, turn it and get it back to the right shape. Um, but you know, that's not continuous like the vast bulk of our businesses. Does that answer your question? I, su I suppose the question would be then, would any noise would be mostly contained within the, the u building unit rather than outside? Um, the, there is no doubt that operations within the building are, well, are masked. The, the main noise problem we have come from fans which are on the outside of the building. They are required for health and safety because some of the fumes coming off welding processes on particular materials are very unpleasant. Um, the majority are inside. I will be honest about Unit 8C that it's the old MTU, Motor Transport Unit building, and it has big single skin roller shutter doors, and I would think the insulation properties of that are pretty minimal. But inside a building, yes, it is better than outside a building. There would, of course, be 
the comings and goings with that sort of business. Councillor Garoy, then Councillor Carruthers. Well, I was actually going to ask about the times of, of, of working with this um, with your, with your expansion, which is very good news, I have to say. Um, I am going back to the thing I asked at the very beginning. What, what is it that you require um, of this application in order that it, you can continue to work in the manner in which you do at the moment and which your class five allows you to do so and that you would hope to continue to do so? Class five allows us to do so now, effectively giving this this planning permission would reduce us to class four. That would be the, the, the guts, the effect of it. Um, it. Not, I'm sure if I look at the planning officers here, they would say that's not the case, but the effect would be that. What do we want? We, I, you know, I, I am, I am, <laughs> you should have asked, asked Lawrence at what level that would be and you did and, and he sort of passed some of that back to me. Um, I would suggest that the, the first two rows of houses in front of us should be a, an open space providing a football field, providing something more for the community um, than, than a bund. You know, as far as I am concerned, that bund will end up as a, well, not very pretty from, the, from our backside, as you've already seen in the pictures, but will end up as a collection of plastic bags hanging in trees, which is not what I don't think any of the people there want. Councillor Goodway, you want to come yes, back? Yes, but just to clarify, when you get down, if you find yourself reduced to class four, is that a restriction on noise or a restriction on operation times or type of operation? I, I say that based on a document I've been recently sent because um, you will also see there is a proposed building uh, on the plan behind me, in front of me. And to do that, we were specifically asked whether it was class five or class four. And the difference is made very clear, but it's in a negative manner. So you've got to bear with me here. Um, in defining class four, it says, being a use which can be carried on in any residential area without detriment to the amenity of that area by reason of noise, vibration, smells, fumes, smoke, soot, ash, dust, or grit. Um, so it is simply because of that that I say we would be reduced to it, because the... What is going to happen here is people will complain. They will open their windows. We will be in it. Although we will be meeting our own planning duties, there it, it moves out of planning and into statutory nuisance. I think Richard Proctor referred to that earlier on. Um, and statutory nuisance will... In, it is then a machine, the EHO have to proceed along the lines in the manner they are, and we would probably be breaking, breaking not the planning rules, those rules. I've got Ian Carruthers and Peter Diggle. It's, it's a, it is a similar question in regards to, you've currently got class five use, uh, industrial use. What restrictions does that place on your op operational hours as it stands? And if this, if in, in your words, you've touched on it already, but in, in, in your words, if this permission was to be granted as is today, what effect do you think that will have on retaining and maintaining your business as it stands as well? We, so I'm not, I'm not absolutely certain I picked up that question correctly. We have absolutely no restriction on our operational hours at all. We don't have any restriction, as I understand it, on the noise we make until it gets to being a statutory nuisance. And the extent of the buffer zone at the moment is more than enough for that purpose. And I'm, you know, I'm not asking for that extent of the buffer zone to be made. I'm actually saying to the planning organization in this region, that we need to do something with that field, with that, that area. We do not want it just a mess in the middle of, of or on the edge of Heathall. 
Thanks, Ian. Hey, Peter Deggle. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, would you re consider relocating if you could gain um, agreement with Story Homes? Because presumably their houses would be more saleable if you weren't there. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I'm in business. I'm buyable. But I suspect the price is... is <laughs> Story Homes are not going to be, be offering me the money to which would cover the cost. And particularly, and you know, as as I understand um, this, you know, the, the the cost of this site to them is not that expensive. If you're talking commercial, I think it it is not practical because this this site was had to be had to be sold in a hurry because the Outline Planning Commission ran out very rapidly, and I don't believe the price is very significant, and so that will put the price which we would talk about for us out. Of, you know, the cost of moving 20 major machines is, is it's, it's huge. Cost of a new building, you know, you, you think of a building, but then there are the overhead cranes in them. You know, that, that adds another, whatever it may be. Thanks, I'm open Kirsten. to offers if you can persuade them. But. Thanks, Councillor Diggle. Anyone else have any questions for Mr. Maitland? In that case, sir, if you turn to your seat, thank you very much. Thank you. Next objector is Gordon Mann. Again, Gordon, you'll have five minutes, and I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go. Thank you very much, Chairman. I'm here on behalf of Dumfries and Galloway Chamber of, of Commerce. Um, Catherine Field Industrial Estate was developed originally by the Council as an area to create employment for the town, and it succeeded. Um, turning a redundant airfield into an important employment area, I think, is to the Council's credit. Um, we have its home now to several significant businesses, including Brown Brothers uh, and Kelwood. Both are businesses that have not just survived the longest and deepest recession in living memory, but they're growing. Brown Brothers is expanding and recruiting and Kelwood has recently been identified as the fastest growing small business in our region. Indeed, it's number eight in terms of the whole of Scotland. So I think that gives an indication of the quality of the businesses that we're looking at here. And I think it's also in no small measure due to the fact that the council used redundant buildings that provided cost-effective space in a relatively unrestricted uh, context because of the, the distance to uh, the housing areas. Now, why is it important that we try and protect and encourage these businesses to grow? Well, we have one really unenviable record in this region. We have one of the smallest private sectors in any part of any regional economy in, in Scotland, and that's a record that many of us would like to see changed, and I believe that these are the kinds of businesses that will help change that. So what we've got here is what is effectively a windfall site created by the relocation of the college, uh, it's, it's providing extra housing for, to meet the housing need, um, but if it's not developed properly, it has the ability to create potential problems down the line. Now, you have before you a very detailed and complex report. And what I want to do is simply concentrate on one aspect, and, and that is noise, and that is the potential conflict that we see that could, could arise between the new houses and an existing and thriving industrial estate. Uh, as been in indicated earlier, the planning permission in principle has a condition, and I'll read out a section of it because it is important. It says, should the likelihood of noise complaints be identified as part of the noise assessment, then suitable acoustic attenuation measures required to be identified and form part of that application. It said such likelihood of noise complaints. Not valid, not reasonable, but just noise complaints. So the bar was set very high, and I believe very deliberately, to, to, to protect, uh, uh, to avoid conflict between the two uses. The question, therefore, that's facing you today is, has that condition been met? And it's our contention it hasn't, and we believe this could potentially have serious consequences down the line. Now, what's now being proposed, and it's interesting, the changes that the applicants made because of this, is to remove three houses that were right on the boundary, slight reorientation of some, and the row of plots which are marked with the red and blue dots have, have been slightly 
um, um, some of them have been reorientated, but those are the ones that will be fitted with heavy acoustic double glazing and mechanical ventilation. Uh, and it's that role that I think we need to concentrate on. Um, the environment, your own environmental health officer has indicated that without this extra double glazing and mechanical ventilation and without the introduction of the bund, uh, um, that, that, that it, there would be complaint, there would be grounds for a complaint. And it's also been pointed out that the noise calculations deal with averages. And of course, that means you have louder noises and quieter noises. Therefore, when you're looking at that, you need to remember that for some people, short bursts of loud noise may actually be quite unacceptable and lead to complaint. Now, once the developer has built this development, and as long as he does, if you grant consent and he builds it exactly as the per, the, per the, the consent, then he moves on. The condition has been complied with and has no more effect. Um, there's no requirement for the development to actually achieve a specific level of noise reduction. What he has to do is build a bund and put um, heavy glazing in the, in the windows. So what happens if the calculations are not right? What happens if the noise attenuation isn't the amount that's been, been suggested? It's then left to the occupiers of the house to decide if they want to live with not being able to sleep with open windows on what should be a quiet suburban housing estate. You if they don't, left, Gordon. then there will be times when um, uh, noise and so on justifies a complaint. The redress will be to object and to lift it as a, as a uh, statutory nuisance. So that leaves the businesses with uncertainty, and uncertainty undoubtedly will, will kill off the prospect of future investment. It's our suggestion that what should be done is that the houses with the dots on them should not be built at this stage and, and the developer can carry on, build the bund. You can then measure the amount of noise, attenuation that's been achieved and the developer at that stage could come back and build those houses if the attenuation has been successful. That would be the safe way to deal with this. It would avoid creating an unnecessary uh, uncertainty in, in, the, in the minds of the businesses in that area. Thank you. Thanks for that, Gordon. Anyone have Councillor McCaughrey? So, th th thanks very much, uh, Gordon. I mean, I <coughs> appreciate part of your current job. You're a former Director of Planning for uh, this authority's predecessor, so you know a fair bit with the planning side. Would you suggest, perhaps, that uh, we maybe make this a phased development, or suggest the developer makes it a phased development, in that they could develop uh, so much, and the bits you're suggesting we take out could be a second phase? I, Is that... I I, that, that's what I would, I would suggest. The land's not going to go away. The, 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 there will be a potential to come back and build those buildings, but it provides the developer with a real incentive to make sure that the bunding, the landscaping and so on, does actually achieve the noise attenuation. It, it gives him an incentive to do it right. If he does it right, he gets more houses. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor McCaughrey. Any other me members? Uh, Councillor Hislop? By not building the plots you're saying, we've already heard that it would mean that the noise would go further mm. back, so where do we stop? That's the problem I have, if we're looking at. I have sympathies with your views, but when, when would you suggest that we stop? The, 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 there is the, the point that those houses are pr potentially providing some kind of noise attenuation for the houses behind it. Um, I think someone needs to do some more calculations to see what would happen. But to be honest, to be building a housing scheme where we are relying on houses to protect other houses from noise doesn't seem to be a very clever thing to do. But presumably, uh, the, the acoustic glazing could be put in the backs of the houses that, that uh, are, are uh, opposite, you know, opposite that row that's being looked at. Um, there must be ways of doing it. We also heard double the distance reduces the noise level by six decibels doesn't sound much, but remember decibels are measured on a logarithmic scale. So six is more than halving the amount of noise. So it's a very substantial reduction. Thanks, Councillor Haslop. Any other members? In that case, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Man. You can return to your seat. We now have a Rachel Lightfoot on behalf of the, the agent, or she is the agent. Rachel, you'll have the same five minutes, and I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go. Uh, 
sorry, not very uh, <coughs> literate when it comes to technology. Good afternoon, councillors. I am a town planning consultant acting on behalf of Story Homes. As you're aware, Story Homes has a strong reputation for the delivery of quality homes in the Dumfries area, particularly at the moment at the award-winning Marchfield development, which is continuing to deliver quality family housing and has continued to do so throughout the recent difficult economic times. The Heath Hall campus redevelopment site is ideally placed adjacent to employment opportunities as well as the community facilities such as the immediately adjacent primary school and the nearby neighbourhood shops. However, these sites which are fantastically sustainable for housing do come with issues of tensions which arise between employment and housing, particularly in this instance in regards to the noise. The issue of noise protection has been given a great deal of attention by Story Homes and your environmental health officers. <clears throat> Story Homes employed noise consultants to undertake relevant noise surveys in line with all British standards and also in liaison with the council's environmental health officer. Um, just uh, to bring to your attention, um, when we've been talking about what we've assumed as the worst case, um, the noise report to ensure a robust assessment was undertaken, assumed that all three extraction fans, the guillotine, the mobile compressor, skip truck and forklift truck, we're all operating concurrently within a 60 minute daytime period in order to give us a worst case scenario. I'd also like to draw to your attention that on the opposite side of the um, industrial estate, which is just not shown um, to the south of the plan there, there are houses, sorry. <clears throat> there's housing which directly backs onto the industrial estate with no noise mitigation measures in place whatsoever. I don't think you had a photo of it. just on the other side of that big second hangar there. Housing backs up directly to that at the moment. The monitoring, and we had six monitoring points from along the Kelwood engineering um, boundary, was carried out and resulted in the mitigation proposals which have been embedded into the application before you. Also, just like to point out that if noise is or was at such a level that it would be considered a statutory nuisance, this would be a statutory nuisance whether the housing were there or not and could be reported by anybody using that site at the moment. It would also probably affect Heath Hall Primary School, which is just to the bottom of the picture. As a recap, the proposals include an earth bun 3.5 metres high along the boundary of the industrial estate, we didn't have a noise fence and a lower bund so that the noise fence didn't require um, maintenance and the bund would be there forever. The noise report further requested that glazing in units facing the industrial estate should achieve 27 to 28 dB RW plus CTR. In order to provide additional protection for those units, Story Homes have confer confirmed that Pilkington Optifon glass will be installed in windows facing the industrial estate which will achieve 33 dB, which is in excess of that required. This is, has resulted in the Environmental Health Officer confirming there are no objections to the scheme. We fully understand the concerns which have been reported today. However, extensive surveys and monitoring has been carried out using times and length of monitoring agreed with Environmental Health. The mitigation measures which have been put in place achieve in excess of the mitigation required in the report in, reg in regards to glazing performance and we firmly believe that the proposals before you are adequate to safeguard future homeowners and provide protection to existing businesses. You have the other second remaining. Thank you. This is being confirmed by the no objection to the scheme. Turning to other matters very quickly, the scheme has been subject to consultation with officers since prior to commission uh, submission, sorry, as well as during the 12 months it's been with the Council. Together, we have strived, along with your officers, to ensure that the scheme reflects the values of designing streets, resulting in a scheme which is pleasant to live in, provides spaces for children to play, adults to meet, and overall, a development which will build on the award-winning housing story homes are already delivering Dumfries. The application has been subject to much contemplation by consultees to ensure the proposed housing layout and mitigation measures are appropriate. Ensuring the development before you will be a positive addition to the immediate and wider area. I hope you can support the recommendations of your officers. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Any members have any questions? Hey, Councillor Hazlitt. What would the situation be? Would you be here today complaining if it was the other way around? You had your planning permission in place and the objector was planning to put in something that was causing a noise at 93 dBA. Would you be happy with the attenuation? We actually, uh, the story yard in uh, Carlisle, the main story, is a 24-hour working rail depot and has a um, industrial unit beside it which does um, iron work, pipe grinding, etc. And we are immediately adjacent to housing and it is right on our boundary. Um, the houses, housing did put some complaints in um, recently. Um, in order, when we dealt with that, we put a 2.5 noise attenuation fence in, and also as a responsible employer and business within the area, we looked at our use of the yard in order to mitigate our own impacts. So when we were using lorries or could we load them at different times of the day in order to lessen any impact on housing. We do realise that it is a reciprocal arrangement between both the housing and the business use on its boundary. So we have had that. Thanks, Councillor Dreiber. Can I just take it away from noise for a minute? We mentioned earlier on about the parking with visitors Can. parking. And, uh, have you been in discussions about how we can uh, mitigate that, that, that side of things? Uh, we've had a lot of discussions with highways over parking because designing streets and hi there, there is some um, differences of opinion between designing streets and the council's highways engineers. Um, what we've done is try to provide on-street visitor parking, which is marked out and... Um, could you just flip there? So you'll see there's laybys at various places which uh, would be down with the, as visitor parking. Um, what we also went through with highways was we can provide all that visitor parking, but what we didn't want to do was be putting big wide roads in um, and or putting a, a road in and then just a row of visitor parking which made the road wider. So um, we also went through with highways all the opportunities for people to actually park on the road as visitor parking as well. And we've made sure that every house does accord with the council standards in terms of parking. So there should be ample there for visitor and residents. Thanks, Councillor Driver. Any other members? Councillor Crothers? I mean, you've, you've, you've already touched on it, but the question has to be asked in, in regards to giving yourself a chance to come back. Do you feel that the, the mitigation measures you've put in place are adequate to protect both your, the, the people who are living in these dwellings and as well as, I mean, both have to be parties, have to be protected, both yourselves and and the actual business itself? They do, and, and there's, there's really no value in Story Homes providing housing which is going to be subject to a lot of customer complaints over the next 10 years while Story Homes retain their interest. Our noise consultant was tasked with providing mitigation which fully mitigated. It doesn't do... Stories at the minute get very few customer complaints and if there were to be a spike in those customer complaints because of noise, we have sites which are immediately adjacent um, railway lines with similar noise issues as the trains go past. Um, I know we've been talking about not using that and not putting any mit mitigation in, but every site usually has to provide mitigation on something, whether it be wildlife that's using the site or noise that's there. It's very rare that you get a site that doesn't mitigate itself in some physical way. So, yeah. Thanks, Councillor Crothers. Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Chair. It's just a quick one. I appreciate there's um, been a lot of work done in, on mitigating in terms of uh, the type of glazing and what have you. And I'd imagine that part of the attractiveness of, of some of the homes is not so much that you're an occupant within the house, but also there's the amenity of having a garden and what have you as well. Um, and uh, I'm just thinking that I'd imagine some of them would be sort of family homes. Yep. So I'm just, I suppose really, is there a mitigation also um, for the gardens to maybe reduce 
noise to a, a lower level so that children would would be happy enough outside as all, well as inside. Yeah. All the rear gardens meet the World Health, Health Organization requirements for noise in rear gardens so that they can use those gardens so that you're not having ear defenders on while you're on your trampoline. But they all meet the, they're all usable, all rear gardens. And just, sorry, just to pick up, um, somebody was asking about the affordable housing. Um, that is uh, to be provided, Story Homes effectively provide a 25% equity loan uh, free of interest to a homeowner, much in the way as the, I think it's my homes initiative that the Scottish Government have done, but without any government money. So it's funded by the developer and there's no need for grant or government money. Thanks, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Carruthers? Thanks very much for, for remembering that. And just in regards to that, the 20% affordable housing, was that on top of the 25% or was that inclu in, inclusive? It's 20%. 20% affordable housing and then there's 25% like shared equity, is that on top of no, it? No, it's all, part it's of? all yeah. Right, okay, that thanks. was um, what was agreed was the biggest need in Dumfries when we spoke to Jim. Okay, members, that is fine. In that case, I'd like to, you'd like to return to your seat. Thank, Thank you very you. much. We're now in session and before we get into the debate, we're, debate, we're not here to redesign the application. If we're not satisfied, we'll have to reject it and, and de delegate to officers to deal with it. Councillor McCochrane. That's, that's the question I was going to ask. <clears throat> I mean, the point was made by Gordon Mann about phasing the uh, development. Could we, as a planning authority, suggest it be phased on the current plans? We have an application before us to determine, and we don't have... Yes, but what I'm saying is we, 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 can, we can approve the application subject to conditions, and one of the conditions could be that the house is outlined in Gordon Mann's uh, submission be not built until after we can do an extenuation test once the bond is in place to determine whether we want the next phase to go ahead. Is that possible? David. Uh, Members will note on page 82, condition 2, that's recommended, does actually require a, a detailed phasing scheme to be submitted. Quite how reasonable it would be to actually say that you can't build X amount of houses, um, I don't... I would have to think about that one, to be honest. Uh, I've never heard of a condition that says that you, notwithstanding the fact that you've got planning permission for 207 houses, you can't build this these houses in less than until we're satisfied there's not going to be a problem. That, I think, would be an unreasonable condition and could be quite successfully challenged. But certainly there is the scope within Condition 2 to have phasing within the 207 houses and how that would work. So that there is some scope to actually look at how you could actually phase the 207 houses, but I don't think you could reasonably say you're getting 190 and we'll... we'll reserve judgment until uh, a later time for the other ones. David, it, it, it doesn't say, though, su subject to members being satisfied at the, at the outcome or attenuation or, or further study, or whatever, it just says it's a phased approach, and I don't think we're in a position to, to refuse, if you like, something that we're going to approve today on the basis that we've received objections about the level of noise, etc. Yes, and as you preface that uh, comment earlier, you have an application before you. It's specifically 207 houses with this layout. Obviously, there have been a number of changes to that scheme to get it to this level that officers of the Council from both planning and environmental standards feel comfortable to be able to recommend approval. However, the decision rests with members, and if you are concerned about the, the actual layout or the number of houses or any other factors, then whilst you can't re-examine the principle of the development on the site, you, it is wholly open to you to say this scheme here we think is unacceptable for whatever reason. Yeah. Any other members? Councillor Carruthers? Councillor Gilroy? Thanks, Chairman. I, think, uh, I don't think I would agree with the phasing side of it. I think if, if we're looking at something like that, we'd better to refuse and give clear direction why we're refusing it, if it is in particular for the 14 units along the front shouldn't be developed, then that would have to be an application to come back then if it leaves the applicant 
to either appeal or come back with a new submission, and they've got clear direction in regards to that. But I think if I, if I've ever seen a, a an application that needs a site visited by this one, and I, I mean I think we should should consider that. There's a lot of stuff here we've seen. We pointed out it's been well presented. I have to I think to be fair, I have to say that. But uh, to get a clear understanding of what the the site layout is, I think we should have a, a an actual site visit. Don't think a site visit would particularly deal with noise and, and how we would, as individuals, assess noise because everybody's a, a sense, if you like, of noise may well differ. Councillor Gilroy and then Councillor McKee. Yes, um, well, this is this is quite difficult, this one, but I think, you know, I know we're bound by um, uh, policies and everything else with um, planning on, on a very large degree, but there has to be an element of common sense that creeps in every now and then. And I think we're in danger here of if we agree the recommendations the way it is, the way they are at the moment and setting up something to fail in the future because I think there's going to be a conflict. You can't, um, because they will have to incorporate acoustic glazing and mechani mechanised ventilation and the repositioning of the houses so the gardens face in a different way, in my mind would seem to, to suggest that there is a problem of noise and the people living in those houses are going to be affected by it. And in the report here, it says on page 81, that once the houses are built, it falls on the businesses to be responsible for providing suitable attenuation. And I don't think that's entirely fair. Uh, and the only way that could be done, presumably, uh, if, if Mr. Maitland um, led me in the right direction, was but that the their operations would have to be downscaled and downgraded. And I don't think that's what this council should be um, setting ourselves up to agree to, I would have to say. Uh, and when we did have our, L, our, our draft LDP in front of us at full council uh, at the end, towards the end of last year, it did state there under GPO one, OP1A that we should look at general amenities and the effect they have on health and well-being. And doing that, we must have consideration to land use conflict. And that was because this scenario was brought to the attention of the council. And I think we should bear that in mind. Um, condition seven is there to protect businesses. And so um, they need to have a sufficient buffer zone for this development to go on. And I think what is suggested in this design is not sufficient for the houses that are from, what are they, 101 to 120, I would suggest. Other places it says 96 to um, 114, so I'm not quite sure. And I just, I think the way this stands at the moment, we're just setting up a, a system to fail, and I think as a planning authority, we would be, it, it would be a bad way to go forward, and I would suggest that we should reject this um, application on layout and noise assessment and that they should come back with a future application which takes account of the fact of all the things that have come forward with the buns and the distance we need between an industrial state which let's face it Dumfries and Galloway you know we always say Alistair Geddes, Councillor Geddes always says you know it's open for business well actually if we do this and we drive a business away or it has to reduce what it can do, we're not really doing our job very well, and I wouldn't be very proud of that. So I would suggest that we reject this. If we can't do it in a phase, I would have been very happy to have done it in a phased one, been able to assess whether those houses should be built or not. But if we can't do that, I don't think we can go ahead with the application that's in front of us. I understand it's planning in principle. I have absolutely no problem with that at all. I just think the design that's put in front of us and the layout is not appropriate. Yeah. Chair, there's a procedural issue here. There's been a call for a site visit, and that takes precedent over anything at the moment. So do we have a site visit or not? And then they, then determine it. We would have come to that, because members are entitled to a review. We'll, we'll, we'll then come to a site visit, because we are in session, and the session will be concluded, or, or it will commence again after a site visit, if that's agreed. And there were two members that have already indicated b b before the proposal for the site visit came up. I think as well, a, 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 there is an acknowledgement that there will be noise, and everybody knows that, no matter where you live, that, that, that there's an element of noise. So that's something that can be dealt with as well. I've got uh, Councillor McKee, Councillor Geddes, and Councillor Driver in that order. 
Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I've got concerns about the noise on 433. You're talking about the, the future. This is an un unknown entity, and it would be unreasonable to require applica the applicant to take account of the potential for a future increase in noise. And what, what they're also saying is that it's, it's up to the people that's making the noise for them to sort it out. And you could be putting a, a, a load on, on them, if you like, <coughs> that's unreasonable. And that, that gives me cause for concern. But could I just ask you, with regards to recommendation two, no development shall take place unless a detailed phasing scheme, and this scheme shall include the phasing construction of roads, suds features, dwellings, landscaping, fencing, and play areas. So does that not cover what, what we were talking about earlier on, about the, the phasing of the building? Yes, but what Councillor McCarthy was suggesting is that maybe after phase one and two is completed, if we weren't as satisfied with noise, etc., well, wouldn't you allow phase three to be concluded? And that that's no what can happen in this process. What we're saying is we'll allow 207 to be built, and there'll be a phased development to get to 207, which is why Councillor Goroy is suggesting that she feels she may be more satisfied refusing it and inviting another application to be brought forward. And that will deal with, as well as the proposal for the site visit, when the members have the opportunity to take their views. But that's the, 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 the subtle difference, Councillor McKee. Uh, Councillor Geddes. Thanks very much indeed, Chair. Uh, it's a challenging application to deal with, but, well, you know, challenges are there to be overcome, uh, as far as I'm concerned. On the one hand, uh, we've got a proposal brought before us today. Uh, looking at it, I'm sure most people will say, well, that's pretty intensive development uh, of a site. Understandably so, uh, story homes are entitled, you know, to get the, the best value uh, that po they possibly can for the return. Uh, and presumably that's, that, that, that's the reason that it is, you know, the, the proposals are, to my mind at least, uh, in such an intensive form. Uh, equally, and I go back to the comments that Councillor Gilroy has made, uh, we've got the other side of the equation because we have, in fact, the, uh, the, the, the adjoining uh, industrial estate, for want of a better term. Uh, I'm glad that she reminded me of, of comments that I've made, and I think we've all subscribed to them uh, on more than one occasion. We, we talk, in fact, about the necessity, the absolute necessity, uh, Chair, uh, of creating the, the culture, the climate, the conditions to allow businesses in Dumfries and Galloway to get established, to flourish, uh, as it were, and to develop. And here's a classic case in point, because I have very real concerns that at this moment in time that, you know, if we don't handle this in the way in which we should be handling it, we could prejudice uh, very definitely the future development and the future benefit, as it were, of the adjoining industrial estate. Uh, and I was particularly gratified to hear Gordon Mann uh, give us some statistical information uh, about how uh, certain of the occupants of that estate, how well they're doing, uh, and how well, uh, not only in a, a Dumfries and Galloway League table, but also in the National League table. And I think in these circumstances, and I don't think if it's going to be, if it's helpful to you to say at this moment in time, I don't think, quite frankly, we need a site visit I think we've got, you know, all the information before us today to allow us to come to a decision today. Uh, and if it helps you at the appropriate time, I will move accordingly. Uh, but at the, at the end of the day, I, I, I think that what we've really got to look at, and I appreciate that David is not entirely sure as to whether or not the attempt to put a condition in to this application today would be, would be competent or legitimate. But to me, it's the sensible, pragmatic way if we're going to determine this application today, it's a simple, pragmatic way of dealing with it. Because on the one hand, as I've said, Chair, I don't want story homes to feel, in fact, that, that they're not particularly welcome here and that we don't want this housing development. We need it. We particularly need the affordable component of it. Uh, and that's, that's got to be taken forward, as far as I'm concerned, uh, in, in a reasonable fashion. Equally, I, I would not be prepared to countenance a situation where, in fact, we see the occupants of the industrial estate have their future prejudiced. And, and, and I would, I would hope that, you know, with a bit further, a bit more further discussion and a bit perhaps of teasing it out, that we could come to the conclusion that Gordon Mann's pragmatic suggestion could in fact be regarded, uh, as it were, as a sustainable condition. And if we take that decision and we put it in, we'll either be proven right or proven wrong on the assumption that, you know, the, uh, the, the applicant, if they don't like it, will go to appeal. But that, that, that to me would be a chance, you know, that I would be prepared to take on the back of what Tom has already said. Thanks for that, Councillor Geddes. Councillor Driver, you used to want to come back in again? 
Yeah, th thanks, Jared. And, and Alistair, basically said many things. I mean, I, I mentioned the, the the issue of process earlier. I wasn't saying I was going to support it or or, or you know not in, in that particular case. I think he's absolutely right that we need to make sure that whatever happens on that particular site doesn't come back and and bite us uh, at the end of the day. Um, I don't I don't think we need a a, a site visit. Um, I think we have, we have to sort of look at what what conditions we can put in place for this. To go ahead, and I, I would certainly agree with Alistair that the, the information given by, by Mr. Mann has has been helpful. Um, so, looking at the actual conditions, I think I think we certainly need to, to sort of base down on, on what those those conditions are, uh, because we don't, as, as Alistair says, want to scare story away from this as well. Because the potential is that looking at the the, the, the future is it can go one way or the other, and we need to be sort of. Um, very determined in how we put the conditions in place and make sure that, that those go forward. So, uh, I, I, I want to determine this today, but I want to make sure the conditions are right that we can go forward now. Thanks for that, Councillor Driver. Councillor Dick? Yeah, I, I'm equally convinced we don't need a site visit uh, for this because largely we're talking about uh, a noise issue. Um, uh, I wouldn't have any problem of rejection on the basis of, a, of, a, of a, the proposal returning on a phased approach as has been discussed and, and put forward by uh, by Mr Mann. There's one element of caution. I asked before, what exactly are we talking about in terms of noise here? It's a compressor that works on average, according to the papers, of 11 hours per week on the other side of the building and a developer who's come back and suggests noise mitigation. Um, which seemed to me, from what's, the, uh, what's described, uh, to be a reasonable amount. So all I'm actually saying is that um, I think we just need to keep this in a little bit of context. We're not talking about massive amounts of noise from a huge industrial estate. Um, and I just, before we make any decision about rejecting it, I think we really need to consider this. Uh, what is the extent of the noise that would make us reject this on the basis of uh, hoping the developer comes back with a, a further proposal on a phased basis. Thanks for that. And, and whilst Mr Mann made a suggestion, it can it be a proposal from Mr Mann? It has to come from a member of the committee. Uh, Councillor Carruthers. Thanks, Chairman. I'm happy not to have a, uh, an actual site visit, but I do believe that the suggestion that I made forward, the only way forward if we want to, because I agree with, with the sentiments what people are, are actually, the council members from the table are saying, and I think the only way forward is to actually refuse it, but give clear direction. Uh, I don't see how we condition it to phase it in such, such a way. It has a class 5 use. You could fire up half a dozen compressors along the, the perimeter of the fence, fire them 24-7. That's its use. That's why I asked the question. It was made absolutely clear. It's not what it does do. It's what it's potentially, potentially going to do. And if we were to go to encourage businesses to grow, then we need to think of that. It might well become far, uh, far more noisy than what's actually there. So from my, my side, we, we were clearly... Clearly indicated is, I think, that Condition 7 has not actually been met, and for those reasons, we could refuse it on those grounds and give clear direction that the 14 units at the front would alleviate concerns. Certainly, from my, from my point of view, the 14 units, as we spoke about earlier, if they were removed, certainly on this basis, at, at this instance, it came back without them, and then through time, if the acoustic barrier w was developed in such a way that it clear it could be measured at that point when, when it's the maximum noise levels were there, then at that point, they could put in a further application, get the further 40 units, if there was proper protection put in place. So I'd be more inclined to, to go down that direction, Chairman. I think that the safest route would be to refuse the application. If that's what members want to do, I, and refer to officers to deal with the applicant I, I, and try and negotiate a position. Given that you initially suggested a site visit, are you still satisfied you have enough information to determine this application today? Because we haven't decided yet, we're still in, in session. But if you're happy, I know I did the head's fine, I'm happy to accept that. that you. That's great. I mean, Councillor Driver's right. It should take, procedurally, it should be determined first, but I'm happy to withdraw that, okay. Chairman. Good, thank you. Hey, Councillor Hazlitt. Chair, I think any development where you're having to go to the extent of actually putting in soundproof windows, etc., and not being able to open your house, is a clear conflict with the development next door to it. Um, I think it's not a wise procedure to go ahead with it. I would be moving refusal of it. And I also think the fact that when you, in our 
load as a councillor, we get people who complain about somebody just walking upstairs to have 93 decibels from a uh, compressor next door to you. I think we're just encouraging uh, land use conflict. And I would actually move refusal of this uh, development on the grounds that it is a land use conflict with the adjacent industrial estate. Well, two more speakers, then we'll maybe come to a, 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 a conclusion. I think Councillor Garoy firstly said she would propose, but I mean, I'm happy whoever makes a proposal, if a proposal has to come forward at some stage. Councillor McCaughtry, then Councillor Geddes. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to go on with the suggestion made by Councillor uh, Galroy. I mean, I, I think industry in that area is to be commended. This is nimbyism in a kind of inverted way. Usually it's uh, somebody living in houses who objects to somebody coming along and putting any kind of non-housing plant in there. I think it's very commendable that the uh, local industry has seen that uh, people could suffer. I mean, it's all story, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. In similar cases nearby, in that very same estate, I can recall when Sutherland Way was built, uh, folk bought their houses there. Now, you know, Uniroyal at that time operating 24 hours a day, and as soon as folk moved in, were complaining about the noise, the smell, etc. You know, and it always amazes me that folk actually go and buy houses right next to industrial units. Probably because they're a wee bit cheaper, and they think that uh, they can use the law to get their own, uh, their own way at the end of the day. But the one point I would make about noise, having stayed uh, near to a railway line, through the day with all the other background chatter that's going on in your daily life, you very seldom hear a train or, or, or notice it's there. But at night time, when all the background chatter is away, particularly after midnight, a sudden sound like a train seems ten times louder than it actually is. And it's the same with any of these industrial units. Through the day, a lot of that noise would not be noticed because it fits in with traffic going by everything else. If it so happens that somebody's got to operate their business because you have extra orders, and something happens at ten o'clock at night, that noise becomes much, much louder. Than it. it doesn't become much louder. It just seems to affect people much more. So I, I, I'm not so much interested in the number of decibels. It wouldn't matter what the decibels are. Because the noise is out with its normal context, people would probably notice it more and complain in any case, even if it was within acceptable limits. So I'm happy to go along with the suggestion made by Councillor uh, Galroy. Thanks, Councillor McCarthy. Last word to Councillor Geddes, and then we'll come to a conclusion in this uh, particular application. Very grateful to you, Chair, as always. You know, I, I have concerns, as it were, about, you know, going down the route of saying no, refusing the application that's been submitted today, because, you know, what sort of message does that send to Story Homes? What sort of message does that send to other uh, potential future housing developers in, in relation uh, in a Dumfries context? Dumfries is the regional capital. At the end of the day, there is a great demand for housing in Dumfries. This scheme, if it goes ahead, will finish up with a, a, an affordable component of, um, of, of 40 units. That's not to be sneezed at. We should be looking at it and endeavouring, in fact, you know, to, 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 to assist the, the applicant in working that through. Equally, as I've said, I don't want to see the, uh, you know, the, the occupiers of the, the uh, adjoining industrial estate prejudiced in any way in relation to their future development and future operation. It seems to me, if it's competent, you know, and I'm really looking at Mr. Sutty through yourself, sir, if it's competent, there's a lot of sense, eminent good sense and pragmatism in the suggestion of endeavouring to grant the application today on a phased basis, which would, in fact, require the developers to not to, 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 to build that particular strip of houses until such time as they have built the bund and we take further attenuation tests and further, 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 further noise, noise, et cetera, tests to, you know, to, to see, you know, with, with much better evidence whether or not, in fact, that's, that, that's doable and it's achievable. And in that way, we have a win, win situation as far as I'm concerned. So if that is competent, uh, to 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 uh, to do, I will move as an amendment. In fact, that we endeavour to get down that route. Invitation is open to you, David. Could almost do with five minutes to speak to Paula on this one, but immediate reaction is with the greatest respect to uh, Gordon on this one. I don't agree. I don't think that we could attach a condition which potentially will delete a number of houses because the what if is what if it proves to be unacceptable and you've then granted permission for houses which you're then saying by condition that you can't build. I, I really don't think that's a competent condition. I would be most uncomfortable with it. What I would say is that if um, members don't like the scheme that you see before you today, I would suggest that what you're probably looking at is refusal on the grounds that the specific layout 
a number of units proposed would be likely to result in an unacceptable level of amenity to the houses and a potential threat to um, the legitimate operation of the industrial state. And that's, that's the land use conflict bit that we, we heard before. I would be far more, uh, I think, well, Story will obviously have heard the, the comments that are being made today and the fact that there is general support, including from the, the main objector, to the principle of residential development on the majority of that site. The, the area with the red dots in it appears to be the, the really area of contention, but that is the application that's before you today. So certainly my recommendation would be if you're unhappy, you've heard what Richard said, what I've said, if you're still unhappy with it, then really you should be using the option of refusing it and story can then go away and come back with a scheme which will further address the concerns that you've articulated today. Councillor Geddes. Well, I did ask through you, sir, uh, for, for, for Mr Sutty's advice. I've received it. I'm grateful to him for giving it. I will accept it, albeit somewhat grudgingly. <laughs> Thank you. So, the suggestion seems to be that we refuse this application on the grounds that uh, the layout uh, is not found to be acceptable. Are there any alternative views to that suggestion? Or are the committee unanimous in the intention to refuse and hope the developer comes back, developer comes back with a more acceptable layout? Okay. Councillor Garoy, followed uh, um, by uh, Councillor it, it is the layout, but it's the layout pertaining to land use conflict. It's not the layout on anything else. It's the land use conflict that is the problem. Um, everything else, I mean, the layout... I have no problem with it the way it's up there. Yeah, that's, we'll, that's we'll, the get, a, we'll get a summary that, 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 will, that will satisfy members, I'm sure. Yeah, I don't think we need to get into debate again. But Councillor Carruthers, Councillor Wetz. Similar point, I mean, I've got a very, very similar point in regards to a point out it's Condition 7 in particular, being unsatisfied with con contradicting advice from a, an expert we had a, as, as, a, as a witness, you could say, somebody who's, who presented to us, and we've also got Richard Ocell. So there's contradicting advice there, and that's. And that's a lot to do with where I've, I've certainly come to my, my conclusion. Okay, thanks for that, Councillor Webb. In the spirit of trying to be helpful, of course, as always, uh, uh -huh. could that be summarised in terms of GP1 and GP7? I defer to Mr Sutty. I think we don't want complications. David seems to have given us a... <laughs> David has given us a reasonable a, a, a statement, and I'm sure Paula... We'll be happy to either repeat that or, or endorse it for us. Um, what I've picked up from the discussion, and I'm very open to changing this, is that you wish to re you're considering refusing the application on the basis that the specific layout and layout of the units does not take appropriate account of the noise assessment and will result in an unacceptable level of amenity in the proposed dwelling houses and create a land use conflict with the legitimate use of the adjacent industrial estate. Is that? <laughs> Right. I don't know whether we have to be more specific because there were very, the, you know, Mr. Um, Mann did put out very definite numbers. I don't know what they were. And in the report, there is, you know, certain numbers that have acoustic glazing and mechanical ventilation put in. Or can we just do it as a general, um, Paula, do you think? Is that all right? Is that you're happy with that? It, it's, it's the entire layer. I think you, you would have a legitimate reason to say that you are not in an expert position to say what the effect of removing certain units would be on the units behind them. And you don't want to be too specific about what is acoustic windows. I think David did give us a, a, a reasonable a, a sound decision for our approval and if that's what we care to approve. Can you repeat it, David, please? I think Paul actually approved on the one I which I had, so I'll go with your one. <laughs> One more time, Paula, and if that's members' decision, it'll be a unanimous decision, and we'll go to the next item. <laughs> yes, we'll stop for lunch, Shai. The specific... That's the next item. Okay. The specific layout and number of units does not take appropriate account of the noise assessment and will result in an unacceptable level of immunity for the proposed dwelling houses and create a land use conflict with the legitimate use of the adjacent industrial estate. Therefore, Paula, we have refused this application. The committee has determined to refuse the application on the grounds I just said it. <laughs> Thank you, Paula. It's just after 10 to 2, we'll resume at a quarter past. That gives 25, 20, 25 minutes.
25 past two.
and Crane Pad and Access Track at Ingleston Lodge, Castle Douglas, NGR 276954, 55904. Recommendations approved subject to conditions and the case officer is Judith Turnbull. Judith, if you'd take us through the presentation, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, this is a location plan for the application site. Um, it's about four kilometres south of Castle Douglas and about 650 metres south of Gelston. The sites to the north of the Screel and Ben Gairn Hill Range and Screel Summit itself is about 2.5 2 kilometres south of the site. The site itself is, is 250 metres west of Ingleston Farm. Um, the road to the, the, the north, sort of northeast of, of the site, um, that's, that goes past Gelson Castle and then down to Screel and Auchencairn. And that's a C51. Um, and the site is 900 metres from the nearest, nearest boundary with the, the Solway Coast Regional Scenic Area. The Regional Scenic Area is is south of, of the site towards the coast. It's not, it's not in the, to the north of the site where the main views of the turbine would be. The site lies within the Ben Gairn unit of the southern, sorry, the coastal granite uplands landscape type. A previous application was submitted for a turbine on exactly the same site um, and it was 21 metres to, to the blade tip um, and it was granted subject to conditions in 2011. This is the ZTV for the, the wind turbine. You can see that most of the, of the visibility is to the north, um, going from the, the, north, the northwest round to the, the northeast. Um, the school and Ben Gearn hill range um, screens all the, all the south mainly. There will be theoretical visibility from the settlements of Gelston, Rowan House and parts of Castle Douglas, although in reality a lot of the properties in Gelston would be screened by um, tree cover and plantations, and I'll got images later on that will show you that. We seem to have missed, ah, slightly the wrong order here. Um, this is the turbine elevation. It would be 36 metres to blade tip, 24 metres to hub with a 24 metre diameter rotor. There would also be a small metre house um, at the base of the, the turbine, um, a hard standing, <coughs> seven square metres for a crane and um, an access track of 60 metres. Going back to this one, um, this is a cumulative um, plan of turbines within five kilometre radius of the site. Um, I'll just point out with the wee, the wee laser on this one. Yep, that's the site there, that's the application site, this one. And this one here <laughs> is at Airy Land. Um, it's about one kilometre distant and the turbine there is 27 metres to tip. As, I d as discussed in paragraph 415 of my report, it's concluded that there will be no significant cumulative impact um, with that turbine or any of the other ones as a result of the proposal. This is a view from the site down towards Gelston. You can see the houses there in the distance. The, the, house, the white house to the, the left-hand side, that's a schoolhouse, and then the school properties along, and the other white houses you can see are the, the properties in Douglas Terrace, or sorry, Douglas Crescent and the Terrace. Um, you can see on the, on the right hand side the, the plantations and the tree cover that, that screens the rest of Gelston. This is a view, no it's not a view from the B36, which I thought I had changed yesterday but it doesn't seem to have been changed. So this is the view from the site looking southeast. Um, this is looking towards a newly completed agricultural shed which was granted in 2006. This is really looking towards Screel and the, and the hill range, but, but you, can't see the, you can't see the hill from here, neither can you see 
the site of the turbine from the, the summit of Screel. The shed itself is 48 metres long. <clears throat> this is a view of, of the site from the edge of Gelston. Um, the turbine would be about here. Just there, the shed, the, the shed is in that position as well. Oh, it's very difficult to see. Um, given the scale of the building and the plantations in the area, um, it's not considered that the turbine would be out of scale with this open landscape. This is a view of a site from the B736. Um, this is near Cuckoo Bridge and the beginning of the footpath which cuts across from the Gelson Road to Mid Kelton. In this view, the turbine would be about here. And that green field just to the south of that plantation. Um, from, this, from this view, it would appear to be on the foothills of Bengian, albeit as a very small element in this open landscape. This landscape is not designated, and the landscape and visual impact of the turbine is considered to be acceptable. We didn't receive a response from environmental standards on noise, so the agent has submitted a noise impact assessment report, and the results indicated that no properties would be adversely affected by the noise. Therefore, no noise conditions are recommended. No consultees objected to this proposal, and in conclusion, the application is recommended for approval subject to the conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. Uh, members, Councillor McKee. Thank you. Judith, could you clarify on page 95, paragraph 415, there will be no cumulative concerns as the turbines would be mutually exclusive. Could you clarify that, please? <coughs> yes, that... Um, that's referring to the one which has been previously granted permission. So if you put this one up, you can't put the other one up. Um, so if you have one, you can't have the other. If that makes sense. Thanks, Councillor McKee. Councillor Witts. Thank you, Chair. I note on page 91 that on the reports mentioned that uh, General Policy 24 Farm Diversification has been cited um, I just wondered uh, why these, this particular policy appears in certain reports and not in other, or perhaps what is the justification for it here? Robert? Thank you, Chair. I'm grateful that Councillor Witts has raised that question because I wasn't entirely satisfied with the benefit of hindsight with my earlier response. Uh, put quite simply, the application at Plaskow should have contained General Policy 24 as well. I hadn't quite appreciated the link to farm diversification. Uh, General Policy 24, as you probably know, states proposals to diversify the range of economic activities on a farm by the introduction of non-residential uses will normally be permitted where the proposal is operated as part of the agricultural unit is compatible with the continuation of the agricultural operations on the farm and where all of the following tests are met and then sets out a range of criteria. So. For the benefit of hindsight, I did think about this, um, and yes, the IPP and the wind energy policy is the key thing, but I think, for the benefit of hindsight, I think General Policy 24 should have been quoted in the Plaskow report, so apologies that it wasn't, and apologies for the earlier answer. Alistair? I'm grateful to the officer for his uh, courteous reply. Thank you. Good, Alistair. I'm sure that will feature in future documents as well. Uh, any other members for today? In that case, thank you for your presentation, Judith. We have one speaker on this item. It's Craig Bosworth, agent for the applicant. Uh, Craig, you have three minutes, uh, and I'll give you some notification about 30 seconds before the conclusion. Good afternoon, councillors. I'll be brief as I largely wish to echo the comments of the case officer's report. As stated, no consultee objections were raised. While the Council Archaeologist did not raise a formal objection, I would like to spend a minute to address the comments she raised in Section 2.3 to allay any residual concerns. Taking each point in turn, Dungal Hill Fort was assessed as a national monument record with a non-significant impact from the turbine. 
From the fort itself, the open panoramic nature of views reduces the turbine to a less significant visual element, and when viewing the fort from the north, the turbine appears backdrop by Dungile Hill. Cumulative impacts with the existing approval at Ingleston Farm have already been addressed in the committee report. As this application would replace the former one, that cumulative impact does not exist. In relation to tree height, when viewed from the village of Gelston B727, the turbine will appear in scale with a nearby tree plantation as shown on Appendix Figure 9 of the environmental report. Also shown in the photo montages, Gelston Castle itself has partial to full vegetative screening from the turbine, depending on the time of year, while the grounds have partial screening. This mitigates potential visual influence from the proposed development. Lastly, the Council archaeologist made reference to the settlement and archaeology sensitivity rating of the Bengairn unit of the coastal granite upland. The turbine has been located away from Gelston and individual residences to prevent visual dominance, while the ZTV and historic assessment demonstrate limited overall impact on local archaeology. Considering landscape impacts, Gelston is largely screened by roadside trees. Where visible from the village, the turbine will be backdropped by Dungao Hill. In accordance with the interim planning policy guidance, the turbine has been sited away from the Ingleston Lodge farm structures to prevent scaling with smaller landscape features. The development proposed here makes use of the slacker, lower hill slopes and more extensive, gently undulating moorland and forestry noted in the landscape capacity study as the best opportunity for wind development. Cumulative effects are also minimal for this turbine. Only one other wind development exists within two kilometres, that of Craigley Farm. As noted, topography, distance and positioning render impacts non-significant. As mentioned by the case officer, turbines out with this two kilometre range will be read as entirely separate from the proposal, mitigating potential cumulative impacts. To summarise, in line with the case officer's comments, the turbine will not have a significant adverse impact upon a landscape, local archaeology or residential amenity, either by its own merit or cumulatively. It adheres to the planning policies set out in the various plans and supplementary guidance and as such is complementary to both its setting and the Dumfries and Galloway planning framework. Consequently, I hope you can agree with the case officer's recommendation today. Thank you very much, Mr. Bosworth. Do any members have any questions for the agent? In that case, I'd be kind enough to turn to your seat. Thank you very much for the presentation. Members, Councillor Drybra. Thanks, Are we in session now? We are in session now, yes. Thanks, Chair. I've, I've read this report and, and, and there are many issues. I did have a concern about the, um, the actual location, but when I saw the pictures, actually, you know, it, it, it certainly uh, proved worthwhile seeing those pictures. Looking at the report, I'm quite happy with that now, and I'd like to recommend we approve subject to the conditions within the, the report. Thank you for that, Councillor Driver. Councillor Maitland and Councillor McKee. Well, actually, if anything, the pictures, I, having read the report, thought, yeah, that's probably fine. Pictures, in fact, actually give me um, cause for considerable concern. Um, this business about the slack lower hills, I mean, I can't remember the actual phraseology of it. Um, if we go back, can we go back to a picture from Gelston Village? Because there's no notion of how tall that, um, and I've looked in the, um, you know, in the website here, that there's no idea, I've got no idea how tall that thing's going to be. And, you know, the, the whole business of, of um, the, the openness of the hillside actually in some ways means it'll stick out like a sore thumb, particularly since it's going to be moving. Um, so I, I just want to ask about the scale of that, of the, of the thing, in comparison, say, to the trees behind? Thank you. I, I, I've just been having a discussion with David. We, we, unfortunately, we can't superimpose montages onto these, and we can't require developers, so you have, you're left to your best judgment as to whether or no you find the application appropriate and, and, and fitting for the, for the location. I've got Councillor McKee, Councillor Geddes and Councillor Ian Dick. Could, could, could you just take us back to that last photograph you had up, please? No, next time. <laughs> You're just winding me up, you know, the inbox. That one. Right. Do I take it that you are saying that the site for the turbine is where that broom is and not on the hill beside between the, those two groups of trees? Is that right? Judith, is it between the wall and the vegetation or is it behind the vegetation? It's here. That's the shed. 
there. And then there. So 100 meters in front of the shed. That's this side of the shed. So this side of the shed yes. behind the dike. So it's not on the hill at all. It's in the wide open plain. And that, that's, that's where, where I thought it was. And another, if I could raise an issue with the council archaeologist, no objections. The gentleman has just went through his whole list. It's object nearly everything he, he raises. The proposal would be approximately twice the height of existing trees in the vicinity, but appear as a large new industrial structure. Is that no an objection? And the proximity to the uh, Gelson Castle, non inventory designed landscape, out to scale with woods and fields to the west of Gelston. Is that not a complete objection? Well, you see, not if it doesn't woods? say it, Joe. Sorry? Not if it doesn't say it. The, the officer well, uh, is making observations, these? which is then up to you to interpret, but it's not a specific God. objection. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you're here to interpret the English for me. I'll tell you, I have great difficulty with it. Uh, can, can you explain to me why the turbine that's already got permission to go up on the same site is not suitable? Robert or Judy? Um, I can't answer that question and, and the, the applicant's agent would need to answer that. Obviously there has been, if you look at page 89 of the report, plan and application 11 P2264 was granted subject to conditions on the 6th of September 2011 on exactly the same site, but it was a turbine up to 21 metres. Um, I've got no idea why they now intend to put a larger turbine on the same site, but we've obviously got to deal with each application on its merits and decide whether or not that's acceptable or not in its own right. I appreciate that and I think I'd, I'd be inclined, they've got permission for one turbine and rather go, go and put in a bigger one there, I would uh, recommend that we refuse this present application. Supposition would have it that it'll have greater generating capacity because it's bigger. But anyway, uh, I have Councillor Geddes and Vice Chair Ian Dett. Somebody to say, <coughs> somebody to say Chair, that I'm setting Council Driver's motion. Okay, uh, Councillor Dick. I have really no problems with uh, with it. I must admit I was quite um, intrigued by some of the comments from the archaeologists, some of which I didn't actually view as being uh, archaeologically um, orientated, such as, for example, that it was twice the height of the trees in the vicinity and appear as a large new industrial structure, and also that it was being assessed as very probably of national importance by the Fries and Galloway Council. I didn't realise we could categorise things like that. Um, anyway, um, no problem with the application. So we have a proposal to agree the recommendation as per the officer's report, and that's duly seconded. We have a motion not to approve this application. Is there a, a seconder for Councillor McKee's motion? Councillor Maitland. Yeah, I'll, I'll second him. Okay, and on what basis uh, 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 is the recommendation to refuse, Councillor McKee? There is already an application being agreed, which I would assume has been a, a, was previously agreed and is entirely satisfactory for their needs. And to come forward, I okay. can. I'm sorry, that Councillor McKee, that's not, that's I, not I can, a planning not, reason. I can, it's not a reason, but, oh God, I don't know. Is there any justification for? Right. It's, it's contrary to GP7 siting and design. It's too, it's too large for a site to be put on. Siting and design, siting scale and, design. and massing or whatever else, is that right? Yeah, siting and design. Right? And would that relate to your comment that it's on the open plain and yes. bigger than the trees around it and therefore out of scale? Yeah. Right. Councillor Maitland, do you want to add to that? Uh, th th that is the issue. That is the issue. I mean, it, it, will, it will be out of scale, I think, on a, an open... An, uh, a la it will appear as a large new industrial structure on an area of open hillside. Okay, so if Paula would like to read out the, the motion and amendment, we'll go to the vote. The motion proposed by Councillor Driver, seconded by Councillor Geddes, is to approve per the report. 
The amendment proposed by Councillor McKee, seconded by Councillor Maitland, is to refuse on the grounds that the proposal does not comply with policy GP7, siting and design, and that the proposed turbine would be out of scale on the open hillsides and introduce a large new industrial structure. Chair. Motion. Councillor Dick. Motion. Councillor Dreyber. Motion. Councillor Geddes. Councillor Gilroy. Councillor Maitland. Amendment. Councillor not here. Councillor McCutcheon. Motion. Councillor McKee. Amendment. Councillor Thompson. Motion. Councillor Witts. Motion. Eight, two. That's eight votes for the motion, two for the amendment. The committee is determined to approve the application as per the report. Thank you for that, Paula. We come to item eight on the agenda. Part retrospective planning application for access road to farmlands. Part new planning application for extension to existing access road to farmlands. Formation of access and new gate to field at existing passing place and new LPG tank for existing holiday let at Nunland Holiday Park, Lochfoot, Dumfries. The recommendation is approved subject to conditions and the case officer is Dean Clapworthy. Dean, will you take us through your presentation, please? Uh, I'll explain as we're going through, but these, it's part retrospective. Uh, there's a track that's already in situ uh, and it's proposed to retain that and extend it further into the agricultural lands and then also a proposal for field access, new field access and a, a domestic fuel tank associated with the holiday lets at the site. Um, that's a location plan just showing the the area outlined in the, the bold blue is the is the the holiday park and the associated agricultural lands. It's immediately south, you can see bound in the, the northern boundary uh, with the A seventy five where it's dual between Cargan Bank and, and uh, the first roundabout Dumfries. That's uh, a zoom in. Uh, you can see the holiday site there, just about middle. Uh, the track comes in from. You can you can catch the the accessing off the U one ninety public road in the top left. Uh, that takes a sharp turn. The track will le the track leaves in a continuous line along. The, the northern boundary with the uh, A75 past the northern part of the holiday park and then veers sharply south. It's the element that veers sharply south just past that line that is the proposed part, all, all, all parts to the, to the left or the west of that are in existence at this time. Uh, and then there it is highlighted in red. Uh, and you can see the continuous line veering south at the, on the right hand side. That's the proposed element. Take you through the slides. That's on the, if you're going back, that's on the top, the, the, where, the, where the road takes a sharp uh, right coming in from the left. That is on that corner there. So the track that you see uh, identified with the, the cones is the retrospective element. You can see it rising up. Uh, along the boundary of the A75 into the distance there. The holiday park is over the ridge uh, where the trees are on the horizon. That's just, as, and what we're doing, we're just going along the track as it, as it rises uh, to the high point. And you can see there's a, an element coming in from the, the right there. That's a spur that's looking up the way back towards, uh, it's going up towards the existing track. Turning back, we've, we've come to the top of the rise and we're looking back where the previous photographs were taken from, looking back west. That's as it turns a sharp right uh, or south towards uh, the, the part that would be, uh, that forms the proposed element. Uh, and in there, there are other works taking place that are referred to in the report. They're not subject to this application. This application is for the retrospective element of the track the extension to the track, the LPG tank, and uh, the field access, which I'll show you in a moment. There, the, that's the area that the track will extend into. 
and that's the point where the new field access will be taken off what appears to be a public road, but it's actually beyond the terminus of the public road. This is actually in the private lands uh, that the applicant controls. Uh, it just taken access off that lay-by there into the field. Uh, at this point, that, that's it, the presentation. Nothing else to add. Thank you, Dean. Any members have any questions for the case officer? In that case, thank you, Dean. We have a number of objectors. We have five. Mr. Stephen Barber is going to speak on behalf of all of the objectors. So we have agreed to allow him 15 minutes. And I'll remind Mr. Barber with a minute to go that it's time. So if you'd like to come forward, Mr. Barber, and just whenever you're ready, sir. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to address you on behalf of myself and my neighbours. Uh, since 2009, when the ownership of Nunlands changed, there has been ever-continuing issues with works being carried out without planning permission, all resulting in retrospective applications or part retrospective applications, usually applied for under enforcement. In the committee report, it states that 10 slash P slash 2 slash 0276 was granted subject conditions on the 16th of March 2011 and has since been implemented. Failing to point out that this was a retrospective application and the conditions were only adhered to after an investigation by the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, which was upheld. In fact, the owners have still not implemented the screening of the lodges that were a condition of this application and a condition allowing permanent occupancy of lodges was not rectified. An investigation is being carried out by the SPSO into this with regards to the following points. The Council unreasonably failed to follow the correct policies and procedures. Mr Barber, we are dealing with this particular application. We are now looking for the history of uh, the site and, and how, okay. how we've arrived there. We, we have a, a particular element to deal with. Can uh, I talk uh, about the history of the road? Yes. Yes. Uh, there's a history to the road that's not been mentioned in the committee report. First informed the planning department in October 2011 that this road was being used for the removal of aggregate to a nearby farm witnessed by a number of people. Following this, there was sporadic removal of further aggregate from the site and taken past Castle Douglas. There's a mitigation site at the top of the road that came from the Glen upgrade of the A75, which aggregate has been removed from, again witnessed by a number of people, probably around 3,000 tonnes roughly. Subsequently, this eventually led to a complaint on three points. Delay in respondent information provided to enforcement officer. Lack of action taken in respondent information provided, therefore resulting in no enforcement action being taken. Mr. Barber, we're drifting away again. What we're looking for, I thought that was maybe you're going to give us some history of Sorry. what the application for the road is being made. What we need it to deal with today is only what is contained within the document. There are other matters I appreciate being dealt with. Okay. But there is another forum for that. Okay. And we're strictly, we, we have to strictly adhere to, to, to what's before us because that's the only thing that the members can deal with. So I, I would be grateful if, if, if you okay. can be restrict your, your, your submission to, to these elements, please. Okay. I'd like to now quote the Siting and Design Policy GP7, which states the Council as a planning authority will require development to see have no material adverse effect on the local landscape character, avoiding prominent ridge lines or other visually sensitive sites. Um, I believe the prominent ridge line in this case being the Terregos Ridge, which the regional scenic area is named after. Um, I'd also like to quote from the regional scenic area, policy E2, if that's okay. Uh, the site and design of development should respect the special nature of the area. Development within or which would have a significant impact on regional scenic areas may be permitted where it can be demonstrated that, one, the landscape character and scenic interest for which the area has been designated would not be adversely affected. Or two, there is a specific need for the development at that location which could not be located in a less sensitive area. The area has been designated the Terregos Ridge Regional Scenic Area and level the levels of this ridge have been substantially changed. There is also currently adequate access available to all of the fields at Nunlands through gates already in situ, uh, shown in the plans for the application. Hence, there is no specific need for a road to the farmland in this case. Mm. 
I would request that this application is turned down um, as the road goes against the policies for regional scenic area and siting and design. And regardless of the use of the road, there are a number of underlying issues. Uh, thank you for your time. Thanks very much, Mr. Barber. Thank you for that. Now, uh, do any members have any questions for Mr. Barber? In that case, thank you very much, sir, for your presentation. You, you can resume your seat. We now have Duncan McCready, who is the agent for this site. Duncan McCready, you have the same three minutes, sir, and I'll, I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Councillors. I'm here on behalf of Holiday Scotland um, at Nunland's Holiday Park. Um, this, is, this application is purely to access the farm ground within the, the park. Uh, the reason being is the, the ground has been redundant for a number of years due to it was a retirement sale when my wife uh, purchased the business, and we're now going to make it back into a working farm. Um, the Caldy Park itself uh, is situated in the middle, unfortunately, of the site, all surrounded by the farm ground, which is covered by our farm number. The reason for this road and, and, and uh, the reasoning for the uh, location of it, and my first of all apologies for it being retrospective, was we were not aware that there was a 25 metre rule from a trunk road. Uh, we were working under the normal farm rules of accessing fields, and that's why it was put in before permission was granted. The reason is, is, as you can imagine, we have holiday makers on the site. Last year, the site uh, was lucky enough to win Best Lodge Escape in Britain uh, with whole seasons and wind and holidays. So it's not in our interest to have tractors, machinery going through the site at crop times. Last year was the first year that we've taken silage and uh, crop from the, from the ground. And that's when we came across the problems that we now have. And hence the reason we're looking to access the top hill and the other fields from the new road. Also, I'd like to bring to your attention, uh, you'll see from your passing, we've started drainage works, etc. We need to access stone to make these drains work. We were unlucky enough that that area was actually the ground that was infilled from building the glen, if you recall. So the fields are not to a good standard uh, for crops. So we have to uh, include a lot of draining and we need access to the stone at the top area to, to have this. Um, Basically, it's not in our interests to make the place un, uh, you know, unsightly or we're looking to have any major changes as suggested in some of the, the um, complaints with regard to the application. This is purely just for a farming um, facility. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCready. Does anyone have any questions for the agent? In that case, Mr. McCready, would be great for you to take your seat again. Thank you. Members are now in session. Councillor Dreibner. Th thanks, Chair. Um, I, I've got absolutely no problem with this, this report and approved subject to condition, which um, excuse me, I have a question for, for Dean. Obviously, there were some issues there that was raised by the objector um, for previous applications. Has this been looked at? Yeah. Dean, that's no part of the planning application. And if there is an issue, that can be dealt with either by member directly or the planning officer or the enforcement officer. Because we are here just today to deal with a specific planning application. I don't think we can enter into a discussion of the report and recommendation. Okay, I'll check with David and then Councillor Robert. I'm quite happy to make a statement picking up on what you're saying. Um, there have been issues and various investigations, as Mr. Barber alluded to, that have gone on, and those have involved both defences complaint processes as well as the Scottish Public Service and the Ombudsman have been in touch with different Ontario entities as well. However, these are operational matters for officers, and we've dealt with them on that basis. We've got to try and be fair, reasonable, and proportionate in our approaches as officers. I'm not going to go into details in this case, that would be completely inappropriate. All parties have a right to complain. That would include Mr. McCready as well as Mr. Barber or anyone else at that location. The service standards set out in the Council Service Charter and the Enforcement Charter, and we endeavour to meet it. However, if we don't, and third parties believe that we have not, then they have the right to complain in. But that has to be done through the complaints process and not through the committee process. And thereafter, if they remain dissatisfied, which has been the case in the past with a few investigations here, they can refer it to the Ombudsman, and it's for the Ombudsman to decide whether this is accepted correctly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dreibner. 
Councillor Driver. Uh, thank you. I wasn't going to change my mind on it, but I, this is a part of the retrospective planning application at the end of the day, and, and therefore I, I, I want to be comfortable that any conditions that we apply will, will be met. Yes, and likewise, I think all members would be the same, and I'm sure we wouldn't want to see frequent recurring retrospective applications. I've never heard of it. It's going to be we were dealing with one particular one up in Gale, and I'm not sure we want to see that happen in the rest of the country. Councillor Geddes. Well, I was simply moved so the application be granted on the basis of suggested in paragraph 5.9. Is anyone, Councillor Maitland, you, you're supporting that as well? Certainly. No other proposal from my side? In that case, Paula, will you make a decision, please? Thank you. We come to item nine on the agenda. Erection of two dwelling houses at Beeswing Poultry Farm, land to rear of Loch Arthur Lodge, Beeswing. Recommendation is approved subject to conditions, and your case officer is Andrew Robinson. Andrew, will you take it for presentation? Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, it's an application for uh, planning permission in principle for the erection of two houses at the former Beeswing Poultry Farm. Um, this is the site within uh, Beeswing, um, and it's immediately visible when you approach Beeswing from uh, the direction of Dumfries. Um, to the southeast of the site, there's a cluster of properties around Loch Arthur House, uh, and yeah, that can be seen on the bottom right-hand side of the, of the slide there. Um, site situated on the southeastern side of the A711 that runs through Beeswing, and it's accessed from a private track which is uh, shown on, on the plan there. And this uh, track also goes further on to serve Loch Arthur House further, um, further into the location. Um, this is a close up of the existing site layout and it shows its surroundings. So the nearest neighbouring property is at Loch Arthur Lodge, which is situated to the, to the northwest of the site and it's uh, annotated on the slide. Um, this is a, a proposed site plan um, which shows how two dwellings could be laid out in the site. Um, as this is for planning permission in principle only, the further details of uh, the siting would be for, a, um, for another stage, but this shows um, roughly how it's proposed to be um, laid out, which is two dwelling houses set within quite substantial grounds. Um, under the current adopted local plan, uh, Beeswing benefits from a settlement boundary and the proposed site falls within the boundary as illustrated on this slide here, which is an extract from the, um, from the Mistil local plan. Uh, next few slides are just some photographs of the site. So this is the um, northwestern part of the site um, adjacent to Loch Arthur Lodge, which would be on the right-hand side of the photograph. Um, this is the opposite side of the site, uh, which bounds onto open countryside. Um, the proposed access would actually utilize an existing access to the site when the site was in use. Um, and visibility from that access onto the private track would be um, this to the northwest, and this looking up the um, private track, which taken around the other way is a straight track with a quite attractive uh, free line boulevard type thing. So, um, and this is just a final photograph just looking towards the um, main road and that's the access to the main road. So um, after assessing this proposal against relevant development plan policies, um, officers of the opinion that it complies with the development plan and um, for the reasons stated in the report and it would result in a redundant site situated within Beeswing um, boundary being redevelopment and it's recommended the application is approved subject to conditions. Thank you, Andrew. Does anyone have any questions for the case officer? Councillor Maitland and then Councillor Torloy. Uh, I, I do actually in the sense that um, th these are, I mean, are they're business units, aren't they at the moment? How, how do they actually, how do they stand? Because, I mean, instinctively, I, I kind of dig in my toes at getting rid of a little piece of land that has been used as a business unit. Um, so I need some help as to you know, what, what our policies say with respect to simply taking an area like that which has been used as a business um, and, and putting housing in it. I'll ask David to assist you with that. Uh, Andrew can correct me here, but as far as I'm aware, they're disused poultry units, which are 
uh, intensive agriculture mm. rather than class four or five business. Um, at the moment, they're sitting vacant and not actually making any positive contribution in their current condition. So um, we think there is a, an issue with them. It's not as if it's removing the serviced industrial land. That would be contrary to policy. But as you can see from the, the extract from the plan there, they actually have no allocation whatsoever, but they fall <coughs> within the settlement boundary of these ones. Councillor okay, so Gorai. Here we go. Hallelujah. Um, I'm just looking at um, these links here, the council projections. They say that the site falls out of the area currently in Hampshire, but you're saying it doesn't. And then I'm also kind of wondering if those projections were there, would we be allowed to look at them? Um, well, the two are sort of linked. It's contained within the settlement boundary. That was made clear by officers, Andrew. It's not. Um, it it's doesn't have any site allocation at the moment. So the relevant policies that we've we've used to assess this applications were because it's not um, protected business, uh, which would be general policy twenty five. It doesn't have any protected. It, that use isn't actually protected under our under the current development plan policy. So what we've used to assess it is is general policy nine which is for small scale infill development and also general policy 12a which is reusing vacant derelict or contaminated land sites as well so that one's also been taken into consideration i think the question was andrew is it or is it not within the settlement the current settlement boundary it is chair there's a paragraph which clarifies that matter i think the, the other question you were asking is if it wasn't for the buildings on the site, would we be looking for development on it? Valid question. Answer is no, it probably wouldn't, because that would make it a, a greenfield site, but it is a brownfield site, which is in the settlement boundary, and therefore, as Andrew correctly says, general policy 12A gives it support. Thank you. That's that. Councillor McKee. Just on you, there's a, a bit here now under representations. Planning permissions previously been refused for a house on an adjoining site. Because of road access, is that <coughs> there's a small site going to the left? Notice it's got trees round about it, and your picture of the site lies there. That site next to the road. Now that's the, the obvious thing you've got, got to happen there is there's got to be an application for a house in there. Is that where is that the site that was previously applied for? I'm sure Andrew can help you, but we can't speculate again on what might be. We can only deal with what we have before us. Andrew? Yeah. No, in the planning history section in paragraph 1.7, it, it just shows, um, it just outlines two applications which were adjacent to the proposed site, one of which was refused, one of which was approved back in 2000, but it was never implemented, so they've uh, stamped permission to do it. It was, uh, they were referenced because a, a representation made reference to it, so to address the point, that's why the planning history was, was summarised. And are you able to tell Councillor McKee where exactly the site was that was refused? Mm, no. no. Not, on the, or not on the plans, but it, it wasn't okay. considered relevant to this, this application. Okay. That's right. Councillor McKee, thank you for that. Any other members? Yeah. In that case, there are no registered speakers for this application, so we go straight into session. Councillor Drybra? Just approve the, the, recomm the recommendations. No members otherwise minded? In that case, Paula, can you decide the, the advisor's decision? Committee is determined to approve the application subject to conditions as set out in the report. We come to item 10. Consultation regarding an application made under Section 36 of the Electricity Act 1989 for the construction of wind farm comprising 24 turbines, 72 megawatts, and associated in infrastructure at Tranoch, New Luce. The applicant is Wind Prospects Limited, Scottish Government, and the recommendations raise objections. Case officer is Peter Barker. Will you take us through your presentation, Peter, please? Uh, th thank you, Chair. Just to um, briefly outline the 
the um, location. I'll try and fly through these, bearing in mind there's quite a few slides and uh, time's obviously pressing on as well. The location of the site, you're probably familiar. Um, Stranra with the blue dot, Cairn Ryan with the red dot, New Loose Village with the green dot, Penwern as well with the sky blue dot. So that gives you a location where the site sits, sort of in the middle of the moorlands, um, just at the back end of um, Loch Ryan there. <coughs> just focusing in closer on the site, the development comprises two clusters of turbines. Um, on, on, on the northern part, there's eight turbines of 135 meters total height, and on the southern part, uh, 16 turbines uh, with a height of 110 meters. Uh, just focusing in a little bit closer, that's the uh, the northern site, just showing the layout in, in a little bit more detail. Um, you can just see sort of some, some bits of plantation appearing in, 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 the, uh, in the plan, just uh, part of that uh, modern landscape, as you'll see in the, in the pictures to follow, is uh, part forested, part, partly open. And the southern portion, again, just using the same coding with the blue dot, the sky blue dot, that's Penwern as well, just on the... Uh, just down the left-hand margin of the plan, just just gives you an orientation. Um, and there's the sort of uh, transport corridors, the the Stranra railway, Stranra to Girvan railway going down the right, and the um, minor road from Pern Penwern Reservoir going up to Lagifata, um, up on the northwest corner of the site. Uh, I thought it might be useful just to show this slide. Um, it's an updated version of one I did a few months ago for, an, for a, another proposal, just showing where we are um, in, in this neck of the woods with wind farms. Uh, the, the application site is the, um, is the uh, two, two red dots, the northern cluster, the southern cluster. The light blue triangles are sites that are approved and committed, um, but, not, but not built. The green, dark green, is that represents the operational wind farms at the moment. And I've tried to sort of gauge and sort of uh, size the triangles regarding the sort of size of sign, uh, size of wind farms. So the bigger the triangle, the bigger the wind farm, and, uh, and converse. Yellow is um, sites currently in, in, in the system, in, you know, where a decision hasn't been made yet. And the blue stars are a bit more tenuous, but sites that we know are in the offing and we're expecting applications in, in on them very shortly. You'll also see that the um, legend I've used extends into South Ayrshire on the sort of north and eastern part of the site because it's quite relevant in this landscape because the, the Dumfries landscape is contiguous with the South Ayrshire landscape. And, and on the South Ayrshire side of the border, there's also a degree of, or a considerable degree of um, wind farm activity. Uh, the, the, the Z, Z TV. Um, again, yeah, the, the, the map's very detailed, but essentially you can see where, the, where there are colors on the map. The wind farm, to some degree, can be seen. Um, you'll note that the majority of the views are either from water, i.e. the Irish Sea or, Lu or Loose Bay, or from existing higher ground, uh, namely being the um, area immediately around the wind farm itself in the center of the um, concentric rings. Uh, a little bit more to the east or northeast going into South Ayrshire uh, where the A71, um, A714 runs. Um, and also on the, along the eastern side of the Rins Peninsula, both the north side of the north, of the, of the north Rins, sorry, uh, the, sorry the, the north side of the Rins and the south side of the Rins as well. So that east-facing flank of the um, of, of the Rins Peninsula, you know, is quite susceptible to views um, of the of the site. This, the site also involves, or the development also involves, um, uh, a so long access link, which is essentially the upgrade and adaptation of the existing U90W um, road leading from Innermesson just to the north of Stranraer off the A75. Um, which is the, at the moment a single track road with uh, passing places uh, witness the, the, the sign um, but as you just saw from that um, previous slide I've just gone back to it there's quite a, a dip off them off the road um, it's quite a severe right angle junction and it's clear that long trailers 
carrying abnormal loads would ground and have difficulty maneuvering around the junction. So the proposal is to actually install a new junction just further up the road, uh, slightly on the Cairn Ryan side of the junction, uh, just in the vicinity of where the Red Arrow is, which is also the vicinity of where the old alignment of the A75 is before it was improved into the, the straight length of road that we now see today. Just a little bit, you know, um, that's just the um, old link of where the roads, you know, where the old road currently joins the new road, and it's just used for farm access purposes. This is the old length of road, uh, or the old A, uh, the old U90, which has been abandoned as it veers round, and that's looking back the way towards the A75. The uh, the left hand side being the um, just 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 a few hundred yards from the junction with the A75, and the right hand suite being the the old route, which is which is to be upgraded. So it just allows for the long loads to sort of grade and sort of ease ease off the A75 and in in a, in, in a more commodious way. <coughs> um, part of the, the proposal involves the bypassing of the little settlement hamlet of Craig Craig Caffey, um, and it involves having a sort of a, a private haul road, essentially around the, the back of the settlement. And the yellow dots put on the on the photograph indicate the route of the uh, of the um, or the first part of the uh, route. Uh, this is Craig Caffey itself, just showing the existing highway alignment, showing why it's broadly unsatisfactory for long loads to um, to to to, to uh, negotiate. And this is just past the settlement, going up the hill, going up the steep bank uh, towards the um, moorland tops. And I've just indicated where the uh, new road is to go in, in tandem with the old road. Um, something I'm, I want to point out here is that as part of the Section 36 process, um, prior to its submission, the council was, uh, or officers were invited to attend a meeting at the Scottish Government um, where we discussed the application, or we'd, we'd, we'd had a preview of the application, and we were asked to make comment on it. One point that we made comment on was that the existing documentation did not adequately show the visual impacts of this Craig Caffey, Craig Caffey um, bypass. And lo and behold, when the application came in, no such details were, were included in the EIA. So the advice that we had offered had been ignored. And that is why the third reason for refusal was recommended at, in, at the end of the report is contained there because what we've had to do is to make our own assessment of what the, the proposal might look like. Um, and I, I think, you know, obviously using professional judgment, we've, we've, we've got an idea, but it would have been helpful to all people reading the document to actually see what the proposal might have looked like. Uh, this next slide just shows going round that uh, sort of right angle bend of, of, of the uh, yellow blobs. And it just shows that obviously some degree of cut and fill is going to be required in order for large trailers carrying 45 meter blades to, to try and, 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 uh, and, and uh, get round. Going up on, onto the more than tops now, um, we're sort of just, just onto Braid Fell, which is uh, generally sort of flat, plateau-like. This is the first, uh, uh, the, 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 the next three, this slide and the next two show, the, show the, the panorama going from east to north, because it sort of shows the vista of which application site falls within. And I'll refer that back to some of the EA documents. And I've, I've done it this way because the, photo, the photographs are better and they, 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 they reproduce better here. Um, so on, on looking due east there, you can see the Artfield, well, Artfield Fellwind Farm just sort of uh, in the sort of, um, sort of center, center part of the uh, photograph, about a third of the way in from the right-hand margin. Uh, just looking... Um, sort of due northeast from the same point, we're actually looking directly across where the Stranack site would be, just roughly across those domed hills, right in the center of the um, of, 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 of the picture, uh, just sort of on the, on the skyline. And then looking due north again, we're looking at um, at the uh, sort of over 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 where Penguin Reservoir would be, but also that 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 dome hill on 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 the left there in the background is actually where the proposed Glenapp wind farm, which just sits on our border, but in South Ayrshire, is still undetermined. So that's, that's, that's working <coughs> there. But just going, going back a slide or two, 
I'll, I'll start again the sequence. That sort of ridge going sort of right to left, it, um, that, that sort of center skyline is essentially mostly the, the, Kilg the Kilgalliac section 36 Wintong, which you, which you considered the, a, a few, few months ago. So there's that still to be built, and that's going to occupy quite a lot of that view, but, but, but also, um, you know, but, 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 but bearing in mind, it's actually going to be at, at distance, but I'll, I'll come back to that. This is a picture, from, this is a slide from the EA. Um, it sort of shows a bit, it's more of a composite of the three pictures that you've just seen, but it shows that the, the committee developments, I mean, it's, 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 it's very sort of small scale and it's hard to, to, to focus. But the thing to, if you, if, you, if you can pick it out on the picture, is the fact that the Stranach wind farm are, the, are the, the, the dark blue turbines. And what they do appear in that view is, 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 is that they bring forward and significantly westwards the existing sort of bulk and the existing edge of the wind farm developments which have been committed already. Existing wind farms that, that are there, they're sort of in the distance and they're, you know, whilst there might be a visual irritation or they're there, they, they are sort of fairly, you know, fairly, fairly distant. Whereas the Stranach ones, you know, they immediately bring that sort of wall of turbines closer westwards, but, but in doing so, they actually help draw attention to the turbines behind them. Um, this is where we, we're now at Penwern Reservoir. You can just see the dam uh, just sort of peeking at the left-hand sort of side of the, the picture there. Um, <clears throat> what this indicates is the, 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 the arrows don't indicate turbine height, they're just for illustrative purposes. But the uh, red arrows so sort of, you know, the, the, the insides of the, the two vertical red arrows shows the um, extent of the southern cluster of turbines on Stranach, and the yellow arrows show the sort of three ridges behind, or the three hills behind where the Kilgalliac turbines would, would, would be. Again, just a slightly different ver version of the, the, the same shot, uh, just panning slightly more sort of northwards, again showing the uh, red where, this, where the southern cluster of turbines would, would be. Um, uh, on, on, on the Stranach site, the yellow behind is where Kilgallic is, and the sky blue arrow under, underneath there, you can just see the, the turbines of Ari Kliak wind farm, which is sort of in, in to, just, just in, into South Ayrton. So we've, we've you know, the, the um, thing which I'm trying to highlight here is the uh, number of, sort of turbines committed, which are in areas where which have been allocated and, 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 and have been quite deliberately cited as such. Whereas the, the, the proposal which we now find, the, the um, Stranach one, that which you can, which you can, you can once again see in, in blue in this um, shot here, and again, sort of bringing that sort of view, that, that, that wall of turbines much further westwards, much more to, towards the sort of general public view, and, the, and, the are, and are as such, um, you, know, you know, just in, increasing the, the dominance of wind turbines per se. Um, from Pen from Pinwern Dam itself, uh, just looking, uh, we, we're now looking towards the southern part of the site, uh, where the, where the turbines would 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 be, just under the the red arrow there. The yellow blobs, which we'll come to in a minute, is where the access into the site would actually go. And this is the um, and, and, and that sort of hillside at the back is, is once again where the access will be cut into. The access to the to the site itself would actually be quite it would actually involve quite a lot of engineering operations, and this hasn't really been covered in the EIA either. Um, I, mean, I mean, essentially, the access would have to go straight through where those sheep are and to, to, to the left of the dike as it, as it goes up the hill. Clearly, that's going to involve a, a significant amount of cut and fill, uh, which would look quite an engineered operation in what is sort of quite sort of open and natural landscape. There. And it would also involve the crossing of the, uh, the river there as well. So there would be quite a, quite, quite a large structure of sort of quite engineered, uh, of quite engineered appearance required. Again, significantly changing the quite pastoral scene of, 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 of the Waterloo Valley there. Just going up the, up the western side of the site, that, uh, we're going up uh, towards the place called the Lagifata. Um, again, you can just, I'll just quick, quickly skip through these. Um, it's sort of just on, on the edge of a, of, of, of a, of a Natura site, a Nestor Sasai or, or, or SPA, where the main interest is Hen Harrier. Um, again, sort of typical moorland, sort of sweeping, quite open. It's the landscape 
it, it's, it's the plateau moorland landscape site, which is sort of quite rare in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, again, just sort of looking up the western side of the site. Uh, looking southwards now, back across the Stranach site, you know, it, it essentially occupies that central, slightly browner dome in the, in the middle of the, of, the, of the picture there. Just a matter of interest, you've got the old laggy fatter down there, which, is, which was breached some time ago. And it's now just just uh, just uh, in, in its, its remnants are just left there, and just the and the, the view from 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 Laggy Fatter looking southwards again, the, the dark blue turbines on the wireframe there showing just how the Stranach site sort of brings forward that line of primitive development of, uh, of existing turbines, which are sort of in, which are generally in the background, and uh, quite distant from sort of pub public well the the, the main public view. <coughs> um, and again, just uh, just you know, look, 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 looking at it, sort of on on that side, um, with the northern cluster under the, the red arrow, Kilgaliak being the uh, under the yellow arrows, sort of in the distance, and the Arcleot turbines in the, under the sky blue arrow, on the left hand side. Going on to the eastern side of the um, site now, going up the C1 road between New Loose and Bar Hill, um, we're just approaching Glen Willie. Um, sort of uh, station or, or sort of uh, the, the, the Glen Willie signal box area here, and just just as you as you as you approach the uh, big straight there before the the right angle bend, just on just under the right arrow you'll see the um, the uh, southern cluster just on on that hillside there, and uh, you can you can uh, I, I actually managed to catch a train there whilst I was up there, so you can you, you can see the impact of the site uh, on the rail users here with the uh, so with the northern cluster being uh, viewable under that red arrow, and just generally the sort of vista of the train from, from the train user with turbines on the hillside behind. Um, just, 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 just taking a view back uh, from the South Asia border, looking back into the into St. Fries and Galloway, you've got the Arcleix wind, wind farm on the right under the sky blue arrow. You've got the northern cluster under the red arrow. And just taking a slight view. A slight step to the north or right of the last frame, that's the existing Arclea wind farm. So that's actually quite a full frontal impact of turbines in that open moorland uh, landscape al already. <laughs> uh, and then this is just some views just showing how Stranach, which is the, the cluster of turbines in the center there, actually is infilling the gap more or less between the Arclea wind farm on the right, i.e., the, the black turbines, and the, and the Kilgallet ones in green on, on the left. <clears throat> and again, just sort of going back down the road, back towards New Luce, uh, back towards Glen Willie, uh, that's just, a, just under, the, under the red arrow is the, um, is the area of the southern, southern cluster turbines. And again, just a slight, um, slight different view of that. Again, with the turbines in blue there, um, the southern cluster uh, just sweeping over the, over the ridge there and just the tips of the right of the northern cluster on, on the right of the, of the frame. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that's been quite a long one, but it's actually quite a big site and there's actually quite a lot happening in the area. But the, the fundamental policy objection here is that this, is a, this, this application is a blatant challenge to the council's policy. The IPP was produced, in, it was, was adopted by the council in February 2012. The scoping response made to this application um, to the, Scottish, to the Scottish Government was actually on the 10th of May 2012. So that was made after the IPP was produced. So the applicants completely knew what the policy position of the Council would be. Um, the, the Scottish Government issued its own scoping reply in June of that year, and the application was submitted in 2013, January. So irrespective of the advice given and the policy position, the application nevertheless came in and for the issues of objection which the, which the report highlights and which I've tried to home in on <coughs> have, have all basically come home to roost. So essentially, wrong proposal, wrong site. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter, for the comprehensive uh, report. Uh, Archie, questions for Oscar. Yeah, th thanks for that very much shortened version of the application there, uh, Peter. Maybe an idea to give some officers timings, as if <laughs> <laughs> especially at this Sorry. end of the day, you know. <laughs> don't, don't, don't. Um, 
I, I'm just looking at the, the actual head, and it's 24 turbines, but it doesn't give you height or anything like that on, on, on the whole thing. These, these will be three megawatt turbines, so there'll be a fair height, I would imagine, um, compared to the, the, the following uh, application. So have they got any idea what sort of height these turbines are going to be, or is it just 24, meg uh, 24 turbines, 72 megawatts? Is that all you've got? No, I, I, think, I think I said earlier that the, the northern eight turbines are going to propose to be 135 metres total height, and the southern, eight, southern 16 would be 110 metres. In, in which case, the chair is just going with the recommendations. Okay. Well, we're, not in ses we're in session now, if there's no one else got questions for officers, and if no uh, questions for officers, Ian? Uh, questions for officers. Two, please, Peter. Um, just in 1.1.5, 1. 1. um, uh, there's a once more of a comment on the, on the last sentence um, of the third last paragraph. It um, relates to remoteness, um, the strong presence of archaeological features, which doesn't seem to be back, backed up anywhere else in, in the text. It's the, but the third occasion where I've felt I've had to question archaeological commentary. And the second thing is uh, recommendation three. Insufficient details supplied to demonstrate the proposed improvements to the U990W uh, Bridgefeld Road uh, that can be carried out without incurring detrimental landscape and visual impact. What exactly? What details would you require, um, and what sort of detrimental landscape and visual impact would you envisage that uh, such an improvement would have, particularly given uh, its remoteness? And um, I imagine these sort of access roads have been built for every other wind farm all across the country, so. Uh, what exactly is the big problem here? Peter? Right, two issues. In terms of archaeology, you'll, you'll see from the, from the archaeologist's response that they've essentially, they're essentially not objecting because the, the applicant has, you know, whilst the proposal is amongst archaeological features, it has actually tiptoed around the features within the site. And albeit there is some sort of overall detrimental impact on the setting of a lot of the features, um, on balance, the, the archaeologists thought that, that that we could live with it, and and, and that you know that, that, that the impact wasn't as was, wasn't so great as to warrant an archaeological objection. In terms of the actual access, the the main well, the, the the where this proposal differs to maybe others is that with other proposals, you would tend to get a track formed uh, into the site off a public highway. This, this one involves significant improvements to a public highway itself, involving this mini bypass or privately used mini bypass for Craigie Cathy settlement. Um, and um, I, I, I think that, 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 that given the alignment and the topography and its proximity to, to dwellings, it would have just have been so useful to have detail showing how the um, how the road could be engineered uh, potentially as sens sensitively as possible, um, you know, with greening, landscaping, maybe use of grasscrete or green surfaces, or the green surfaces, you know, uh, through gradients, you know, where the cut and fill was likely to be, what, what this is going to look like. I think those, those elements, especially for that rise from Innermesson at the A75 junction up to the top of the hill, which is actually in full view of you know, the, the western part of Stranra and the uh, western exit from Stranra going, going around the bay. Um, you know, it, because it's such a full frontal impact on the hillside, it would have been so useful to have seen, you know, what the impact of, 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 of that would have been visually and, and, and what mitigation attempts would have actually have, have been made. And, and similarly, with the access into the site itself off, off, off the public road, you know, I mentioned that there'd be cut and fill and a, and a river crossing necessary. They would be quite substantial works required for what is actually quite a sensitive little little um, lo lo location there, and you know because it's, 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 it's very rural, very pastoral, very little impact of man actually in that in that particular location, and I think it would just would have been useful to have actually have those details. Hope that helps. Thanks, Peter. If there are no other questions for officers, I have. Four members now are Alistair Geddes, Pat Garoy, Dean Maitland, and David Thank, Thanks very much indeed, Chairman. Question for Officer Jane. My apologies. Sorry. Jane. 
Th thank you, Ch Chairman. Um, no, this was about um, a, a technical issue with respect to condition three. Um, do, do we have to refer to the changes which are proposed to the road infrastructure as improvements? Because I have to say to you that you know, we're looking at tourism um, in, um, in, the, in the, the paper and um, considering whether or not people actually are looking for the, the major changes that happen. I mean, I, I'd, be, I'd be rather happier that we use the word in the condition three changes rather than improvements. And I'll tell you why, because while tourists seek roads of reasonable standard, and that's what we're trying to achieve anyway um, in Dumfries and Galloway, they don't really want a raw, new, industrialized infrastructure. Um, they really don't look for that. Um, and um, I, I just ask whether or not we technically have to refer to that as an improvement as opposed to a change. If I can just give a bit of clarification on that, Chair. You will notice on page 142 we are actually recommending that the Council object to this proposal. It's simply that we are bound to give uh, a number of suggested conditions to the reporter in the event that they may wish to, to grant uh, planning permission. So we've got no problem about any changes which members may wish to make because these are hopefully um, speculative conditions only because we would be, uh, we're recommending that an objection be raised which would uh, generate a public local inquiry if need be. Fine. So, Councillor Geddes, then Councillor Gilroy, then Councillor Keane. Thanks very much indeed, Chairman. I have no compunctions whatsoever in, in suggesting and uh, moving that this committee adopt the recommendations contained at paragraph 5 of the report. Insofar as uh, the purported conditions in the appendix are concerned, sir, uh, I understand the rationale and the logic behind it uh, in that uh, if, in fact, it uh, is appealed and it's granted, uh, at least we should be trying to mitigate the impact by spelling out these conditions. That's the sensible part of me appreciating that. The other part of me says, no, when you look at the vista, you know, the beauty of that rural Moorland area, and you see the damage that's been wrought on it, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I, I used, to, used to drive that road often, and from there to New Luce, over to Bar Hill, which is a wonderful, wonderful wild piece of countryside, big sky country, I used to call it. And Sue Bennett, when she worked here, I remember one occasion saying, that's exactly what it is. Forgive the rant, Chairman. But quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned, we should agree today to raise objections and bin your purported conditions on the basis that if you do otherwise, you know, on the one hand we're saying yes, we are, we're objecting to what you're proposing, and on the other hand we're saying, but uh, okay, here's what we feel in fact should be implemented uh, on the basis that, you know, presumably it may very well be granted. And, you know, as I say, there's part of me which says, have no truck with that. Take your stance, particularly on the back of what Peter has already said. This is a blatant, full-on challenge to the Council's policies. Is that not the case? Exactly. So why should we have any truck with that? Okay, earlier, much prematurely, I would have to say, Councillor Driver suggested we go with recommendations. So maybe we come back to that. So Councillor Gilroy and then Councillor McKee. Well, funny enough, my, my question is exactly the same thing. I couldn't actually quite understand the Council's decision agreeing a whole load of conditions because it kind of made that, well, we were objecting, but we didn't really think it was going to happen. Therefore, we've got other things in place. And I think that's the wrong, the wrong um, intention to be sending out because I think if we all agree that we tend to object, I hope we do, that's what we should be doing. So I just kind of wonder why we're doing it. Because it doesn't seem... Yeah. We're, we're doing it because we're obliged to. It's simple as that because we're not the determining authority. It's the Scottish Government that the applications... No, no, I can understand why we're objecting, but I can't understand why we're, we're then saying, well, uh, but if you do agree, these are our conditions. They're, they're basically what, I mean, in few, this is the first time we've done this. Um, we've historically just put up a, a report which says, you know, if we're objecting to this, but we've, um, Peter ran with this, and I thought, okay, let's let's put it before the members. If you don't want to see what the conditions that we have to submit to the Scottish ministers, then that's fine. We we can just um, 
have them under the table to provide to the Scottish ministers and rather than put them before the committee. But it was simply because we thought it was appropriate for you to see the, in the event that the Scottish ministers wish to approve it, that it comes back to the planning authority to actually agree the conditions and enforce and implement them. So there is an important element for you as a committee to know that if it comes back to us against our wishes, this is what we would be um, putting forward as the sort of conditions we would want to have to put in, because otherwise they could put in their own conditions, which might not be as fit for purpose. So I think we, are, there are, we have another issue, and Councillor Gary said we've no truck with it. Well, there's no point in us having the legislations under the table. We either just say we have no truck with it and be done with it and let the Scottish Government decide what they see as appropriate, or else we do indeed agree a number of uh, requirements that we would look to be put in place if the Scottish Government decided against our objection in favour of getting a protective action application. Hey, Councillor Gilroy. Yeah, well, so just, I just don't quite understand this. So, so the, the, the application goes in, as, as the planning authority has said, and it's been rejected, and our objection is there. And if they dismiss our objection to go for approval, is there another opportunity for us to say, well, actually, in that case, here are our suggested conditions? Or, or happens that the conditions can't come back to work? I'm being really no, honest. I think no, they would say you're, trying that to, you're trying to say, yeah, no on one hand, and, but if we don't, you know, we're, we're going to agree to it on this basis. What, what David's so saying is that we need a number of different reasons for refusal. The Scottish ministers insist on a number of them, and that's what planning officers come up with. But, but, sorry, just to be clear, it is a requirement when we are consulted by the Scottish Government, and the same as in an appeal, that with any appeal, we have to actually say these are the conditions that if you are minded to approve it, we would see as being appropriate. And we have to submit those with our appeal, even although we're dead opposed to the, the development. And the same is applying to this. We are objecting. Let, that's our recommendation. We don't be in any doubt about that. But we have to, with our, even an objection, submit to the Scottish ministers a number of uh, conditions that we would, as a planning authority, wish to see imposed should the Scottish ministers be minded to grant it. So we have to have those conditions. And if you felt strongly about any of the conditions that we were saying, well, if we have to have it, we think it should be in line with those. Sorry, Paula, you were trying to say something as well. Well, um, well let's try and get to the chair. Oh, yeah. This actually does strengthen the council's hand should the, the report of go against your decision today because it allows us at the hearing to have some input and discussion and argument over the conditions rather than simply being presented to the developer. If we don't put these forward, there's no locus to then go and argue about the suggested conditions or whatever. And we can come back to that just before we reach conclusion. We've got Councillor McKee and then Councillor Bryan. I, I tend to agree with what you say. That it's a distorted way of working. I think the, the best argument you could put up was send that blooming map up. That's an absolute disgrace for any area, no matter where it is, to be covered like that with wind farms. If you look at page 121, if you count up the various conditions under operational approved but not built, 471 turbines. An hour of page, you've got another 88. And, and then you wonder why you're complaining. We've been tainting the cleaners for far too long, and I think it's as strongly, as strongly worded as possible. And I would suggest to Davey, if we don't send our proposals in, if we don't do anything underhand, it goes back to this committee. I think it's a disgrace what they're trying to do to us here in this corner of the country. I think maybe you're embracing some of these sentiments in it, what is definitely a planning application. I think you've got a lot of sympathy for the sentiments you're expressing. Hey, Councillor Driver. Thanks, yeah, just coming back to the recommendation. It is, in fact, to raise an objection and give three reasons why that, that objection should be raised. I think, as, as David said, more succinctly than I'll ever do, uh, if it comes back, and we've known what the, 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 the policy is um, of the Scottish Government with regard to renewables, things like that, the chances are it will come back um, as, as a, a, a consent being issued, that these things are something that we go forward to, we argue with, and we say we want these things implemented as part of the conditions of that. However, be under no illusion that this, this is to raise an objection for the three reasons stated in page 142 and 143. Fine. 
Councillor Geddes. Yeah, I, I take the point that actually, sorry, Councillor Driver was making, but it, it automatically, to my way of thinking, sir, it automatically undercuts your position because, on the one hand, you're saying we're objecting. There's three statable grounds of rejection, but on the other hand, if you want to grant it, there's what we think to be the conditions. Forgive the cynicism, Chair, but apart from anything else, it's us doing their work for them. I'll leave it at that. I think you've got the drift of my views. And I think, I mean, officers are not, thank goodness you can't take nodding as part of your recording, <laughs> but they seem to be nodding in agreement with you. Uh, but I think what we have to do then is determine how we want to approach this. Peter has quite rightly uh, 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 quoted David, brought forward a very comprehensive report, with countless uh, observations or, or, or conditions we want implemented. Do you want, as an experiment, which seems to be the case, to send that, or do you want to revisit it and simply say no? Or do you want to put one or two very specific conditions on and send it back and see how it goes? It's up to members, really. Councillor Driver. Yeah, as, as, as a daft shop steward, you used to have a fallback position. If you got sacked, you always had the fallback position saying, come back in with this. So that, that's the way I think about it. I think certainly the, the, the objection is what we, we, we uh, take forward with the raise objection. I think if you take forward uh, the suggestion, the suggestion if, if they do not listen to our objection that we would like, another try at, at putting conditions in that would help um, mitigate any circumstances for that. It's there anyway, but, uh, if, you know. As far as I understand it, and I'll ask David just to, to, to reaffirm, as far as I understand it, we write this, it goes to the Scottish Ministers, they decide and tell us what's happening. So what we have to decide today is where we go with it and how we present it to Scottish Ministers. Alice was quite determined in his view Yours is a bit more relaxed, maybe, but we have to come to a consensus or have some approach. I've got Councillor McKay and Councillor Maitland. Well, if we really want to be silly, but how is it about suggesting we put the masts no, no higher than 10 metres to the ground? It was still visible. Hey, Councillor Maitland. Um, right, well, I, I've listened to the officer's explanations and the assurance that, actual fact, this information has to go up at some point. And if that's the case, I'm with the driver of fallback position. So um, I, I would send it up. It's perfectly clear what the council is saying, and I don't think anybody's going to gainsay it. But I, I, would, I would send the conditions up, and I certainly think that we should have an input into them. I think that's helpful. Again, well, no, sir, I wouldn't agree to that. I think what we should do is we should make clear our fundamental opposition to this, at the back of the, the comments we've heard from the case officer, Saying in fact that you know this is a this is a, a full full on challenge you know as it were to this council's position, uh, and I would suggest that you send it up uh, with your three grounds of your, 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 on the basis of your, your three grounds of rejection, detailed at paragraph five of the report, uh, and make it clear that we are fundamentally opposed to this application being granted. And I would go on from there and say, however, if you are minded not to take cognizance of our objections we would insist that you contact us further at the appropriate future time to get our further comments on it. And that's exactly what I would do. Okay, we're going to have to come to a situation where we need proposals. I've got Councillor Dick, who hasn't had an opportunity to speak yet, coming in. And then we don't want, I wish I hadn't used the terminology, bun fight. We don't want a bun fight. We want to get somewhere where we have a consensus on how this goes forward, because it's important. Can I just ask if there's any precedent here where, where other councils have raised objections to Section 36 and uh, either submitted their, their um, uh, list of conditions, depending on whether it's overturned uh, or, or it goes ahead anyway, or have they actually done what has been suggested here, that we do not submit uh, any of these conditions? Is, is, it, is there a precedent? Robert's open to respond, and I'll ask David if he's going to add. Thanks, Chair. It was just really to draw members' attention. At the start of the report on page 119, um, there is an overview of the whole process at 1.01. Uh, I'm not sure if that will be helpful to members, but councillor are a consultee in this case. Uh, the Scottish Government and Scottish Ministers are the determining body because it's an application under Section 36 of the Electricity Act, and they are the relevant authority. We are a consultee. This is our chance to make our views known to the Scottish Government, and it does set out what's understood to be normal practice. So it's almost a two-part element. You make your thoughts known as a council, which is what members are assembled to do today, uh, and then 
regardless you arrive at a list of conditions. Now, I don't think providing a list of conditions undermines your stated position, whether to object or not. It's just something that they would expect in any scenario, regardless of what you say or put in writing. It's true. But obviously, it's, it's a matter for members, you know, but we have been consulted. Can I mean, add, David, because I think Alistair's view is quite clear that whilst well, that is the officer's view, he doesn't want to support that in this occasion. David, what do you have to add to that? Um, I mean, the recommendation is undoubtedly for an objection. And that is really what you're going to discuss with ministers. As part of the process, we are required to forward on any conditions the planning authority would wish to see discussed with ministers or attached to any approval. So that's really what you're seeing there. It's, it's not an and or. Uh, we have to do it because it's a part of the statutory process. But the council's um, comment to the Scottish minister on this as part of the consultation exercise is we object for the following three grounds. And that, that is effectively what is going to them. We have to have um, the, the sets of conditions submitted to them, but that's not the council's decision. So. And before I bring in Alice Brown, as a daft lad, he says, he's not had anything in the day yet. If we don't submit the conditions, would the Scottish government write back and say, why are we going to bother? We want to consider, or would they write us off? If we object, it automatically triggers a public inquiry. And as part of that process, they would want to see our conditions. So the short answer is yes. At some stage, we will need to produce all these. So it just seemed the correct thing to do to bring it before members to actually see the list of conditions that we were recommending in that circumstance, just in case there was anything which you felt we hadn't addressed and we could add. But by objecting to this, we would trigger a public inquiry. And that's the, sta the stage where we would have to feed into it. If we don't feed into it, uh, it would be open to the Scottish ministers to attach, uh, if they decide to approve it, of course. Uh, if they do wish to approve it, they, they would be free to attach any conditions they saw fit, which may not be the ones the council wish to see attached. I've got Councillor Geddes and then Councillor Driver. What, what, I'm, what I'm saying, Chair, is that, you know, you don't send your purported conditions at this moment in time. That's the point I'm making. Uh, you know, we are fundamentally opposed to this. We, we, you know, this, this particular application, as I stress, this particular application. And the circumstances, we're raising objections. And I would like to think that when we send these objections to the Scottish Government, we make it abundantly clear, in fact, that we are fundamentally opposed and that we use terminology that, as far as we are concerned, we perceive this application as nothing more than a blatant challenge to this Council's policy, you know, to its stated policy which are included in various publications like this. And I, w I would like to think that taking it from there, I point out that, you know, and, and, and insist that, you know, if they are minded, uh, as it were, to grant the application, despite our fundamental opposition to it for the, for, 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 for the reasons that we've outlined there, that they would at least afford us the courtesy and act in the interests of natural justice to contact us further to see, in fact, at that stage, if we have any further comments or observations to make on the proposed decision to grant. That's what I'm saying. You know, it's about time, perhaps, Chairman, as far as I'm concerned, that the world is turned. Because it seems to me that we've just been pushed about here. And this is a classic case in point. I think our members agree. But I think the problem I've got is, if we send an objection and we simply say we object, within 14 days we'll be required by the Scottish Government to submit the information we have before us today so that they can consider it and if we don't do that, and the public inquiry determines in favour of the applicant, they don't come back at that stage, according to David, and ask us. They will then presume that we are relaxed about what conditions might be placed on the, uh, the application, and they will grant them according to how they see fit. I think that's the concern the officers have, and I think that's the understanding that we've got. Unlike, it's unusual that Alistair's so much at odds with what's being said, but... That's my understanding, that we're going to be required to provide this information within 14 days of the receipt of our objection, even if the only three words are we object. That, as David says, triggers a public inquiry. That triggers a sequence of, sequence of events that we can't change, and we need to comply. Failure to comply will mean we'll be vulnerable to Scottish government, maybe punishing us by applying their rules to make the mere relaxment we want. Their condition. That's a supposition, not, 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 not a statement by the 
But I have a arch driver at an engine. We're really going to have to get somewhere where we hopefully can find consensus and then back to Can anybody order bed for us? Really? <laughs> <laughs> Can I just, I just clarify what, what, what David said? I mean, because we've objected, it will, it will throw up a public inquiry, right? Within that public inquiry, we will put our conditions forward should things change. That's predetermined an application, is it not? The Scottish Government has predetermined an application. Now, we, no. we would get done stupid for that. No, what they're saying is the public inquiry then is what it is. It's a public inquiry. And attached to our objection, because what, what I'm saying is, if we see the recommendation, read objection, give you three reasons for it, right? Automatically goes to a public inquiry, right? Public inquiry, the then comes back to us and says, give me reasons why you would what or, or conditions as to why you would expect that 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 application to be made there. Here's the, the application. We've already got them written down in the back page. Here are the the the, the thingy, the hundred nod, yeah, forty five conditions that are actually there, yeah. Um, so, so therefore, what we're expected to do is raise objections plus send the, the, um, the conditions that we would expect should the objection go against us. There's going to be a public inquiry anyway, so therefore the conditions are going to go anyway. So does it really matter when we actually send the conditions? Because the public inquiry would actually have to have the conditions available to them because it's going to public inquiry. I'm, I'm, I'm actually changing my mind. I'm going with Alistair here, by the way. And we raise objections and sort them. Well, the public inquiry, if you didn't, that's the point David was making. If you just say we object and leave it at that, there, there would be a public inquiry with no a requirement for any conditions being sent by the Police and Gallery Council. And if the public inquiry found in favour of the developer, they wouldn't come back and ask us what we fancy now. They would say, given that the Fish and Galloway have made no representation in terms of conditions, we will set the conditions. And that's what the planning officer trying to tell you. They're saying the, the objection sets a sequence of events in place that can be changed. One, a public inquiry must be held. Two, we are invited to do a, a with the 45 conditions. Now, if we don't, will be given 14 days in which to deliver them. But Alistair wasn't wanting to send them now. He was wanting to challenge the Scottish Government by saying that they're actually attempting to breach our council's policy and how we view develop, wind farm development. And that's Alistair's point. He, he's trying to make a, a statement saying, you need to listen to us because it's important. We're trying to manage to the best of our ability the development of wind farms in Dumfries and Galloway. And we've been overridden by bureaucracy, for want of a better term. It's how, though, we try and protect what little opportunities we have to manage what might be a damaging uh, approval. And, Chair, because just to come back on that, I think everybody's in agreement that we're going to we'll vote for that anyway, to raise objection, and the three objections are going to be there. That's what Alistair absolutely quite rightly said. The second part, that, that we're not happy with, is it? It's, it's what's the stage to follow? Now, as far as I'm aware, and correct me if I'm wrong, David, that a public inquiry, because we raised, a public inquiry would be held, therefore they have to hear our reasons for objection, but we could also put in that the conditions that we would have if that went again. But as soon as the objection from us is received, they tell us we have 14 days in which to forward the 45 objections that we've got hidden under the table to use David's terminology. I have 45 conditions done. Sorry about that. Right. As soon as the objection is submitted, we'll be invited to submit any other information that you wish to be included within the public uh, domain. In, in, inquiry is the word they're looking for. Ah, so the public inquiry, they will invite us to add any information we wish to consider. We don't send any, they decide. I think, that's the point. I think sorry, Chair, the, the other thing just to stress is that there would be no other opportunity for members of the committee to see these conditions and agree them. So that's, 
the primary motive for putting it before you today, just so that you were aware of what we might have to submit as part of the process and to make sure you were happy with what we were saying and there was nothing, you don't want 46 or 47 conditions instead. Well, have the rest of the members in the committee had something to say before we, before we try and summarise where we are? Councillor Maitland, then Councillor Gorod. David has just answered the question I wanted answered. Um, that's fine. Right, and the next thing is um, item condition two and three seem to be exactly the same, except for the word planning in the middle. I just wondered if somebody could explain. Paul has already picked that up. And Paul is waiting for David to explain the difference. In the meantime, <laughs> when he's reading it, we'll hear what Patsy has to say in case that's the same thing. No, you'll be very glad. Patsy hasn't got very much to say at all, because I think it's, it's become quite clear. What wasn't terribly clear when I read this was that this triggered a public inquiry. And that's what you meant when you said the hearing. Yes. So we haven't got two bites of the cherry. By objecting, public inquiry, you've got to have two things. That's So the initial thing we do, we just object. And then when there's a public inquiry pronounced, you've got the, you've got the procedure that's after it. But I can understand that we can't do that. So I quite understand. I think if that's the case, we have to decide whether to submit the 45 conditions with the objection or wait until we're invited to send them within 14 days. David, you wanted to explain the difference between two and three. Yeah, there is none. Make that 44 conditions. My apologies. Councillor Geddes. Well, I'll tell you, sir, what we should send, uh, in, in addition to our letter, we should send the audio uh, recording of this meeting uh, to know just to, you know, to, to, to let those concerned know exactly, just exactly how we feel about it. But my view is still, uh, you know, uncompromising. We make it clear that we are fundamentally opposed to this, and we point out, in fact, that, you know, this is our, this is our, a direct, it's a blatant challenge, not to say disregard to this council's policy. You know, this is exactly what this application is. And at the end of the day, uh, leave it at that. And when we're asked within the 14 days to send the additional, uh, the, 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 the additional conditions, the 45 conditions, then do it then when we're told, you know, we have to send them. Do it then. Why should we break our legs, you know, fall over ourselves, undercut our position, whatever terminology you want to use by sending it up at the same time saying we're fundamentally opposed to this for the following reasons. There's the grounds. Oh, and by the way, if you're minded to grant it, there's the conditions that we would like to see in, you know, imposed in any grant. Come on. We've revised it now. <coughs> We've revised it now to 44. So, we now... We now... Uh, we can go to a, a vote if you want, but we now have a proposal from Alistair that says we, we, we write say we're fundamentally opposed for the following reasons. And when we're invited to send the conditions up, we do so. I understood that we now we object because it's totally against all our policy and full stop. No. So that so that instigates a public inquiry. And when that happens, you send your objection you're in the in the thing, and then the conditions. Is that well, that's right? what, I think that's what Alistair said. We fundamentally no, we have to object. Repeat it to, again, Alistair. To we'll get proliterated <laughs> doing this time. <laughs> chair, chair, <laughs> chair, chair. I, as far as I'm concerned, make abundantly clear our fundamental opposition to this uh, application and we incorporate these three grounds of object, four grounds of objection. And that's our basis and that's our reason for, for doing that. Now you're telling me that you know what will happen in 14 within 14 days time is that they will write and they will ask at the end of the day for uh, details of the proposed conditions. Well fine at that time give them because as I've said you know or, or the, 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 other, the other alternative thinking aloud is to turn around and say at that stage no if you're going ahead and you're granting this, you do it, and in your head be it. And when the people of Western Dumfries and Galloway are up in arms, you put the conditions on. We did them. That's the other way to look at it, which is an even more extreme position. In deference to you as chairman, I've made the comment, I'll withdraw that and stick to what I said earlier. At the end of the day, make clear our fundamental opposition, 
We'll leave it at that, and we're told within the 14-day period to send the reasons. Send the reasons with an appropriate letter, I would suggest, written by you as chairperson of this committee, reinforcing our attitude towards this. We will take some professional advice, but, but, but I would say the risk of, of no saying anything is the Scottish Government will simply turn around and say, your councillors had the opportunity to make conditions and didn't apply them, so it's maybe no surprise that either. But anyway, Paula? What will happen, Councillor Gary, when the Executive has admitted it will be checked by the admin staff at the DPA who will say, if your councillors have gotten these conditions, please follow them in 14 days. The decision maker will not be aware of any of this. The decision maker will not be aware of any of this. It will not flag up the members' serious objections. It will be an admin person in Falkirk that writes us. But I would be happy to sign off a strongly worded letter if members are happy and if that fits with the legal a, a framework that we operate under. But I'll leave that for a Paula to decide. Because at the day we have to say, as Alistair says, we want to say it at all, but we don't want to take we don't want to forego the opportunity to try and control somehow what actually happens on the ground if the, the reporter is, is, is inclined to approve the application. Chair, I, I really am grateful for your forbearance, but you know, and the one I mean, it, it, it's it's making us look. It, it, well, if we're not careful, you finish up this process. You know, finish up making us look objects of derision. We're talking tough on the one hand, and we're saying, no, we're not having this. You know, and you're spelling out the, the legitimate objections, you know, as to why we're adopting that stand. And at the same time as we're sending that up, we're saying, but I, okay, if you, if you feel that you would like to grant this, well, here's the conditions that we would like to see applied to it. Put it this way, if you're playing care, you wouldn't be adopting that, 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 that attitude, Chair. Unfortunately, it's no game of cares, and David says we have to do that on every occasion when we make an appeal. I'm in members' hands, but we're going to have to go somewhere. If you want to support Alice's position, that's fine. The difficulty is you know what the process takes place, and you know what, what will invariably happen because that's been set out by David and Paul. No one to go in all night, you two gentlemen at the back, Councillor McKee and then Councillor Driver. I appreciate I appreciate your words and what, and what you're saying, but I think if we do do that, we're still going to send a strongly worded letter, and I think a recording of this meeting to them, along with any uh, information that we send up regarding this application, that we're totally opposed to it, and as Alice is saying, we're not even setting up these 44 conditions, we're just saying if, if you do this, we'll accept it. That's, that's no position. And that's what's got to be spelled out to them, and that's got to go up with, the, with whatever we send up. I, I still agree with Alistair, but if that's the way we've got to go on. No, I am here to, uh, uh, to, to obey your command. I, I don't make decisions, you guys make decisions. And as for sending up a copy at Michland in the front page of the Sunday Post, or, or, or even worse, the News of the World, uh, Councillor Driver. I forgot what I was going to say about <laughs> So the situation is we're objecting to this application. Now, it, it, you know, the, the, there's, there's a process in which we go through to um, public inquiry. Um, I think there'll be an opportunity there to send up the 44 conditions at that particular stage. So therefore, I'm, I, I'm, I'm with Alistair on this one. Let's object it and let's make sure we object it. And, we, and when we, the, the, the period comes along with the 44 conditions, which we can agree to now and say to officers when the public inquiry goes, then send the, 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 the conditions, or set them down as the conditions applied by Dumfries and Galloway Council, uh, we can do it that way. But that's not what Alistair's saying, because we've been told that we'll not get the opportunity to revisit this, that there's a process, process dead simple, we object, public inquiry is called, the objection is lodged. Public inquiry, there might not be a public inquiry if at the end of the day, uh, you know, our, our, my, my understanding is that they agree with our objection. Well, David, should have, it would be an automatic public inquiry. It, it's one of the, the rare occasions, because this is actually driven on, not under the Planning Act, it's the, the 1989 Electricity Act. Uh, if a local authority objects to a consultation, it's automatic. So, so, so it will happen. 
As soon as it's called, some member of staff will write to us and say, we, you now need to provide us with a copy of the conditions you may wish to, wish to have applied if it is approved. So are you all saying, because I don't think that's what Alistair was saying, but if you're all saying that's what we do, then that's fine. We simply object, outline our, our serious objection on the basis that they fly in the face of our policy. And when an invitation comes in to send on any conditions we might want to have attached to the approval if it happens to be approved, David's instructed or authorised to send them on. We're in agreement with that. <laughs> Thank you, Alistair. Paula, will you remind members what they've decided, please? The committee is determined to raise objection to the they will raise objection to the application as set out in the report. The committee is determined not to submit the conditions along with the objection, but wait to be invited to do so. And there are 44 conditions, no 45. And, and, and to, make, to make it clear, Chair, at that time, when we do send them on when we were invited to do so, why we took the stance. Absolutely satisfied with that. And Judith Turnbull over at Dredden doing the same thing now. <laughs> We come to item 11 on the agenda. Consultation regarding an application made under section 36 of the Electricity Act 1989 for the construction of wind farm comprising of 50 wind turbines, maximum height 149.5 metres to blade tip and associated work at South Kyle Wind Farm, site east of the Mellington to Caspian Forest. The applicant is Vattenfall Wind Power Limited for Scottish Government Recommendation is to raise no objection and case officer is Judith Turnbull. Judith, will you take us through your presentation, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. First thing, I'd just like to point out there's an error in 1.7 of the report where I've said there are four borrow pits in Dumfries and Galloway and there are actually only three. The applications for 50 wind turbines, um, of which 20 will be in Dumfries and Galloway and 30 will be in East Ayrshire. And it's only the impact of the development of the Dumfries and Galloway region that's considered in the assessment of the application and the only consultees um, that, that have responded have been internal consultees since external consultees are dealt with by Scottish government. Right, this is the location plan. The site is on the border of, of Dumfries and Galloway, which is actually easier if I go to the next one. Um, the line across the bottom of the site, which I'll just point out with the laser flash. Shaky hand. It's the border. Um, and the A713 is running up the west of the site. There. We've got Dalmellington up here and Caspian about eight kilometres south. This is a large site, 2,400 hectares and is predominantly in forestry plantations. The site lies in an area of search for turbines of this height in the IPP. Moving on, this shows the layout of the, of the site. Um, Probably not, not too easy for you to see, but there are 20 turbines in our area, one permanent wind monitoring mast, two temporary compounds, one temporary storage area, three borrow pits, and one permanent welfare facility. Well, just to go back, uh, probably back to this one here, you can see that the two accesses to the site, um, one from north of Dalmellington, and one from the south, are, and neither of them are within Dumfries and Galloway. This is typical wind turbine, 149.5 metres to tip, 93 metres to hub, and 113 metre diameter uh, rotor, each with a nominal output of 3.4 megawatts. This is typical wind monitoring mass, 100 metres to tip, um, and anemometer um, mon wind monitoring equipment at various intervals up the mast. 
This is a view taken from the middle of the site. Um, it's actually in East Ayrshire, just in East Ayrshire, and it's from Prickney Hill. And um, this, this is looking south from the site. The, the hills to the, the right are the Rins of Kells. Um, you're kind of looking down the A713 corridor, and to the left of the site is the start of um, Cairnsmoor of Fleet. No, Cairnsmoor of Kerspearn, even. This is panning round to the, the southeast, um, and that's Cairnsmoor of Kerspearn. And about here, in that red, is um, Windy Standard turbine. This is cumulative um, to 20 kilometers. If you just bear with me. This is, these are the turbines here. Half of the, the, the border running through the middle. Um, and that's Wendy Standard. Um, I could go to, I could run through the, all of them if you're interested. Um, but maybe you'll just want to, to push on. So I'll not, I'll not bother. But if you want to ask me about any of them, then I can. This is the ZTV. Um, generally, the, the, the views, if you just wait a moment, I'm completely muddled up and I don't know where this is, so I'll just find it. ZTV indicates that theoretical visibility of the development of Dumfries and Galloway will be generally restricted to, pa to parts of the Kerspearn Forest area and the raised areas within the Glen Kens. Um, also the western slopes and the summits of the hills to the east of Sanka. There'd also be pockets of visibility down the A713 corridor to the south. Um, the council landscape architect considers that the Potential visual impacts of the development are likely to be localised and generally restricted to the upland viewpoint. There are only a few, few viewpoints in Dumfries and Galloway. Um, one of them is from the Rins of Kells, um, which we've course in Summit. This is um, the wireline and um, a photograph from the course in Summit. And you can see... That in, in here, here, the turbines we see. I've put the next one on, but I don't think you'll be able to see the turbines on that, that photograph. I'm sorry about that. Um, my last slide is just a, a, taken from the A713, about two kilometres south of the site, um, and, and the, you can see Kerspearn Forest on the, on the right hand side. And really, the, the, the application site is really just in front of the, the road um, at that point. The council landscape architect considers that the, the landscape in, in, visual in terms of the proposal, the landscape architect considers that there are no significant adverse effects due to the proposal on the landscape. Um, he has, however, recommended a condition ensuring suitable suitable management of forestry in the Water of Duke area. The Council Roads Department have no objection. Um, that's mainly because there are, there are neither of the accesses are in Dumfries and Galloway, and the archaeologist is, has raised no objection subject to the, um, the suggested condition. At the time of writing the report, no response had been received from environmental health and um, environmental standards, but since then, a response has been received, and they've not objected to the application subject to conditions. Um, so it's recommended that no objection is raised um, in respect of this consultation subject to conditions suggested as well as standard noise conditions um, which we would put on. Thank you, Chair. Member, Councillor Drybra. <coughs> Thanks, Chair. I mean, we've just had um, uh, to, uh, an application to raise objection with 44 conditions on it. This one, we're no objection, and there's only 22 conditions on it for twice as many wind turbines. So it kind of worries me that there's no consistency here. Um, or, 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 can, can you give us an advi advice why that is the case? Robert? 
Th thanks, Chair. I mean, each case is different, has to be treated on its own merits. Looking at the Strana case, I think complicating factors there were you've got two separate clusters with Strana. Uh, so, in the face of it, this is a bigger scheme. But when you look at the Dumfries and Galloway element, there's more in Strana. As Peter said, there was a lot of information missing as to how it was intended to form the access route to the site as well. And that's simply not part of this proposal insofar as Dumfries and Galloway are concerned. That's an East Ayrshire issue. So I, th I think really when you look at it as well, there's the majority of turbines, I think the split's 40-20. Um, with the Sorry, 30-20, thir I've been corrected. Um, with the 30 being in East Ayrshire and 20 in Dumfries and Galloway mean that there are fewer conditions for all of these reasons. Um, the key difference, obviously, in terms of the policy is this is a large-scale wind turbine proposal located within an area of search identified in the Council's IPP. So, in other words, in an area of search where the Council would encourage people to look for potential wind turbine sites. Uh, with Stranach, it was a very different scenario altogether. Thank you, Robert. Councillor Geddes? Are we in session, Chairman? No, no, no still sorry, questions apologies. for officers. Any other questions for officers? Judith, you got off lightly. Hey, we're now in session, Councillor Geddes. Well, I would, I would draw your attention sir, to paragraph 4.62 uh, of the report under the side heading of conclusions. And it says, in conclusion, the elements of, this pro of the proposal which have been considered under this consultation are considered to be compliant with the provisions of the State of Development Plan policies, etc., etc. And in these circumstances, I have no objection. I have no problems whatsoever in approving the recommendation to raise no objections. And for the voice of any doubt, sir, bearing in mind that we are uh, presumably uh, not going to raise any objections, I think it's perfectly legitimate uh, on the assumption that planning uh, that consent is likely to be granted for us to put a row in at this moment in time and make clear just exactly what we would like to see by way of conditions. And that's no road to Damascus in my point, let me assure you. That's fine, Councillor Gareth. Uh, Councillor Dick? Uh, no, just to, to agree with Alistair, it's within the terms of the, the IPP. It's, been, it's in a sheltered area and I've, uh, I've had no compunctions in, um, in the past where, uh, where, where a lot of the effects are mitigated by, perhaps by uh, heavy forestation and appropriate siting and, and I would do the same in this one. Okay, Councillor McKee? Is there, sir? Quite happy with it. That would be their problem and no ours. Oh, no, no, that's, that's not very appropriate. Actually, we would look for support for adjoining um, areas if, that, if we were in that position, Chair. And I would like to, a proper answer to my question, if you didn't mind. Well, it shouldn't matter what you sir, think. We have professionals that make a value judgment on what they think is appropriate for Dumfries and Galloway, and that includes a, a landscape, visual impact, etc., etc. If officers are in a position to advise you what East Ayrshire a, a, a consider to be their view, that's fine, but that shouldn't affect what we decide. I mean, just because they may object doesn't mean to say we should. We we have a decision to make on the basis of an inc a request from a, a, the Scottish Government and professional opinion is we should support it. And I'm happy with that, but uh, just to uh, uh, curiosity, if nothing else, do we know what East Ayrshire Council think, Robert? Yes, if I could clarify, Chair, at the moment we were consulted, obviously, by the Scottish Government because it's a Section 36 application, as were East Ayrshire Council. We did commit to trying to respond by the end of March this year, which um, we, we've done following the outcome of this committee meeting, which is hopefully in accordance with the recommendation. The East Ayrshire Council have asked for a six-month extension to their response, so they're not going to be able to provide the Scottish Government with their formal comments until the end of September this year. So we don't have any kind of steer from them at the moment. I, I wouldn't hope you'd be taking a steer from them anyway. I'd be hoping it would be in your interest the decision and recommendation you'd be making. Uh, uh, so I'm sorry to contradict you, sir, but you'll remember at the Beef Tub, we were asked by Border Council our view on, on turbines being built at our side of the border, at the top of the Beef Tub. And I think it's quite right that we do consult other areas when they're affected as well. David might want to respond to that. Uh, that was actually a consultation from the Scottish Government again because it was a Section 36 application solely within Scottish Borders area. Yeah. Well, except yeah, for the, access, the access, access was in well, Dumfries and yes, Galloway. Correct, correct. Right, so we have a proposal that we 
agree the recommendation. If no one's otherwise minded, thank you, Judith, that, that that's the decision. Paula, will you just confirm that, please? The committee is determined to raise no objections to the application. Sorry, David's asked me to clarify that members are clear that in addition to the conditions set out in the report, there is to be additional noise conditions. I have been asked to clarify that members are clear that in addition to the conditions that have been set out in your report, we will also be submitting noise conditions following the environmental health's response. Yeah. Thank you for that, Paula. We come to item 12, erection of 10 dwelling houses, two semi-detached and eight terraced, Erection of heat store, erection of ground mounted solar panels, installation of septic tank, soak away and reed bed system, and formation of access at St Anne's Locker Bay. The application type is full plan permission. The applicant is Iron Daily States. The recommendation approves subject to the successful completion of section 75 planning obligation and conditions. Case officer should have been Janice K. However, Janice is unavailable today. So David will take us through this report. Thank you, Chair. This is one that very technically we could have probably dealt with under delegated powers, but we felt that 10 houses in a small building group was uh, somewhat stretching the envelope of the, uh, the interpretation, so we felt it safer to put through yourselves. It is, however, quite a unique and interesting proposal. Taking through the slides, this is the 701 looking towards Moffat, so the site's on the right-hand side. That's looking towards the Dumfries Way at St Anne's Bridge. There's traffic lights there. And just down at that set of traffic lights, there's a little road that goes off. And this is the road they're looking back down towards St Anne's Bridge. So the site is uh, in on the right-hand side. That's looking the other way, so the site is now on your left-hand side. And that's looking towards the existing buildings at St Anne's, so the application site would be in the foreground. That's the plan. So you can see there's a, a cluster which is an existing small building group of St Anne's. Uh, these are all owned by um, the, the estate, Andale Estates, at that uh, location. And indeed, it's them who's uh, applied for this proposal. You can see that there's two parts of this on the point of going. That's the semi detached pair of houses. And then down here is the, the courtyard form, which is eight uh, attached dwelling houses there. We have no problem with this one here whatsoever. That would wholly comply with the small building group policy. It sits in amongst the other ones. The issue is really this development here, which is uh, somewhat unusual. That's a plan form of the development. So you can see the, the courtyard layout. Looking back towards the, the main buildings, and this is just within St Anne's village itself. So you can see the nature of the buildings there. The one, existing ones are um, terraces or semis of uh, traditional single-storey properties. Looking again towards the site and another part of the site. So that's what's proposed for the, the semi. I think you would agree that looks very similar to the existing houses. There's no fundamental objection to those ones at all. Then the courtyard development is more akin to what you'd expect for a traditional stable complex, perhaps. Uh, and it's now a U-shape. Now, the, a couple of things which are worthy of note is that um, the applicant here is making it clear that they would not sell any of these in the market. It's um, effectively like a modern version of uh, a large estate set of houses for, for workers, really. Um, there is not going to be a, uh, an adoptable road in there. We feel that you can see from the layout, it would probably not be appropriate to have a, a full-blown engineered road in there. Now, that has required a Section 75 legal agreement to deal with that to basically commit the applicant to not uh, seeking adoption for that road. But subject to those and the conditions in the report, we are recommending approval. Questions for officers? Councillor Driver, Councillor Geddes. 
David, just looking at the, the um, courtyard-shaped housing, is that, is that similar to the, the Castle Milk Estate one up in, just before you get to Kelholm? Yes, that's a good example. It's, it's very much like that. Councillor Geddes. Is, is it not a matter of public policy, if I can put it in the, the, these terms, that you know, where you know, you're, you're, you're uh, having developments like this, and I, I must confess, or no, I won't say what I was about to, uh, where you're having developments uh, like, like this, that you know, and the roads you know, being provided as a consequence, it's not a matter of public policy, sir, that these roads should always be provided to an adoptable standard. It's usually the case three, three properties or more, three individual properties or more. It's, it's a road a plus, plus street line plus uh, footways. But David? That's correct if you're looking for the road to become adopted. But with this development here, they, they have to put in a standard of roads and they will maintain it themselves. Uh, so it has to be of a, an acceptable quality and it will need a road construction consent. But... The key difference here is that they will not be seeking the council to take over the road and adopt and maintain it. It will be maintained by themselves, and that's hence the need for the legal agreement. It's unusual, but if you're adamant that's what you want to do, then yes, you'll need an RCC, but other than that, you can go down that route. I, I would worry about the point Alistair has raised because it begs the question, what if somebody somewhere else wants to build four houses and, and claims that they're not interested in the council adopting the road, but we actually insist that adequate provision is made for pedestrian access, etc., etc.? Are we setting a precedent by, by doing this? It will still need a road construction consent, so it will have to meet the, the basic standards that roads would be looking for, the differences that, as I say, they're not looking for adoption. Yes, I appreciate that, but the point I think that Alistair was getting at, and maybe one that I'm certainly getting at in the back of Alistair saying is, we would normally require these developers to provide roads, footways, and lighting, and make them up to an adoptable standard before we would allow them construction consent. And I think that's a subtlety, Alistair. I hope that's a subtlety that Alistair's leading to. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the key issue with which we would have as a concern here is that if you put in a fully adoptable road with all the streetlights and footways and 1.8 metre widths, it's not going to look appropriate for this development here. And that, that is really what the, the applicant is very keen to avoid. Hence why they're actually taking on a, a challenging role, because most developers um, would like to come in, do a development get the road adopted and clear off and basically leave that for the council to deal with over time. This is, as part of Annandale Estates, um, they're wanting to actually have this as part of their estate and they're willing to take on the responsibility for looking after it. But they will still have to meet the, the basic criteria to get a road to construction consent. So it is very, very unusual. I've never experienced a case where somebody has been willing to take on that long-term responsibility themselves. Oh, yeah, there is one. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Alistair. Councillor McKay. Given that they're no want the, these houses are to stay in the ownership of the estate and whoever follows them up, is there any need for GP20 to be applied? 20% allocation of affordable housing? The affordable housing issue is actually dealt with on page 199. It would normally uh, come into the, uh, it's paragraph 416, 20% would normally be required for the two properties. Um, but they've agreed that the properties be retained by the state and as such considered that the requirement of the policies have been met in that an additional 10 mid-market rental houses would be being provided. Councillor Maitland. I think it's a most attractive proposal, um, and I think we should agree it. Pardon? There's still questions for officers. However, given that there doesn't appear to be anyone else looking to speak, we are now in debate. Councillor Driver. Can we go with the recommendations, <laughs> And for the record, Chair, let me say that I agree entirely. It's a very attractive development and it should be supported. 
Thank you. Any alternative proposal? In that case, it's unanimous. Paula, please. Committee is determined to approve the application as set out in the report. Thank you. We now come to item 13. Agree. De <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Demolition of redundant school changing facility and direction of school kitchen dining room at Langham Academy, Thomas Chelford Road, Langham. Fish and Galloway Council's applicant recommendation is to approve unconditionally in case officer Lindsay Brown. Lindsay, take us through your presentation, please. Thank you. Um, I'll quickly take you to, through the photographs. Um, this first photograph um, is taken from the rear of uh, Langham Academy, um, looking in a westerly direction towards the application site, which currently comprises a, re a redundant single storey changing facility, which is just behind the storage container in the middle ground of the photograph. Um, this is the photograph of the redundant changing facility, which is to be demolished. Um, and moving north, this photograph is taken looking back in a south-easterly direction along the back of the academy building. Um, and the application site and the redundant changing facility are again located behind the storage container. This final photograph is taken from a point to the north of the river, looking back towards the application site. And it obviously demonstrates the site is quite well screened by the existing trees on the river bank. This is the location plan, um, showing the, the location of the new extension in relation to the existing academy building and the, the river. This slide shows the elevations um, of the proposed new extension. And this um, slide shows the, um, the floor plans for the building. Um, Overall, the proposals are considered to be in accordance with the development plan and therefore recommended for approval. Thank you, Lindsay. Any questions for members, eh, for, for, for uh, officers? No, in that case, we're in session. Councillor Dryborough. Chair, I, I think this is really important as part of the, of the build for the academy because the new primary school has already been built, as, as you'll be aware. This is about the way forward in, in Langham as well, and we're hoping to use that facility for uh, young people to get training in chef and cookery and things like that to take them into the hotel trade. So it's going to be really important that the, the head teacher gets that, gets that moving forward. So really happy to, to hopefully uh, get members to approve the application. Are you recommending approval? Any alternative view? In that case, thank you, Lindsay. Paula? Committee is determined to approve the application unconditionally. Come to item 14, refurbishment of school building incorporating installation of 58 replacement windows and 5 replacement doors and insulated render to external walls at Sanker Primary School, Queensbury Court, Sanker. The applicants, Dumfries and Galloway Council, a recommendation to approve unconditionally. Case officers, Pat Hanna. Pat, take us through your presentation, Thank please. Thank you, Chair. Um, just very briefly run through this uh, application site. Uh, this is the area of the proposed refurbishments. The area to the south um, that uh, doesn't need any refurbishments is a more uh, recent extension built in 2003. These are the areas in need of refurbishment. And again, and it's difficult to see from these uh, uh, existing and proposed photo uh, elevations what um, the works are. But in summary, they are replacement doors and windows, replacement rainwater goods, um, application of insulated render panels and extension of the tiled roof to accommodate the, the insulation offset. Um, application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Pat. I have one question. There were concerns raised about the face here, and I understand that's to be replaced as well, but it doesn't feature in the planning application. Will that require a, 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 another submission? Um, the... The insulated panels are a, a certain thickness, and so the um, the existing roof eaves will need to be extended um, to cover the the offset, the insulation or offset. And part of the detail that is submitted with the application shows the new eave arrangement um, for that, because additional tiles are required around the edge to allow for that so that there is a, 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 a detailed image of that in the plans that have been submitted. Thanks for that Pat. Any other questions for officer? In that case, 
Members happy to agree the recommendation. Thank you, Pat. Paula, confirm the decision, please. The committee is determined to approve the application unconditionally. Come to item 15. Consultation on planning application to South Lancashire Council in respect of proposed wind farm comprising 14 wind turbines of 137 metres, maximum height to blade tip, with associated access tracks and ancillary infrastructure at Lead Hills Wind Farm, Lead Hills, South Lanarkshire. The applicant, South Lanarkshire Council, recommendations raise objections, and the case office should have been Jessica Taylor, who's unwell today. Uh, David Sutty will take us through this report. Thanks, David. Yes, it seems everybody abandoning me today. Um, th this one is a little bit different to the ones that you had before, which were the Section 36 application consultations where we were consulted by the Scottish Government. Any objection to those triggers a public inquiry. This is just a consultation from a neighbouring planning authority, so basically any objection doesn't trigger any public inquiry or anything like that, just to be clear. These are quite large turbines at 137 uh, metres to tip height, and there's 14 of them. They basically sit um, wholly within South Lanarkshire. They're just to the east of the B740 road between Croyke and Crawford John. You've got the layout of the, the 14 turbines there. And you can see from the ZTV, the, the areas in green, particularly the areas to the, the southwest, the bottom left-hand corner, are ones that will be seen in Dumfries and Galloway. So it will have quite a, a visual impact within our neck of the woods. And these are just views, Spangle Hill. And that's what it would look like coming over. Just going back, you can see the hill in the photo. And the turbines would come over quite uh, pronounced, despite being in South Lanarkshire. Uh, Cloud Hill, you can, not awfully clear what that one is to show, to be perfect. Jessica might have been able to die. Uh, you'll notice in paragraph 2.1, the landscape architect has set out a number of concerns. She does reckon that there's potential mitigation set out in page 213, but that's not the application that we've been consulted on. Um, the IPP and Dumfries and Galloway policies obviously don't apply in uh, South Lanarkshire, but we've had to assess it as if it would, and also on the impact on ourselves. So we consider that there would be a significant landscape and visual impacts from within Dumfries and Galloway, and we're recommending that we object as set out on page 219. Thank you, David. Any questions for the officer? In that case, we go into session. Sorry, Ian. Can I just ask who's intending it? The applicant, South Lanarkshire Council, who's actually proposing to build them? Uh, yes, that we have to enter that in the back office system because we've been consulted by South Lanarkshire Council. But um, from what you're seeing there, it looks like Atmos is the applicant. So it will be a different applicant. It's not South Lanarkshire Council that's proposing it. Uh, Councillor Driver. Well, no, it's, it's just, just if there are any other questions, no, then we are in session, yes. Go with the recommendation. Any other mind, otherwise minded? Thank you, members, for that. Paula? The committee is determined to raise objections to the application. OK, we come to items for noting. The appeal decision for information only and noting. The applicant, Mississippi D&G Limited, Ward Nith. And you see the outcome of that ap appeal. Appeal decision for in information and noting, applicant care investments, LLP, Ward Irondale South, and you see the decision of that for noting as well. The only other thing I, I would say at this point, and, and I did intend to mention it before we, we, we left, and David thankfully did mention it at the start of the meeting, I would hope we would record our thanks to Janice Kay for the sterling work she's given the Freeston Gallery Council over a, a long period of time. And that might, if we can manage it, have it reflected in, in the minute. And other than that, if no other business, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for attending.